Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third meeting of CISRUP 10 or CISRUP X3. Uh, I see a, a couple of uh, people from yesterday's field trip. We had a, a, a really great field trip to the Western Everglades and uh, We'd like to uh, especially thank the Miccosukee tribe and the Park Service uh, and Big Cypress National Preserve staff for um, sponsoring us that, on that trip. And, and uh, it was really informative and illuminating and, and enjoyable. Um, today, uh, we've teed up three sessions. Um, and the first one is on climate change and BB SEER planning. The second session is on adaptive management. And the third session is on strategies to incorpor incorporate indigenous traditional ecologic knowledge in SERP. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers and panelists who have spent time preparing uh, uh, for that session and, and uh, joining us today. Uh, one housekeeping item, if you're a member of the public and you're interested in addressing the committee in three minutes or less. There's a sign up sheet uh, outside um, on the table. Um, please sign up uh, by two o'clock today. Um, before we get going with the um, uh, first session, um, perhaps we could start with introductions and I'll have the uh, committee members uh, introduce themselves. Uh, maybe we can start with our fearless leader, Stephanie. Stephanie Johnson of the National Academy st staff and study director for the project. Philip Dixon, professor of statistics at Iowa State University. Thanks, good morning everyone. Casey Brown, um, water resources engineering professor at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, Dave Wagner, good morning to everybody. Uh, Wolpert Engineering Scientific Consultant. Good morning, I'm Marla Emery, uh, committee member and uh, research geographer with the US Forest Service Retired and currently scientific advisor to the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research. Good morning, Matt Harwell. I'm a systems ecologist and a former Everglades scientist. Um, Maya Fry. Uh... National Academy staff. Charles Burgess, National Academy staff. Emily Bermudez, National Academy staff. Helen Regan, um, I'm a conservation biologist and ecological modeler, and I'm a professor at University of California, Riverside. Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Gittau, professor of agricultural and biological engineering at Purdue University. Good morning, Tracy Quirk, and I'm a professor of wetland ecology at Louisiana State University. Good morning, Al Steinman. I'm a research professor in aquatic ecology at Grand Valley State University. Good morning, everyone. Bill Hopkins. I'm a professor of wildlife conservation at Virginia Tech. Jeff Walters, professor in biological sciences at Virginia Tech. And we have a, a few people online. Committee members. Yes, good morning. Uh, it's John Calloway, wetland ecologist <laughs> from the University of San Francisco. And this is Wendy Graham. I'm a hydrologist and director of the Water Institute at University of Florida. And I'm Charles Driscoll. I'm on the faculty of Syracuse University, and I'm also a committee member. And I think that's everyone. And I'm Jim Sayers, a professor of hydrology at Yale University. So Stephanie, are there any other housekeeping, housekeeping items before we get underway? Okay, we'll get started with Nicole Niemeyer of the South Florida Water Management District. And she's going to give us an overview of BBC objectives relative to current ecological conditions. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nicole Niemeyer. I work with the South Florida Water Management District Ecosystem Restoration Bureau, and I serve as project manager for the Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Planning Study, 
also known as BBCR, and I'm going to provide a brief high-level overview of the BBCR planning study this morning. Okay, so um, this slide represents the historic existing. Wait a second, we're we're catching up with the audio video. Okay. Okay. So this slide represents the historic existing and future conditions of the greater Everglades ecosystem. And it shows the BBC or study area relative to the greater Everglades ecosystem. Historically, there was overland sheet flow across the landscape um, that moved through a gradient of ecological habitats from freshwater wetlands to coastal mangrove areas to the near shore seagrass areas. And when the CNSF project was constructed, that disrupted that natural overland flow and um, gradient of habitats and the ecological connectivity between those habitat types. And in the future, within the study area, the planning study is contending with sea level rise, um, which will inundate portions of the study area and result in saltwater intrusion. At the bottom of the slide, um, these schematics depict the historical current day and future hydrologic regimes. Again, historically, the flow was traditionally overland sheet flow through that gradient of habitats to the near shore coastal areas. Present day with the canal system, there are point source discharges to the coastal areas, oftentimes too much flow to the near shore area during the wet season and then not enough flow to the near shore area during the dry season. And then in the future with sea level rise, we'll be contending with, again, saltwater intrusion, and it makes it a little bit more complex with moving that water across the landscape and into the coastal areas. Okay, so this is a closer look at the existing conditions and the gradient of habitats that I mentioned previously with the freshwater wetlands, with sawgrass and muley grass vegetation types. And within our study area, the freshwater wetlands are located within the Southern Glades region, the model lands and an area we refer to as the triangle. It's between two roads, um, US-1 and Card Sound Road. And it also includes intertidal coastal areas, predominantly with um, mangrove red, black, and white types in the near shore coastal areas. And then we have subtitle. Um, this is a closer, a closer look at the study area, um, which is within this magenta area here. It encompasses a significant portion of Miami-Dade County. It extends all the way north to the county border between Broward County and Miami-Dade County, west to Water Conservation Area 3B <clears throat> and Everglades National Park and then south and east to the coastal areas that I mentioned previously. Within this white dashed line are the natural areas that we're targeting for restoration. And that includes, again, the Southern Everglades, the Eastern Panhandle of Everglades National Park, the model lands, Manatee Bay, Barn Sound, Card Sound, and Biscayne Bay and Biscayne National Park. The SERP Yellow Book components included in the BBC study include the North Lake Belt, <clears throat> which is located in this area. Those are lime mining operations. Some are still active, some are not, um, and they form a series of lakes. So we're looking at sourcing and storing water in that area. It also includes West <clears throat> and South Miami-Dade County reuse, which we're looking at for water supply for ecological benefit. And also the Biscayne Bay um, canals and coastal wetlands. So we're looking at reducing those point source discharges and redistributing those into a more historical hydrologic regime um, through the coastal mangroves um, and into the shoreline rather than point source discharges. And that it also includes the C-111N canal project yellow book component, which is evaluating um, redistributing flows into the southern Everglades and eastern panhandle of Everglades National Park. Um, components four through six were actually components in prior SERP studies that are already authorized, the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands and Biscayne Bay 
coastal canals. Um, we're part of the BBCW, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Phase 1 project, and C-111N was part of the C-111 Spreader Canal project. BBCR has um, four project objectives and some overarching themes, which include water sourcing from the northwest portion of the study area, conveying that water south, and redistributing those flows and rehydrating the natural areas that I mentioned previously that are targeted for restoration. The four project objectives include restoring salinity regimes and minimizing the unnatural canal releases, restoring freshwater wetland depth, ponding duration, and flow timing, restoring the natural ecological and hydrological connectivity between that gradient of habitats, and then finally, sea level change resiliency, increasing and restoring the ecological resilience in the coastal habitats in southeastern Miami-Dade County. <clears throat> this is the planning process timeline for the study. The study kicked off in September of 2020 with the scoping phase. We're currently in the alternative formulation and analysis phase, which consists of three rounds of modeling <clears throat> before we get to one final tentatively selected plan. We're currently in the midst of that third round of modeling before we land on that one plan. And then we plan to have a chief's report at the end of 2025 and submit that to Congress for authorization with WERDA 2026. And that concludes my presentation. There is a BBCR webpage that the Army Corps of Engineers has. I think you received some read ahead materials. Those are also available on the website, fact sheets, slides from our project delivery team meetings. Um, and you can also reach out to us at this email address, bbcrcomments at usace.army.mil or to any of the project managers or planning leads at the Water Management District or the Army Corps. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so next, we're going to go to Gina Ralph of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and she's going to uh, present on consideration of climate change in BBC or planning process. All right, good morning. I'm Gina Ralph with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and I was asked to give a brief overview of how we utilize performance measures, including those for resiliency, in order to evaluate alternative plans. Okay, so um, we develop uh, project performance measures that have specific targets. Uh, these are quantitative in nature, and we utilize those as part of our hydrologic modeling. So our regional simulation model is the basis for the evaluation of these performance measures. Um, with this, we calculate how much of a target each of our performance measure will have a target, and we evaluate how close the alternatives get to that target. And from that, we have developed a planning model, which I will give you a brief overview of next. And that is just one piece of the puzzle where we develop these habitat units. This is the currency in which the Corps of Engineers evaluates projects. Um, in other projects, such as our coastal storm risk management or deep draft navigation, we use uh, national economic development as the standard. But in aquatic ecosystem restoration projects, we utilize habitat units. So we compare these habitat units across all alternatives, and then we look at all of the different other accounts in which we um, assess, including environmental effects. We have to do within SERP what we call our savings clause analysis, where we analyze uh, flood control and water supply needs. And then, of course, we utilize um, economics. So we have a um, CEICA, which is cost effectiveness incremental cost analysis. All of these components help us settle on the plan, which we call our tentatively selected plan. So ecological performance measures, I'll give you a brief overview of them. They're all linked to our project objectives. Uh, they are modeled and they are evaluated quantitatively. 
Each one of the performance measures has a documentation sheet in which you can understand the rationale, the uh, basis for the target, as well as the literature and the calculation of the individual metric. Um, they establish that relationship between our modeling output and our ecological goals. And those are developed from our conceptual ecological models that we use in Everglades planning and that recover restoration, coordination, and verification has just completed several updates to those models. Um, and these are gonna provide that foundation for those habitat units. So Nicole gave you an overview of the objectives of the BBCR project. And this is just to show you the crosswalk of how the individual performance measures are tied to the specific project objectives. So as you can see, we have nine performance measures here. And uh, later today, uh, Fred and Carlos are going to give you an overview of our resiliency performance measure, uh, performance measure number seven, the adapt adaptive foundational resilience. So the performance measures, just to, again, this was included as part of your read ahead. It gives you an overview of each of the performance measures and, and what they are quantitatively measuring to meet our objectives. So salinity in the near shore of Biscayne Bay, um, this is a really savvy performance measure uh, created by a um, multi um, interagency group of scientists utilizing information collected as part of the I-BEAM program, which is in part funded by restoration coordination and verification. We also have a direct canal releases. It simply measures the reduction in canal flows as a result of the alternatives. Uh, we have a, a timing and distribution of flow sources to Biscayne Bay, and that's looking at how similar can we get to those historical flows uh, to the bay. Um, hydro period and water depths, we like to evaluate these uh, together. Uh, those will look at the duration of flooding and then the actual depth within our communities. Uh, the wetland salinity performance measure, uh, this looks at poor water salinity. And uh, this is utilizing information collected through the long-term uh, ecological um, restoration. I'm sure I got that wrong, the LTER program. Um, and then Fred and Carlos don't want to spoil theirs. And then we also have ecological connectivity and sheet flow. So how have we taken all of this information? It's a pretty large area um, and look at nine performance measures to come up with a single score uh, for each alternative. So we have to have a process for doing that. So we have uh, specific regulations within the Corps of Engineers in which we have to develop a planning model. It has to go through our ecosystem uh, center of expertise in order for them to approve of how we're going to go ahead and aggregate all of these scores into habitat units. So we first divided the area in zones. Um, so we have five zones within BBCR. Uh, the zones were based upon their drainage characteristics, uh, historical flows, um, the unique characteristics of each, and then any natural and artificial barriers. Um, and you can see uh, on the map here are our BBCR zones. Uh, so A, B, C, and D are terrestrial, and E is the near shore, which is the entire near shore of our project footprint. Within those zones, we also have indicator regions. So you can see uh, there are lots of indicator regions in which uh, these, are, these are groups of cells within the modeling grid that have similar uh, characteristics, uh, similar vegetation, uh, similar elevations, um, and they represent the landscape common to today as well as the pre-drainage system and they are intended to be homogenous. So what we use these indicator regions for, similar to other projects that we've done for CERP planning, is we use that to predict what may happen at the larger scale, uh, because it's hard to synthesize all of the information from every individual RSM cell, but Walter will tell us we can do that, uh, but this makes it a little bit easier. Um, so we expect that change within those indicator regions are, are going to be uh, show similar responses to those hydrologic changes. 
And the indicator regions that we have here, um, we were very specific in how we chose them. It was a very long integrated process with the um, ecological subteam, and again, a multidisciplinary and uh, multi agency approach. So we didn't think just indicator regions were enough. We also wanted transects because we want to measure flow and the sheet flow performance measure will measure the flow at those transects. So we have uh, zones uh, A, B, C, and E all have um, transects. Uh, zone D does not have any transects included. And so um, what we've done, what we've done from here is this just shows you now the name of the zone, A through E the number of indicator regions and transects within each of those zones, and then of those nine performance measures, which ones are calculated within those zones when we roll up our scores. And so I know you can't see the boxes, um, but it's just a, a graphical illustrative interpretation of how we're actually doing this. So the planning model is on your left. The, the first step is we have to normalize and, and tabulate the performance measures. So we wanna make sure they're all on the same scale. Uh, from there, we are gonna compute weight and weighted scores. And you've probably heard me before say the core doesn't like to weight things. And how we've done this here, each of the performance, me some of the performance measures have submetrics included within them. And so those submetrics, we don't want a performance measure that may have two submetrics being twice the weight. So that's what I mean by weighting. We've, we've simply adjusted that. So all of the performance measures have that equal score of one with the exception of the performance measure for the near shore salinity. Although that one has three related submetrics, they're equally weighted because of the importance of having um, sufficient ways of evaluating the vast nearshore community and ensuring that that project objective has um, equal, an equal voice. Um, so from there, um, after we've computed the weights, we start doing these, these combined um, combinations and we call them station scores. So a station score is simply whether it's an indicator region or whether it's a transect. It's just an umbrella term that we use. Um, from there, we're going to sum and normalize the station scores again so that no one has um, more weight than another. Uh, so again, putting everything on a level playing field and then we calculate those habitat units. Um, and from there, we're going to compare habitat units across uh, alternatives. And we do that by comparing it to the alternative minus the future without condition. So that delta will give us our ecological lift. So that is a very short, quick summary of a very complicated process. We have, uh, a, a, no, it's probably an 85 to 90 page document that I'm happy to share with you that um, is currently with our eco PCX uh, for approval. Um, we start that coordination early on in the process, so there aren't any surprises. This is my third time with going and informing the eco PCX of what we're doing. We start with uh, approval of the performance measures, then we go to the approval of the modeling tools, then we actually have a, a spreadsheet that does all of these calculations that um, also undergoes a peer review with the Army Corps. And then finally, um, in October, which is just a few days away, um, I am anticipating uh, another meeting with them to address any final questions, and then we'll have our our final approval moving into our third round of alternatives. And with that, I'm going to, I think, turn it over to Carlos. Walter, okay, thank you. We, Gina, we can, are there any questions from the committee? Will we move on to Walter? Yeah, I have one question, Jim. Um, Gina, is, is any of this peer reviewed outside of the core? Yes, so we have several steps in our review process. So. The step for the planning model goes to the eco -PCX. 
Once we write our document, we have a district quality control review, which is internal to the Jacksonville district. And at the same time, South Florida Water Management District will go through their technical review process. We also have what's called an agency technical review, which are individuals within the core from outside the South Atlantic Division. Uh, Jacksonville is part of the South Atlantic Division that will do that review. And then we also have an independent external peer review that will also review all of the details of the project. Sure. Go ahead, Helen. Um, I have a couple of technical questions. Um, so number one in the um, design or selection of the performance measures, I noticed that they aren't, um, there aren't any that are directly biotic, they seem all abiotic with perhaps the exception of expanding habitat. Um, can, can you um, elaborate on the rationale for that? Like why there aren't any sort of more ecological biotic measures? Sure, so we are measuring our ability to adjust flow. It's all based on hydrology. We're using output from a hydrologic model to understand how we are redistributing flow to meet the objectives of the project. So this is for habitat units. When we go and document the performance overall of all of the alternative plans as part of the National Environmental Policy Act documentation, we also use a whole suite of tools that we term ecological um, indicator tools. And Laura Diaconto will talk a little bit more about some of those tools that the Joint Ecosystem Modeling Group has developed that will tell us a little bit more of how is it going to affect wading birds? How is it going to affect pink shrimp? How is it going to affect alligators or crocodiles? So we will understand that biotic response, but that is not used to measure and evaluate in the habitat unit process. And if you remember from the, the first slide where you see the, the pieces of the puzzle, those gem tools will help us to understand the environmental effects, which is another piece of the puzzle. Okay, thanks. That was a, a clear um, explanation. And then my other question is, why were only a subset of performance measures used in some regions? So what's the rationale behind using different sets of performance measures across regions? Sure. So um, some of our performance measures, let me get to the, so some of our performance measures, performance measures uh, one, two, and three, those are directly related to just the near shore. So they are simply measured in the near shore environment, which is zone E for the entire, in the entirety of the project footprint. Uh, the other performance measures, you can see four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, are measured in um, the zones A, B, C, and D, and those are our terrestrial performance metrics. And that's the difference. And I just have one more question, I'm sorry. So when you're looking across each of these different zones, A to E, how then is, um, how then are, are decisions made? Is there an aggregate across those zones or are they considered separately looking at um, costs and benefits across each one or in each one? So, so the beauty of the planning model is that we can look at indicator regions, we can look at zones and we can then roll it up because you know when you roll things up like this, you lose the, the parts and pieces. But by having the ability to look at performance within each of the zones, there may be specific management measures, which are the engineering features that are providing a certain suite of benefits in one zone. And we want to retain those and move those into you know, our next round of modeling or tentatively selected plan. So we have that ability to mix and match, um, to understand what management measure, what engineering feature may be responsible for providing the benefits within a certain zone. So that's why we've done it this way, so that we can um, have a good idea of what's happening throughout the spatial footprint, acknowledging how large it is. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll take one more question um, from Ramesh Reddy, who is yeah. online. Uh, I, I was just curious to know that why the water quality as a performance indicator is not included in their model. So uh, we do not have a, a water quality performance measure that we developed as part of the ecological sub team. Uh, there is a water quality evaluation methodology that the water quality sub team um, is working to develop to describe uh, changes in water quality as a result of the project, and that will be included in our National Environmental Policy Act documentation. Um, but we don't have anyone here from our water quality team to to speak to that today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gina. Uh, next, we'll hear from Walter Wilcox from the South Florida Water Management District. Walter is going to describe modeling strategies to analyze climate change effects on BBC or alternatives. Okay. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, <laughs> Okay, great. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. I'm going to go very quickly through a lot of slides. It's going to be breakneck. A lot of this material has been covered in the past uh, committee sessions. So um, if you have any questions, please reach out. And you also have a lot of resources there. So this is your uh, quick introduction to the modeling work that's being done to support the evaluations that Gina just went through. And so we have a broad range of modeling tools that we're applying in the BBC project. Um, you can see these are the four primary uh, modeling tools that are being used as part of the plan formulation and overall project support. Uh, on the left is the RSM uh, Glades Lex model. The regional simulation model is a daily time step hydrologic model that runs a long term climate record. It was developed by the South Florida Water Management District. It's been in application for 20 plus years in Everglades Restoration, peer reviewed twice, gone through the Corps engineering certification process uh, for approval for use in South Florida. Um, so that's kind of our benchmark primary hydrologic model that we use to analyze the effects. Uh, when we're running that model, just to, to get ahead of some of the questions that the previous committee had asked, we're not running a succession tool. We're not starting a today's system and moving out into the future and seeing how things evolve with sea level change over time. What we're doing is we're running snapshots in time. We look at the current system and we run a long-term climate record through it, 1965 through 2016 climate. We look at all the ways that the current system might react to that rainfall. And then we move to the future. We go out to 2085. We look at the sea level conditions, the future conditions. And we do the same thing. We run all the climate record through that future scenario. And then we compare the two scenarios to each other to see the, the changes. So um, the model actually has the capability to run succession, but we haven't quite gotten there yet as an overall team with <laughs> the, the data sets and the performance measures and things like that. Um, so the hydrologic model is the RSM on the left. Uh, we also have two salinity models that are applied by, um, uh, that have been developed by others, I should say. Uh, the BISEC model uh, was developed by the USGS. Uh, 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 Ishtak Kundecker and Eric Swain and Tiffany Troxler are supporting the project by running that model uh, through FIU and USGS for the project. Uh, we also have the Biscayne based simulation model, which was developed over the years. Department of the Interior was uh, integral in that. Eric Stabenow here had uh, a large uh, effort in developing that model. We brought that into the NRC Modeling Center and updated it, and we're running it as part of the, uh, the, the tool suite to evaluate the near shore salinity. Um, and then the model on the right is the Miami Data RSM. It's just another version of the RSM model that runs at a smaller temporal and spatial time scale. So it runs at a 15 minute time scale, and it's really used for the flood evaluation portion of the project. I will talk about that much today. So when we're doing the plan formulation, this is kind of the workflow. Uh, the project team, uh, Jennifer, John, and others will define an alternative that comes to the Interagency Modeling Center. And then we run the RSMGL. We put all the features into the model and simulate the hydrology. Um, that hydrology is then fed as boundary conditions into the two salinity models, the Biscayne Bay simulation model and the bisect model so that we get the salinity response. And then we begin the evaluation. So the RSM is directly uh, post-processed for some of the hydrologic measures, the hydro period, the water depth, the ponding, those types of things. Um, we also run the uh, salinity models and those get post-processed for the near shore salinity and the wetland salinity uh, performance metrics. And then as Gina mentioned, we also provide information to uh, Laura and Stephanie Romanak for the joint ecosystem modeling group and they do all the ecological modeling. And all of that then feeds into uh, the habitat unit and NEPA evaluation, along with all the other information that the project is collecting. 
And so I just want to really quickly run you through uh, some of the updates that have been made. BBCR has been great in sponsoring uh, tool updates as part of uh, this effort. Um, identified by this panel, I think two committees ago, there was a very uh, <laughs> limited set of tools that were available for this type of work. And the BBCR project has spent the last several years updating uh, the modeling tools. Um, so there's a lot of text on these. I'm just going to kind of quickly run through them. You'll have the presentation. You can go back and review the text. But um, essentially, we've updated the RSMGL to expand and refine the spatial extent and the mesh in the southern southeastern portion of the system to respond to the needs of the project uh, within the study area. Um, so you can see we've actually expanded the mesh off the shoreline. Um, we're not trying to model salinity or things like that, but that's a necessary thing to move our boundary conditions kind of further away from where we want to model. So we're still using the RSM for the terrestrial modeling, um, but we want to make sure that the flux exchange from the terrestrial to the nearshore environment and the stages in the terrestrial environment are well uh, represented. And so that was a, a technique that we used to try to get there. Um, so we've added fidelity, we've expanded the, uh, the spatial extent. We've done things like calibration. It's still a challenge uh, in this part of the system. We've brought in a, a lot of new data sets. Um, some of the areas um, are relatively heterogeneous, and this is a regional scale model. Um, but you know the, the improvements that we've made in the model mesh and the, the other data sets have improved um, the, the data matching in this part of the system. We also have uh, corrected things where in the previous regional simulation model, what I call the, the legacy original mesh, the focus was Everglades restoration, central Everglades restoration, I should say. And so the boundary conditions were just that, they were boundary conditions and we weren't really focused on it. So you can see on the left there, like the very bottom, there's a bunch of blue arrows moving along the coastline, you know, like just making a left turn as they reach the coast and, you know, kind of uh, collecting in uh, the Eastern Panhandle. Um, on the right, you can see that we've uh, corrected those types of modeling numerical issues, right? So the water is now moving perpendicular to the coast or it's moving within uh, the, the preferred flow paths, you know, in the lower spots of the topography, et cetera. Um, so those are the types of changes that we made. Uh, we've also incorporated updates to the data sets. And I'm just gonna run through the animation here quickly to the blue. Um, so all of those land cover and specific um, habitats, uh, you know, landscapes that Gina mentioned, they've actually been brought into the RSM model. So all of the land cover data has been updated uh, in the southeastern portion of the system to represent those mangrove systems and uh, freshwater marsh systems that uh, Nicole described. Um, we've also incorporated updates to topography to account for the accretion processes that are happening over time. And we're also updating the tidal boundary conditions, which I'm going to get into here in a second. So when we're looking at sea level change, uh, the, the title of this presentation is actually climate change. Um, we're, we haven't quite gotten to the rainfall climate scenario piece yet. I think you heard about that at your last session. We're working with uh, you know, Dr. Obasakara and others to generate regional climate scenarios. So that's coming. It's not quite here for BBCR. So BBCR is focused on the sea level change piece of uh, climate change uh, suite of uh, stressors. And this is a, uh, a climate change projection uh, at the Vakaki station, uh, in which is pertinent to our study area. And you can just see that there is a, a sea level rise uh, anticipated in this part of the system uh, based on a lot of work by other members of the team. We're following the green trace, which is the intermediate uh, sea level change curve for our primary formulation. We will do a check later in the project on the high curve, the red curve, to see what effects that, that higher uh, sea level accelerated uh, rate of change does to our project. But for the formulation step we're in right now, we're looking at the green trace, and that's kind of mimicking what we've been seeing in the system uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, so as I mentioned, we will run scenarios at the current condition at 2022, and then we'll run scenarios out at the end of the planning horizon, which in this case is 2085, and we'll compare those different scenarios to see the effects of the project. Um, and embedded in that is a change in sea level, as you see here, roughly 1.6 feet uh, additional sea level across the, uh, uh, across the, the domain. And so when we do this in RSM, uh, again, the, the tidal boundary conditions in the RSM used to be pretty simplistic. I think there were 10 stations that were used across uh, the domain. We've significantly expanded the spatial uh, fidelity of the model. Um, we've added in, a whole, you can see a large suite of uh, gauges from a variety of sources from the NOAA um, offshore tidal stations, both primary and subordinate stations, um, as well as tailwater conditions at our structures, as well as locations that Everglades National Park maintains. So we have a very uh, good you know, spatial representation of different uh, tidal conditions along the boundary uh, of the RSM. And um, when we are trying to model in this type of planning exercise, I think you talked a little bit about some of the sea level change things that are being done for resiliency and things like that. Um, in the long-term planning, 
uh, we have available to us these long-term time series of what we call the NOAA harmonic data. And the NOAA harmonic data tries to get at the signals that you see from um, you know, larger scale uh, influences on tidal boundary conditions, right? Like the position of the moon, you know, where things are, are, are driving things around. And they do a great job of capturing some of the variability, but we were concerned in our project that we weren't, that we were going to miss some of the important variability in the data set that we observed by just using the NOAA harmonic time series. Um, so if you're in an event type modeling, like what you heard last session, it's pretty simple. You just add an extra offset to it. You say, I got a storm event, I've got a surge, you know, I'm going to, you know, put an offset on top of the, uh, the, um, the, the harmonic signal in a long-term planning model. You want to maintain some of the temporal and spatial coherence of the data. And we started casting around saying, who's doing this? And we talked with NOAA, we talked with the core climate cop. Um, no one's doing this, <laughs> so we had to do it. <laughs> you know? And so what we were getting at here is this concept of residuals. So you can see in this simple example, there's an observed time series of tidal data. The NOAA harmonic, which is kind of the, the fundamental standard that we're using in a lot of places, is the orange time series. And there's differences. And some of those differences probably don't mean that much to us, but others like the peak you know, water level differences that you see here, we wanted to try to capture some of that in our planning so that we weren't blind to it as we were doing our study. So we went through this process that I won't describe. Uh, Dr. Alali and the IMC um, came up with a, a really innovative way of trying to further decompose the, the signal of the observed data uh, being predicted by the harmonic itself. And if you wanna get into that, I'm happy to have a great side for conversation over lunch. Um, but the, uh, again, at this VACA key, I'm just gonna use some examples. So this is the, signal decomposition of the residual itself. So this is above and beyond what NOAA gets. This is the first eight components of the residual that we're trying to add into the modeling of what's already there with the harmonic. We do screen out the, what we call a high frequency noise signal. So there's a ninth signal in there, which is completely confounding. And we said, we're not gonna chase it. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's just there, we, we don't have anything to predict it. It's, it's not worth going for. So we are trying to capture these first eight uh, signals that we saw in the data set. And when we do that, what we see is this is um, just a simple box and whisker of kind of the seasonal pattern of observed salinity, uh, uh, seawater level that we see at the VACA station in real world data, this is observed data. Um, and when we use the harmonic, we get what you would expect, a very nice harmonic signal, right? And so we lose some things by, by doing that. When we put back in the additional residual modeling and the offset, we come to something like this. So you'll notice it's a little bit higher um, than the, the observed. Um, because of the sea level change, we've actually experienced four tenths of a foot of sea level change relative to the center point of the last tidal uh, epoch. But we went through this exercise because we want to see that variability. We want that to be in our time series, and we don't want to just rely on the harmonic, which is a completely appropriate, you know, technique for other <laughs> intended purposes. But for this purpose, we wanted to get a little more. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like in. Uh, in time series mode, the um, the orange is actually the observed data, and you can see there's an up increasing trend, and there's changes in the variability over time. If we just use the detrended harmonic data, we get the red, and what we're using in BBC here is the blue, which has it's detrended. It does it's not trying to capture a sea level change. We would have a version of this for the current condition. We would have a version of this with 1.6 feet higher for the 2085 condition, and we're trying to capture that additional variability. So you can see in particular this blue trace. Um, you know, captures a lot of the, the period that we were trying to match here. And there are some, you know, there's still an increasing trend, you know, if we were at a different uh, you know, point in time, or if we were trying to do storm surge modeling or something like that, we would be worried about some of those really high peaks. But, um, you know, we, we were pretty comfortable with this outcome for what we're trying to do here. And so the RSIM has gone through all of those updates. We'll hear about its application in a couple of minutes in the next presentation, but that's just to orient you the types of things that were done in the model. Um, and then we also updated the salinity models. Uh, the Biscayne Bay simulation model was updated uh, to version five, uh, again, building on the good work that was done by the Department of the Interior. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could pass the flux data from the RSMGL into the BBSM and get reasonable results. Um, in order to do that, we had to do a limited recalibration exercise of the BBSM model to make sure that the, the data transfer between the two models was still capable of reproducing the historical data and then moving forward into application. Um, so we went through that process and we now have a, a tool that we're applying. Uh, the outcomes of this tool are what actually go into the nearshore salinity performance measure that Gina described, and that's been a, a very helpful tool for us. 
uh, I'll just mention some of the recalibration efforts, you know, just we were doing the standard things, checking for root mean square error and bias and everywhere you see a green here, we, we actually were able to improve the simulation by combining the new boundary conditions and also bringing in some of the some changes in the conceptualization and accounting for some other parameterization in the diffusion coefficient and other factors. So um, again, we're, we're pretty comfortable with the behavior of the model. Just to show you some plots, the observed data is calibrated to the uh, you know to the model response um, you know for what we're doing. And then just in conclusion, the bisect model has also been updated. Again, it's working with the RSMGL boundary conditions. Uh, the FIU team is putting a lot of effort uh, to that. Uh, they also validated that model to the latest observations of pore water data that they've been collecting as part of their study. Um, so we have, uh, again, observation data points within transects in the southern part of the system that uh, Dr. Tiffany Troxler and others have been collecting. And that was used to calibrate the density dependence uh, salinity response of that part of the model. Um, so this uh, model is, is now in place and integrated with our overall modeling suite, and that's used to evaluate the wetland uh, salinity performance measure that Gina described in the last presentation. So that's your breakneck introduction to the modeling tools that are helping to support the project. Happy to answer any questions. Go ahead, Casey. Thanks, Walter. That was great. Um, I'm just curious if you could talk about your feelings in, in using these models and each of the models in these um, in the future conditions, which are sea level, future sea level rise, in the sense that they're calibrated for historical conditions, they have various assumptions and your thoughts on how well they'll hold when you sort of put them to work under these new conditions they haven't seen before. Yeah, so that's very front of mind for us. Um, we're, we're trying to make sure that we do have robustness into the future by looking at, obviously, the reactions that we get to the sea level rise in the future condition. Um, we've also taken some steps to adjust the, the data sets themselves, topography. Fred is going to talk about this when we get into the application phase. Um, so we know that over time, the, the physics of the system are changing. And to the extent possible, we're, we're modifying the model input data sets to reflect those realities, right? So we're modifying topography to represent the accretion changes. Um, we believe that a vegetation uh, landscape is still going to have roughly the same roughness, like a mangrove, you know, in the future. But we did change. Uh, I, don't, I don't have it open, but the map that I showed you of the vegetation map, we have a methodology for moving that those vegetation classes inland in response to sea level. So we're relying on the calibration, certainly, for the physical parameters, aquifer parameters, vegetation resistance, but we're manipulating data sets to try to account for some of those differences that you're mentioning in, in the future system. Um, and then we're back checking on the, when we apply the model to make sure that the responses make sense and that we're not getting things like numerical oscillation or, um, you know, we, we don't violate the water budget. The RSM can't violate the water budget, but, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, hope that answers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So how often uh, do you update the model runs and the models themselves and what triggers those updates? So the regional simulation model is our enterprise tool that we use for central Everglades. Um, we're on about, I would like to say five years, but it's probably closer to 10 years. We do a long-term data extension. So when we first started doing Everglades restoration, the, the, the types of models that we're doing here, they used a climate record from 1965 through uh, to, actually, it was 1995 when we first started Everglades restoration, and now we're up through 2016. So every time that we do one of those big data updates, we revisit globally the calibration efforts. And so we will bring in the latest data, we'll recalibrate the models across the entire spatial domain. Um, we will also do efforts for specific projects driven by the project needs um, to update the tools. So like what you saw with the remeshing and what I call limited recalibration, that was done as sponsored by BBC here. It was specific to this portion of the system. We did the same thing for Western Everglades five years ago when the Western Everglades needed more fidelity out of the model than what we performed, than what we had there currently. So we remeshed, did a calibration effort as part of that project. So the answer to your question is we have two ways of doing it. We do it episodically when the project needs it and has the schedule and the funding to do it, or we do it programmatically on roughly a five to 10 year cycle where we do a system-wide look and update our tools. I'm going to sneak a question in here before I get to Wendy. Um, so you, you, you devoted a um, significant amount of effort to, to um, 
sort of expanding the boundaries of your do, of your domain um, of RSM. RSM is a is a freshwater model. Um, it, uh, how how are you accounting for salinity effects in the flow model? Is it variable density now, or are you doing equivalent freshwater head? Yeah, we're we're not accounting for the density dependence of flow. Um, it's strictly uh, like you said, freshwater uh, water movement. But we're going back and forth between the bisect model, which is a density dependent model, um, which is an integrated surface water groundwater model, and we're trying to leverage the back and forth information between BBSM and bisect with the RSM to come to a version of water flow where everything works and makes sense, right? So we're not relying on strictly the RSM. I know that in the application mode, it's RSM runs and then the other things run. But when we were developing the models, we were going back and forth to make sure that the two pieces of information came together. Why is it necessary to do that coupling? Why wouldn't you just accept BISEC, the BISEC model? The, the short answer is the BISEC model is primarily a groundwater model. It has some surface water capability, but it definitely lacks the, um, the ability to put in all of our future project features easily. I'll put it that way. So the, um, you see the note on there that it will not simulate the project features. The real strength of the RSM is that it gives us not just the, the physics of the system, but it gives us the ability to implement the infrastructure and the operational management. So when we're doing all these things with BBC, or let's put a reservoir over there, let's put a pump station over there, let's move water in this way and that way. RSM is great at that. And the other models don't have quite as much capability. So the coupled approach made sense to us to help get to all the pieces of what we're trying to change in the project. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Wendy. Yeah, I was wondering for your future condition, your future sea level change condition, um, you're still measuring against historic salinity performance measures. You're not thinking about changing performance measures for a future sea level rise? Not sure I understand the question, Wendy. Sorry, I'm. <laughs> well, you have you have salinity performance measures that are based on historic sea level, correct? I think the salinity and probably Gina can answer this better, but the salinity performance measures are informed by the I beam observations. In that sense, the framing of those performance measures is predicated on historical data, but we're applying them in a future condition where. The, the dynamics within the bay are different. There's less fresh water, there's changes in the salinity regime, and we are seeing a sensitivity in those PMs, which we'll talk about in the next presentation. Okay, then I'll wait. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Walter. Thank you. Okay, so Jennifer John of the Corps is gonna kick us off on uh, BBC or alternatives, uh, sea level rise and resilience. So this next presentation, as Gina mentioned, is very, this is an interdisciplinary process. Um, and the problem when you have Fred, Walter, and Carlos all in a single presentation is that there's too much knowledge to go through hotel Wi-Fi. <laughs> so we're just gonna switch and so this part of the presentation, um, we're gonna get into some of our uh, rounds of alternatives that the BBC or plan formulation process developed. Um, and then some of the results, particularly the results that Fred and Carlos have worked on for the resiliency performance measure. So this is our USACE risk informed planning process. Um, we start with identifying problems and opportunities, which goes into um, working on our planning objectives that Nicole described earlier. We always do an inventory and forecast, which is describing the existing conditions and a future condition if no project were to be implemented. Um, step three is plan formulation, which is the development of different alternatives that might solve those problems. We evaluate those alternatives and compare them. And then step six is decision making and selection of things to move forward. Um, I do want to note that this is an iterative process. We go through this cycle many, many times. And BBC is currently on its fifth iteration of this. Every time we have additional information that we get to utilize and incorporate into our process. Nicole presented this earlier, but I just wanted to reiterate our project objectives for the nearshore salinity improvements, um, improving wetland water depth, ponding and flow timing, restoring natural ecological and hydrologic connectivity, 
And what we're really gonna focus on with this presentation is that resiliency to sea level change and climate change. Um, and so the, the graphic that we put up here really is kind of how we start a plan formulation process because any feature that we want to put into the ground needs to meet an objective in some way. So um, we have water sourcing available in the Northwest. We need to move that water through the urban core of Miami-Dade County and also uphill over a coastal ridge so that it can finally be redistributed into our natural features, which are in the South and the East and the near shore areas. Um, so these are our round two alternatives. These were developed and modeled uh, in February. And these are the latest alternatives that we have modeling results for. Um, and so this is also the first chance that BBC had where the team was looking at sea level rise and comparing a future without project scenario with an intermediate sea level rise compared to um, sea level rise being included in our with project conditions at 2085. Um, alternative 21 had features in the Northwest that was looking to hold water in wetlands and some rock mines um, before conveying that water and distributing it south and east. And then in our south and east areas, the redistribution features in the model lands and southern glades had a couple of different orientations or materials, different types of features for seepage management. Um, and we changed these throughout our different alternatives to find which ones would provide the most types of benefits. Um, in alternative 21, we did have a sensitivity run. We used these features that we added wastewater reuse. Alternative 22, used features in the Northwest, but we weren't trying to hold water there. We were just trying to capture that water and direct it further South and East for additional sources for use. Um, Alternative 22 had a sensitivity run in the coastal agricultural areas where we used one-way drainage wells to move water out of the, the coastal agricultural area. Um, Alternative 23 had some different features in the Northwest to try to hold water for some seasonal carryover. Um, we wanted to use these different features to compare which would do better versus alternative 21. Um, and we had two sensitivity runs in alternative 23. They were both aquifer storage and recovery. One was in the Northwest and one was in the coastal agricultural area. And then alternative 24 does look a little bit different. Um, we didn't have any sources of water in the Northwest. And we were only looking at redistributing regional water within the natural areas. And the big purpose of having this particular alternative was to compare the benefits of utilizing water sources in the Northwest, which we have in our other three alternatives. Um, and we know that those Northwest features are a little bit more complex. They are most expensive. And um, the, at least the, the core team is anticipating some questions from our vertical review team about being able to justify using those more expensive features. So we decided to include alternative 24 so that we would have all the modeling data and the robust evaluation compared to the other round two alternatives. And that would help the team be able to, to show and make those comparisons. So all of this modeling data, thank you, Walter, was uh, presented to the team and provided in about April timeframe. And the team spent a lot of time with this data. Um, and the full evaluation, and we had a complete comparison uh, presentation in late July to our public and our PDT meeting. Um, and so I just wanted to point out to Gina's point that she made earlier from a question, I believe it was from Helen. Um, but when we did round two, we knew we had a third round of alternatives coming afterwards. And so our focus was less on an alternative by alternative comparison. So we didn't wanna say, oh, alternative X from round two did the best. We were trying to focus on performance of the different alternatives within our zones. And that was mostly because one alternative might perform the best in the southern glades, but then it might perform, perform the worst for the near shore. If we did an alternative by alternative comparison, we would lose some of that information. Um, and so we were looking at zone by zone so that we could 
put together the best pieces for the next round of alternatives, which is round three. So we have um, the nine ecological performance measures, and we also analyzed water supply, flood protection, and water quality. And I believe now I'm going to turn it over to Walter to talk about some of the hydraulic outcomes. Okay, so yeah, just want to start by acknowledging the Interagency Modeling Center team that worked to develop all of the, the modeling work. Um, the Interagency Modeling Center is comprised, if you're not aware, of, of staff from both the Water Management District and the Army Corps, uh, who are the federal and state sponsors. But uh, in this case, we also had a very significant uh, uh, infusion of help from Department of the Interior. Uh, the Park Service has, has been actively involved on this project and helping uh, with the development of this tool. So I just want to appreciate the, you know, the interagency collaboration uh, on this. So um, I'm going to go through just to give you a, a feel for, the, I think the topic was, what are, we, what are we learning about sea level change, you know, as we do these, these uh, alternatives? Um, so we're learning that it's a big deal. <laughs> you know, that's the, the you know, big shocker, <laughs> you know, so, um, so to show you some of the modeling, um, you know, when we typically do these projects prior to BBC, or we would be doing something like this. We'd be looking at a future without compared to an existing condition. When you look at this, this is the extent of that RSMGL model that we talked about. And you can see the mesh from all the way from the Everglades agricultural area down to Florida Bay. Um, in this particular graphic, when we're looking at blues, we're looking at increased water levels in the uh, condition that we're comparing on the left to the condition on the right. Um, and if we're looking at whites or yellows or reds, it's drier conditions, essentially. So on the left would be a typical thing that you would look at for like a Central Everglades project. Look, we're putting water into the northern part of the system. It's propagating through the system. We're removing levees, right? Things are getting wetter through the Everglades. And that's how we would normally look at things. And we wouldn't really see much going on at the coast. Contrast that to BBC, where we start putting in sea level change. And now we're looking at, in this case, uh, you can see we're, we're looking at two conditions here. The future without intermediate is the future without condition that has that 1.6 foot of sea level change offset uh, compared to the existing condition, which is you know today's sea level. Oops, sorry. Um, and then on the right is how it would have looked if we just did the, uh, the sea level change and we didn't have all the projects. So you could see on the left, that's the cumulative effect of everything that we think is happening in the system, right? We're doing Everglades restoration and sea level is coming up and stages are getting wetter, right? I do want to emphasize this is a stage map. So not all of that is ponded water, right? In fact, the vast majority of the water that you see along the developed side and the urban side is still groundwater in 2085 on the intermediate curve. It may not stay that way on the high curve, <laughs> but um, but it's I don't want this to be interpreted as ponding or surface water flooding. Okay, it just means that the groundwater levels are coming up. Um, and so uh, just to give you, th this was a, a, a set of material for, that was uh, put together by Drew Komen, who's the engineering team lead um, on the BBC project. Uh, and I'm just going to hit a couple of the key highlight points. So we're doing a lot of the things that Jennifer described. You know, we're moving water through the system. Um, and so we we came up with this kind of color code just to orient people. And uh, for the benefit of the project delivery team, we we went slide by slide through each of the, the colors. Uh, given the time constraints today, you don't get that benefit. You just get the big dump of all the summary. <laughs> but um, but basically. We're looking at things all throughout the system. We're making sure that water that um, should stay in Everglades National Park and continue through the natural system on the Western side, that it stays there and that we're not kind of mining Everglades National Park to create benefit on the Eastern side. Um, and then as uh, Jennifer described, we're looking at trying to capture water in the Northern part of the system, reduce some of the uh, impacts of high flow to the Northern part of Biscayne Bay, move that water through the system and across the coastal ridge, and get it down to the, the southern part of the system and improve our ecosystem at the green transect, which is uh, you know called the mega transect here. Um, so I'm going to focus in on kind of that area near the green transect. Um, so this is an example of what BBC is doing. So in this case, we've got a series, we've got two canals actually that move through this area. Um, the, there's one kind of on the northern end here, and there's one on the southern end. Today's drainage is provided by those canals. The, the structure is open, water levels you know, get high, it triggers the operation, it, it discharges as a, as a pulse point discharge into Biscayne Bay. Um, what BBC is trying to do is to prevent those coastal discharges at the structure and put it on the landscape and move it into to a wetland system and let it you know, more naturally move in a distributed way you know, toward the shoreline. 
And so you can see that's what we're doing. The, the, these great graphics that Jennifer puts together with all the polygons on the maps, we, we are putting wetlands everywhere. We're putting pump stations everywhere. I mean, there, this is a lot of infrastructure. It doesn't seem like it, but, but when we start adding up, you know, what's on this map, what's this, you know, seven uh, pump stations uh, at 300 CFS each. It, you know, you start ringing the cash register. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, so the, the basic premise is that, and you can kind of see this in this flow diagram, rather than discharging by gravity through these coastal structures, and again, with sea level change, gravity is not by any means guaranteed. We're now going to start putting pump stations in and moving the water via pump stations into our coastal wetlands, letting the water move across the landscape, infiltrate into the groundwater, move through the landscape toward the shoreline. Um, and so we'll get a mix of surface water and groundwater moving toward the near shore environment. And we'll create coastal wetland benefits by doing that, and we'll hopefully sustain uh, the, the shoreline by doing that. And so you can just kind of get a feel for that from this graphic. And so indeed we see that if we look at this green line transect going back to this map, um, we see that the round two alternatives, and you can see they're in green um, in terms of pass, what I'll call passive flow, not structure flow. Um, we're sending you know, huge amounts more water through the passive system in BBC here. Uh, it's really a, a very good success story for our formulation to date. Um, instead of uh, sending that water through point discharges in the coastal structures, it's now being spread across the landscape and at those measures of landscape flow, you know, um, we're seeing 400, 500, 600 percent increase in water moving, you know, through the system in a natural way. That, that's huge. Um, we also see that the uh, that helps us to combat the effects of sea level change because one of the things we were noticing in, um, and I'm not sure how explicit it is here, but when the sea level comes up, the natural gradient from today's groundwater to the sea level is reduced. And so in the future, we actually wind up with an increased reliance on our coastal structures, right? So in today's system, some portion of the water is moving through the groundwater towards the shoreline. Some portion of it is going through the canal system and through the coastal structures. When the sea level comes up and the groundwater doesn't have that, that gradient anymore to get to the shoreline, all of a sudden it all starts going through the coastal structures. And, and I'll show you that in a second. We start seeing a lot of flow through the coastal structures. This not only reverse not only accounts for that and gets us back to where we were, but it increases above and beyond that by hundreds of percent. So we're able to kind of get ahead of sea level change. So we're not just combating the effect of sea level change, but we're actually creating environmental enhancement above and beyond what um, we're seeing in today's system. And so this is just to, you know, to show you some of the, uh, the alternative performance. So again, this is a seasonal plot of flows across that transect. And I think, I'm not sure. I have my mouse, but um, what you can see there, the, the blue trace is, is the current system, the lower blue trace. Um, and you can see there's a seasonal pattern of flow moving across that green transect um, toward the near shore environment. When we go to the future without intermediate with the sea level change, that actually goes down. It goes to the gray level, right? You know, So we're reducing that gradient. We're getting less water moving in the way that we want it. But then when we put the alternatives in, and you can see all the alternatives of the higher traces, we go past the existing condition. We go you know, back up to a much higher condition, and that's that you know, 500% increase that we were talking about, right? We're getting a lot more flow moving through alternatives, both to combat the sea level trend and also to create the restoration benefits that we're achieving, or we're, we're looking to achieve. And I'll just mention, since Jennifer mentioned all 24 that didn't have the storage features, all 24 does indeed show up as the lowest trace there with the lowest seasonal carryover and the lowest total volume. So we are getting some benefit from those northern uh, Northwest storage features in our project. Uh, this is the story of the coastal structures, and so um, this is just an example of one of those structures, the S20F structure. Um, what you see here is, again, a seasonal pattern of flow. Um, the future without intermediate is the blue trace, and what you can see there is there's a lot of flow moving through that structure in response to the current flood system and the effects of sea level change. And then all the alternatives, I don't know if you can even see it, it's, it's much smaller <laughs> bars there, you know, those colored bars, all of the alternatives significantly reduce the amount of discharge that we're making in our coastal structures because we're sending it through those pump stations instead into the coastal wetlands. And so again, the features, you know, our, our take home from this is that we're able to address the shortfalls in the current system. If we were just to continue with not doing anything into the future, those coastal structures would continue to have their tailwater rising. They'd get less and less effective, right? They'd have to do more because the groundwater isn't going where it's going. And we have a big infrastructure problem, right? This is the solution to that infrastructure problem. Put it into the landscape, you know, build the pumps and we get the environmental benefit as well as maintaining the flood protection and the, the current system functionality.
Um, I will mention that it gets very tricky in canals. This is a canal duration curve for one of those uh, structures. And um, I'm just showing you this to kind of give you the idea of, of the things that we're dealing with in, in the future condition. You can see this kind of three stair step uh, duration curve. There's actually an operating protocol that operates the system at different times of year based on the needs for agricultural planting. It's known as the ag drawdown operation. And so you, you lower the water levels at a certain time of year to allow for planting. And then they come back up a little bit as the crop is still in the ground and then they come higher in the wet season. And you see that in this duration curve and kind of this three stair step thing. Um, when we do BBC or we don't have that clean stair step, right, because there's all kinds of other things happening. We're moving pumps. We've got water coming in from sea level change, uh, all of these things. And one of the lessons that we've learned definitely is that the operating strategy for these pumps and the coastal structures is very specific to the sea level condition that we're seeing, right? So when we look at 2085, it's a different operational mindset, not just a different set of infrastructure than it is in today's system. And I, I don't want to... Uh, I want to make sure that we acknowledge that there's effort required to evolve those operations over time, both in the real world and in the planning, to try to make sure that we capture you know, those dynamics. Um, going down into the southern glades, I'll just mention quick, quickly here hydrologically. Um, this is a transect. It's called a viewing window. So if you look at this zone A transect here, it's actually north to south, kind of in, you know, in parallel with the direction of the flow. And if you imagine if you were standing over here and looking sideways, this is what you would see, the ground surface slopes down uh, with this purple trace and the C-111 canal, which is somewhere around here, you know, shows up on the, on the map. Um, I just wanted to point this out because in this case, this is the future without intermediate and the blue represents the model simulated water levels with that increase of 1.6 feet in sea level. So what you can see is on the left side here without the project, we're very dry. Right, we haven't achieved restoration, but on the right side, we're pretty wet, you know, and that's not because of our restoration efforts. That's because of sea level change, right? Um, and so this area, in, in fact, is too wet. You know? And again, it's not because we're putting water there; it's because of sea level change. And so when we go to our project, just to jump back and forth a couple times here on my pseudo animation, um, you can see that when we put water in at the upstream part of the system, we do get increases in water depth and, and stages. But notice the right side of that graph, it, it doesn't change. So that what we're learning is there's parts of our system where sea level is dominant and we can increase flux toward the sea level, but we can't really do much about the, the water depths that we're going to achieve. Um, and so we see that as well in other parts of the system. This is the, the triangle area, the zone B area, same kind of trend, oh, sorry. Um, and then I'll just mention here, we also have learned that we have a lot of capability to decide how and where we want water to move across the system. Um, in the future without, if we do nothing again and no action, sea level starts coming in and just starts taking over different parts of the system. When we do our alternatives, this is just an example of two of the alternatives, we can reverse some of those flow arrows. You know, we can get the water flowing toward the shoreline again, right? And that's a, a positive thing for our project. But again, depending on the, the infrastructure that we're putting in, you'll notice these two alternatives have two totally different infrastructure um, setups. Uh, we, we really have a lot of choice in our project about where we're trying to combat sea level and where we may be effective at combating sea level. And we're kind of incorporating all that information into our ongoing formulation steps, as Jennifer mentioned. And just to wrap up on um, kind of the nearshore salinity, because I don't think we've shown you anything. So the, all those fluxes and all the that green line flow that we were just talking about, that green transect flow, it shows up in the nearshore environment. And what you see here, these are just um, you know some of the locations where we look at salinity. And what you'll see is there's a trace here that goes, I don't know how clearly this can be read, but um, there's a trace here that goes very high. That's the future without intermediate that is experiencing the sea level effects of both higher sea level and reduced groundwater flux. And so we wind up with very high saline conditions. We're not in the desired oligomesohaline uh, regime. And you can see that with the BBC alternatives, sorry, we um, were able to push those salinity regimes back down during the majority, during the entire duration, not necessarily to move into the ideal range in all cases, but we're able to push that flux, you know, that salinity back down by increasing the flux and spreading it across the landscape in the way that I showed you. Um, and that's pretty, that's true across most of the systems. So this is an example of some of that Biscayne Bay simulation model output where you can kind of see the, the spatial uh, change in the scoring category here. And just to give you an idea, this is one of the metrics, the integrated uh, biological indicator. And it just shows you that on a kind of a unit scale of zero to one, the, the future without has a lot more variability and a lot lower scores compared to really any of the alternatives. So we're definitely moving in the right direction.
And with that transition slide, I'll pass it over to Francois. It's um, always amazing to listen to Walter. <laughs> I mean, I've been part of BBC now for a couple of years and I'm still learning from, from him. So to, there is a, two performance measures that have a lot to do with the sea level rise. You heard his last slide showed how the Biscayne Bay salinity performance um, is affecting the, the biology of, of Biscayne Bay. What we have here is an adaptive foundation resilience performance measure, which is looking at the fact that the, the, the um, diagram on the, the left is the stage you've now seen a number of times where you're putting sea level rise. The light blue is 0.7 feet of sea level rise, and it just inundates the, almost the entire natural system of the BBC. Here. And, and the images in the, in the middle um, is indicating the scrub mangrove type of habitat that exists in those indicator regions that are scrub mangroves. There are a lot of open space, and there is no way that that scrub mangrove is going to be able to keep up with sea level rise. So is it possible to create a mangrove transition? Is it, po is it possible to look at the factors that would enhance the ability for accretion? So Carlos and I and a number of other people published a paper in 2021 now, which looked at the data that we've been collecting in the sediment uh, erosion tables for the last 20 years in areas where there's high energy and connectivity versus low energy, high inundation. And the, the graph on, on the left is showing that in Taylor Slough, in Everglades National Park, we get in the scrub mangroves about four millimeters, four and a half millimeters of, of growth of, of, of sediment, of ele real elevation change. And, the, and where you don't have flow, you, you end up only with the bottom figure showing two millimeters. And so the table on the right says, um, that you can transition um, as, as water levels increase due to sea level rise. If you happen to be a, a agricultural plot on the land use, it only takes one foot of sea level rise to turn you into an estuarine water body. The more significant, um, let's see, how do I get the uh, mouse? What did you do? <laughs> oh, this is your yeah. Oh my goodness, it shut down. It just you just logged me out. It's okay. How did I do that? I don't know. Okay. All right. I will I'll stand over here. Stand here is like okay. <laughs> So what I wanted to point out was if you know we could take a, a, a freshwater cypress marsh and and see that with one one foot of a sea level rise could transition to a mangrove swamp, but if we added an extra two and a half feet, it would transition to an estuarine water type of environment. And if if you do no accretion whatsoever, and these are uh, on the left, there's I mean, on the bottom is two different, three different sea level rise components, 0.27 meters, 0.76 meters, and a whopping 1.13 meters in 50 years. That if you have no accretion um, at all, then you're going to have for the footprint of the South Florida Water Management District, 11,000 square miles of of wetland that transitions to open water. So you're losing open water. Um, but if you add four millimeters per year for 50 years, then it's significant, there's a significant decline of the transition to open water and a significant increase to 4,000 square kilometers of, of transitioning to um, wetlands and mangroves um, 
at an intermediate sea level rise. There's what's really interesting, the maximum accretion rate of mangroves is about eight millimeters per year. And that's the, the, the diagram on the right indicating that with that kind of accretion, which has been documented in Tampa Bay, for example, that even with 1.13 meters of sea level rise over a 50 year period, there's hardly any of it that goes to open water. So can we use the BBC or operational changes and, and elements of structural changes and in, in the face of sea level with adaptive foundational resilience, which means going out there and 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 allowing the fresh marsh to disappear and become mangroves. And so if you don't do that, you're, you, you have this, these zones of upland fresh marsh, a transition zone, a scrub mangrove here in yellow. If you don't do any of that, the most of the system will become open water. And, and you saw that in the last few slides. But if you facilitate the transition to a scrub mangrove to a tall mangrove type of system, the yellow expands and you're maintaining, you're not maintaining, you're actually increasing the functional capability of this wetland to produce the biodiversity and productivity of the coastal zone. So the adaptive foundation resilience performance measure is made up of three components. It's made up of flow, a depth duration curve and a poor water salinity curve. Poor water salinity comes from the bisect model. The depth duration and flow comes from RSMGL. And if here's an example of for, um, for the mangrove, looking at the um, peat accretion as a function of salinity, peat accretion as a function of, of sheet flow or um, flow, and then a depth duration curve here showing that when, if it's too deep for too many days, you're not gonna get any accretion. If it's too dry for too many days, it's gonna oxidize. So it's, very, it's a very simple um, type of um, performance measure, but it's unique in that it's the first time anywhere in the nation we've tried to do restoration in the face of sea level rise for a wetland. You've seen where these zones are. Um, Jennifer uh, has shown you those zones. I want to point out the significance of looking at just the salinity in these zones. And if you look, for example, at zone A, what you find is that the salinity um, with all the different alternatives in 21, 22, 23, 24, that they're all compared to the future without in that area, it stays fresh. But what happens with all the alternatives, the future without, which is showing these um, red arrows, the red arrows are showing you for those indicator regions, the, the salinity of the future without, all the alternatives reduce the salinity with BBC. -er. Now, the advantage of looking at the accretion, which is as um, water depth or depth duration, flow, and, and salinity, is the ability to break it down, to understand for each one of these indicator regions within zone A, which ones are doing best in relationship to the three elements. So all, <laughs> all four indicator regions for water depths in zone A are doing terribly for accretion. And the worst is indicator region 508, which is in this Southern region, which I think Walter showed you didn't change sea level rise. No matter what we did, it was too deep. And sure enough, if it's too deep, you're not gonna get uh, any accretion due to water depth, but we are flowing and we do have the appropriate salinity. So when you combine these three, there will be the potential by 2085 to have some accretion. So we use it, we'll, we'll be able to use it as a index 
a performance measure habitat unit calculation that just how well will this do these different indicators perform? And this is another example of, of, of uh, a zone with three indicator regions showing that um, for zone B and looking at the, the salinity because of sea level rise, poor, the salinity is right on the money, but you're not seeing a, a good depth relationship, um, but we're seeing great flow in, in two regions, 522, 520, 521, we need to do something in the, in the next phase of modeling to increase the flow, to increase the accretion. But I do wanna point out, there's a gray bar here. It allows us to look at alternatives and figure out, well, out of all the alternatives, alternative which is gray is alternative 22. So what is it about alternative 22 that does give you the flow, that does allow for higher accretion? And that's what, that's how we move into the phase three of the modeling. Now, like Gina said, we, we have to make everything um, e even keel. That's not her words, but um, we have to standardize zero to one. So taking the, the, the uh, foundational resilience this is how we broke it into bins for each one for salinity bins. Um, what you see is for the mangroves between 10 and 30, you get a score of one, but you do it also for flow and you do it for depth duration. Now that's standardized, now what happens now that you've standardized everything to a habitat suitability index rather than accumulation, if you look at zone A as a whole, what you can see right off the bat, blue histograms are future without. So if we run a line across future without, what we see is that for the most part in zone A, the big component of the adaptive foundational resilience are these orange bars, which is the salinity. The looter, so, um, and we can also now compare what's happening in zone A in terms of its absolute score. And you can see that the best alternative now is 21. The second best alternative is 22. The most important attribute is salinity and the second is flow. And that ends up being very different for the triangle area in zone B. Its score is pretty much the same as zone A. It's, it gets as high as 0.75. Its best alternative is 22. But the most important attribute here happens to be salinity. So we now have the, the ability to use AFR to break down the different ways to distribute water in that coastal system. Now, this kind of summarizes uh, everything that we found out in round two. I'm gonna skip it because we are running out of time because I wanna get to this next part. And that is using the AFR to create a topographic offset and initialize the RSM for running it to 2085. The most significant thing, if we look at, at, at Ross and Meter's work, what they found is that there has been over the last 50 years, a movement of, there already has been a transition of mangroves into the fresh marsh. And that in areas where we're not distributing fresh water, it's significantly less of a transition. So east of Highway 1, which um, here's Highway 1, the transition has been 3.3 kilometers. And west of Highway 1, the transition has been 2.19 kilometers. And we can use this type of trend in relationship to the type of habitats that exist. And this is the, the habitat for the whole system. So even though we run BBCR just for this corner here, hydrologically, you, you, you need to, if you're gonna do a, a topographic offset, you need to do it for the, the entire region so that things can flow in a, with the proper physics. And so based on this relationship, uh, on this vegetation type, and then 
looking at four different types of accretion offsets, starting with the highest biomass we could find in the system. Um, and that is over on the west side of Everglades National Park, where you have very large mangroves. That the, um, these, the same patterns of, of accretion rates are used there. The difference here is that the maximum amount of accretion due to flow is, is 10 millimeters, but due to salinity and due to water depth, it's eight. You, you take the average of that and you multiply it by 50 years and you end up with 433 millimeters of potential um, elevation change or 1.42 feet in that region. You do the same thing for the scrub mangrove type of environment where um, we do have flow like in Taylor Slough and you have a potential of six millimeters and four millimeters due to different drivers with an average of 5.3 millimeters per year with a potential increase over a 50 year period of 0.87 feet. You do the same thing for the fresh marsh. So in the BBC of footprint, we also have uh, the image here on the right is showing dense model lands, fresh marsh, and that has the potential to accrete 200 millimeters over 50 years. And then a very sparse type of system, the best it could do would be only two millimeters per year for a 0.33 feet. And so what you take these four levels and you spread it out over the, the map. Um, and in the BBC or footprint, boy, flows better on my computer. Um, you see mostly 0.87 feet of offset for the mangroves 0.66 feet for the fresh marsh, and then further up, like in sparrow habitat, the best it's going to do is 0.33 feet. That is how the RSM is initialized at time zero once we put sea level rise in the system. And we can talk about why that's bad and why that's good when we have the Q&A section. All right, Jennifer. So as um, Fred and Walter mentioned, we learned an awful lot about what the system was doing from our round two evaluations. And from that, um, we were able to make some comparisons and evaluations, and then ultimately some decisions to move us into our round three alternatives, which is what I'm gonna talk about next. So in general, we learned that the round two alternatives did make a lot of improvements to the natural areas and to our near shore, but there still are some additional benefits that can be realized from the project. In a lot of places, maybe on a scale of zero to one, we could get to 0 0.4, 0 0.5, up to 0 0.6, but we really would like to get all of our um, benefits up to that, that full one, which represents 100% towards our target of restoration. Um, so we know that our project does need more fresh water and that additional volumes would be better able to combat rising sea levels. Um, we know that evaluating and comparing the performance of alternatives broken out into the, the different zones instead of by alternatives, the team was able to see what types of features were giving the best results of moving water where it is needed and when it is needed. Um, and then in step six, which is our decision-making and our selection, we were able to see features that were not working. And so we screened them out from further consideration. Um, in steps one and two, we kind of restarted our iterative plan formulation process again. And we looked at where the round two alternatives fall short for project benefits and our objectives. And we kind of predicted what sorts of changes we could make in our infrastructure for our different project alternatives that would give better results as we move forward. 
And so now we are back again in step three. This is our plan formulation step. We have round three alternatives that were actually just turned in to start being modeled. We don't have results yet, um, but we're anticipating them soon so that we can keep going in our planning process. So in round two, we had four alternatives and then we evaluated four sensitivity runs. We had screening decisions of measures that were not working, and so we are not carrying them forward. We did have measures that we wanted to keep in our alternatives, but some a lot of those needed refinement. Um, we had recombination of measures from our different round two alternatives to put the best options together into one. And then we also wanted to make sure that we had our operational optimization. So from round two, we're moving into round three where we have two alternatives, um, but we are also looking at two sensitivity runs on top of those where we're utilizing wastewater reuse as an additional source of water. And we also do have our yellow book component that will be evaluated. Um, the yellow book component are those six components that Nicole described at the beginning of our presentation. Um, and those have already been modeled in an earlier round. So we um, don't need to model them again, but they will be included in our final array when we compare. So this round, our round three, is our final round of mo modeling. Um, from these modeling efforts and these alternatives, we will be selecting our recommended plan for implementation. And we wanted to be sure that all of the round three alternatives and the sensitivity runs associated with them had components that our whole project and public team want to have when we do select a recommended plan. Um, so we do want to have water sourcing from the Northwest. Um, we, when we compared our alternative 24 that didn't have any of those sources of water, the wet season benefits were okay, but the dry season benefits were very limited. And the dry season benefits are very important for what we would consider our project success. Um, we wanted to look at the maximum amount of rehydration in the natural areas, which would then go to help the near shore. In some previous rounds of modelings, we looked at some varying intensities and amounts of rehydration in our natural areas, but we do want to um, have the, the, the best amount and the most amount that we can um, to put forward for the largest acreage of benefits as possible. Um, we do know that we want to be a little bit more nimble and uh, adaptable with some uh, infrastructure so that we can be resilient to sea level rise. And we want to make sure that we're bal balancing our objectives for rehydration while also protecting some critical habitat, um, for example, for the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow that has a subpopulation within our footprint. Um, wastewater reuse is being added to both of our round three alternatives. It is being added as a sensitivity run and will be continued to be evaluated. Um, this is a more higher cost and a higher risk feature, which is why we're adding it in as an, a sensitivity run and not a full part of our alternative. So I'm just going to try to walk through our different geographic areas and kind of just describe verbally how we're doing um, some differences between these two alternatives and how they are included to, to address sea level change and some climate change while also going towards our project objectives. So the first is the Northwest. Um, in alternative 31, which is one of our round three alternatives, we recombined and revised some features to try to hold some more water in the Northwest so that we could get dry season carryover. And then compared to our other alternative, Alt 32, we are looking at being able to tap into those Northwest water sources, but without the, the holding of that water. So both of these are still aiming to get more water out of the Northwest and bring them south across the coastal ridge and east to be redistributed into the coastal wetlands. And this additional water will work to combat the rising salinities in the natural areas due to sea level rise. Um, next is wastewater reuse. We are adding this as a sensitivity run again to both of our alternatives. Um, this is a direct source of year-round fresh water that would be made available to the project. And it does have the same purposes as additional water from the Northwest, 
we know we need more water to be able to put the salinity into a more estuarine system instead of a more marine system in our Biscayne Bay nearshore areas. Um, next, just touching on our conveyance and our operations. In previous rounds, we had looked at, again, kind of different levels of conveyance routes through the regional and uh, the regional canal system, um, a couple of additional canal conveyance pathways. Um, not all of the alternatives had looked at every pathway, but again, we are working in an, a little bit of an uncertain situation. Um, and we also don't quite have the information for buried precipitation yet. So the team really wanted to make sure that we were utilizing every single possible pathway that we could to maintain the maximum amount of flexibility within the project. Um, our redistribution and rehydration features, we really wanted to maximize in this last round of alternatives. We weren't looking to have only certain features that were working in one alternative versus another. Um, getting that water, as Walter described, onto the landscape and maximizing the green line transect and passive flow is really what can help put water into um, those lower salinity areas in the near shore. And so we put the, the most amount of uh, redistribution and rehydration features into both of our alternatives. Um, this particular round, we are looking a little bit more at some adaptable features. Um, in the Southern Glades, we're proposing to do some backfill of uh, a canal that discharges at the very, very Southern end. Um, we're looking at doing more of an incremental backfill as sea level rises to prevent some of that saltwater intrusion. Um, moving forward to a recommended plan, eventually we do understand that we have um, some culverts and some conveyance features from uh, Western wetlands into Eastern wetlands and gravity might not particularly be our friend in 40, 50 years. So we're looking at some small pump stations to be able to keep that gradient moving from west to east. And then finally, and um, Carlos is going to come and talk a little bit more about this, but we are looking at putting thin layer placement onto the landscape. And this puts small amount of materials into some subsided areas to keep veg the vegetation from drowning. Um, and so Carlos is going to come up and talk about the EMMA project, which is Everglades Mangrove Migration Assessment. Yes. To not log off, just don't touch on my <laughs> OK, I'll get that then. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Carlos Coronado, and I've been working at the district for many years. Um, one of the reasons behind this idea of thin layer placement is based on what Fred was explaining earlier today, using SETs in the field. SETs, as you know, uh, helps to, for us to understand how fast there is a change in elevation in the system. And something that we have learned by doing that kind of studies in the field is that elevation capital is very important. So the, um, we have in the, in the area of BBC, we have more than 20 different independent sites where we've been measuring elevation change for more, for more than 20 years. And based on those studies, what we have seen is that areas where mangroves are below uh, the mean means water levels, those sites do not accrete very well. In contrast, sites where we know where they are a little bit elevated relative to the mean water levels, those sites accrete much better and increase the elevation in a very good way over the last 24 years that we've been measuring elevation change. So using that information, we decided to test this concept of thin layer placement the layer placement, placement is a technique that has been used in many different mangroves uh, marshes in the United States, except in mangroves. If we go to this EMMA project, it will be one of the first projects applying layer placement in mangrove ecosystems in the United States. 
And so the basic question of thin layer replacement is thin layer replacement is a viable method to maintain ecosystem function of mangrove ecosystems. That's the basic question of Emma. So we want to try to understand whether or not we can use this technique in mangrove ecosystems. In order to do that, last year, with the help of Gina Ralph for the Corp, we went through a series of different workshops at meetings with different uh, people with different expertise, including engineers, who explained it to us how thin layer, the, the, the dredge material in this case, can be used as a, as a sediment, new sediment into the system. So those, all those workshops that we had, we learned how difficult it is to move dredge material from in the ocean on, on in the base and move that material and place that sediment into the coastal marshes. Um, so that was something that we uh, learned from this series of workshops. And these workshops produce a very good uh, report that I think is available for everybody. And in that report, we explained very well everything that we discussed and all, all, the, all the results that we ob obtained by doing all these workshops. That report really includes everything in a much, much detailed way than this presentation. So one of the aspects that we learned, the map on the right showing Florida, every single uh, yellow dot there shows the different places where we were considering bringing dredge material and move that material into any study site in the BBC uh, footprint. And the, all the pictures on the, uh, on, on the left shows a different methodology, not using dredge material, but using material that is next to the sites where we want to apply this, the thin layer replacement. So we were, we were looking at different ways to place that sediment from either dredge material or from or material next to the, to, the, to the study site. Um, based on those workshops, we went into the field looking for different places where we can carry out this project. And we decided that there, are, there were two really good sites where we can really apply the thin labor replacement. And the picture on the right shows the Charlie site that is at the very end of the C-111 the L, the C canal. And it shows this, the particular site where we were considering applying the thin layer replacement. The picture all the way to the left is the C-111 canal that we call the pocket site. That's the other second site where we were considering or where we are considering applying the thin layer replacement. The main difference between those two sites is Charlie site is divided into public lands and private lands. And we still don't have the whole ownership of the site so that we can apply the thin layer replacement. In contrast, the pocket site is owned by the district and we know we can, we can give us permission to do anything we want in the, in the pocket side. So we have less problems instead of applying the thin layer replacement in the pocket side. So those are the two different sites where we are considering doing the thin layer replacement. And the material for those two particular sites is coming from the material next to the, uh, to the two sites. So it will be very easy just to remove that material pulverize the material and apply the material next to the, next to the site, making the project less expensive also. So this is a, a closer look at Charlie site and Charlie site, something that we realized that for Charlie site, there is a really big difference in the macro topography. And based on that, we, as after all this workshop that we had, we decided that based on the macro topography that we observed in Charlie's site, we will apply the thin layer replacement at three, at three different uh, uh, um, 
three different layers. One 0.5, feet, the other one 0.25 feet of sediment. And the deeper side, we will put 1.5 feet of sediment, which is a lot of sediment. But based on the, on the material that is next to Charlie's side, we considered that the material is enough to, to apply it into, into these three different uh, sediment groups. In contrast, in the pocket side, which is lower in elevation, the material will come also from the material next to the pocket side, and we will apply only one foot of sediment. And in this particular site, we have a control site where we will not apply any sediment, and we will see the difference between the sediment and the control site in the response of the, of the, of the mangrove community. So where are we today with Emma? Emma has completed, we have a really good uh, understanding how we can uh, pursue this project. And we have submitted the project to different agencies for funding. And also today, we still don't have money to carry out this particular aspect of uh, 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 Emma. But we are still applying and we are hoping that we will get some money sometime this near next year or sometime in the future. So the other aspect, very important aspect of the thin layer placement is can we apply thin layer placement within the BBC footprint? If the answer is yes, the question is where we can do something like this within the uh, BBC footprint. As we can see, there are three different zones, A, B, and C. And we are looking into those three different zones where we can apply the thin layer placement. So zone A has four different indicator regions going from the freshwater area 509 all the way to the coastal area 508. And what you can see in the figure in the middle, all the indicator regions have circulated by a red color. That means based on the three different parameters that Fred presented for the resilience PM, those three indicator regions do not have the conditions, proper conditions in terms of water depth to apply the thin layer placement. Particularly the indicator region 508, as we can see uh, after Walter's presentation, Fred's presentation, this is a site that is inundated even today for very, very, very high water depths. So it will be very, very uh, not really good idea to apply any kind of sediment and indicator region where we see today the conditions are not conducive for any successful thin labor replacement. So that's why those three indicator regions in zone A are unread because conditions are not conducive for any successful thin labor replacement. Going into zone B, zone B has three different indicator regions. And the one in red is the freshwater uh, zone indicator region in zone B, zone B. And doesn't have so that indicator region doesn't have the conditions either for a successful thin labor placement. Indicator region 520, which is close to the bay, using water depth, flow, and salinity that indicator region has the conditions to a very successful thin layer placement within, the, within this particular zone. And moving into zone C, zone Z, there are two indicator regions which are in green in the figure in the, in the middle, 516 and 514, that have the conditions in terms of water depth, flow, and salinity where we consider a thin labor placement project within those two indicator regions could be successful. And those are pictures from that we took uh, when we were looking for sites where to carry out this uh, project and uh, really beautiful from the air. And um, if you have any questions, please ask Gina or Fred. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carlos.
I think we had a Q&A scheduled for this, this uh, time, but we're going to skip that. We'll hear from Eric and Bonnie, and then um, we'll take up with the Q&A with everyone from this session. So um, next is Eric Stabino, the National Park Service, and he's presenting with Bonnie Irving. Um, and this is DOI perspectives on an adaptive process for BB SEER for the Cape Stable Seaside Sparrow, considering climate change issues. But while we're getting started, uh, so I'm Eric Stabenow with the National Park Service. Been doing this work for uh, with federal government for almost 20 years now. And I'm here today with one half of the DOI perspective on this. So um, when we do get the slides up and running, we're gonna see some things here that are repeats of some of the earlier slides with some new context brought into play about the way DOI is thinking about this. And my partner here is. And I'm Bonnie Irving. I'm with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Everglades Program Supervisor in Ecological Services. Born to keep my hands just on the keyboard part for paging. Um, so try that. Let's see. Or not. And here we go. All right, so I'll run through just a real quick overview on this and then hand it off to Bonnie to get things started. So um, what we've really got here is kind of five main points throwing down on the page uh, that, that bring together a lot of the concepts we've been hearing for the last hour and a half or so. And that is that we're trying to bring more water into the coast with these projects. And we have this generalized idea inside Everglades Restoration about fighting water with water when we think about sea level rise. So we'll put more fresh water in on one end and holding the salt water back from the other end, but recognizing that that's gonna elevate the waters on both sides of it. And that gives us a, a bit of a pinch when it comes to some of the DOI issues and regulations and land management concerns that we have. There are, there are portions of the system that are going to be very challenging for us to manage. And this BBC project has given us an opportunity, kind of looking across these set, to think about particularly this one tiny bird's wonderful little habitat we're trying to protect and live up to all of our, our regulations and requirements associated with that, while we're also trying to meet these other kind of project objectives. And we're we're having to having to think our way through how do we do that, how do we meet our mandates and get through this process. So um Last point on there is recognizing and responding to anticipated future conditions. And just as a pitch to what we're talking about here is I'm gonna express some things about the uncertainty that's coming. Um, we're not, not gonna do this in a numeric sense. I'm gonna do this in a generalized sense, talking about what we understand from the modeling and what we expect on sea level rise and these other issues. And we're gonna talk that that uncertainty in some of the physical parameters we deal with results in fairly large uncertainty in terms of the temporal steps that we're working on. So we get that kind of cross walk of those two issues. And so I'll, that's where we're gonna be heading with this to give you the heads up, so. Thank you. And so one of those key um, components is that there is a critical habitat area uh, within the project footprint and it's known as Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow Population D. Um, so one of our staff uh, did a, a quick graphic just to indicate the hydro period um, kind of on a sliding four year average. And that's um, taken from 1995 to 2023, it looks like on here. Um, and, and from basically from this slide, what we can see is in this critical population area or critical habitat area, um, the hydro period is actually a little bit high. It's, it's running a little bit wetter um, than what would be optimal for the needs of the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow. Got the right button. All right. So the key takeaway on this graphic, this is just to show that um, JSAW does vegetation surveys in these critical habitat areas. And in 2011, we had a lot more kind of dispersed vegetation types. Um, I would say look to the orange and the red and the pinks, um, but that's not really the case. Um, Kevin, one of the staff and I were looking at this and cladium is actually also part of that orange dark color. Um, and, and that's freshwater marsh, but it's actually a little bit too wet. So Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow, we'll see it in, in another slide. It, it kind of needs this Goldilocks zone and that's not really being indicated in that recent vegetative survey, which is on the right. Um, and that's showing that really the, the trend is moving wetter. The, um, the muley grass is kind of 
dispersed and um, really you just don't see it anymore in the recent vegetation surveys. And so uh, we have this lovely graphic. Uh, this is one of kind of a series of graphics that we have. It's just a cartoon to kind of depict kind of the ideal habitat range that we need for this particular species. Um, and it kind of indicates that Goldilocks zone that I mentioned of muley grass. So the hydro period that we're really trying to target is between 90 and 210 days. Um, again, if we look back at that earlier graphic, it showed that it was really at that upper limit and over that limit um, quite a bit of the time. And that is kind of borne out by that vegetation um, survey that indicates that it is transitioning wetter already. That I'm gonna transition back to Eric. All right, so, so here we have this idealized, uh, I'm gonna borrow your slide. Here we have this idealized habitat that we're trying to reach. We're recognizing that it's a bit too wet and we're trying to protect the habitat. And so we had, you know, National Park Service was talking about increasing water uh, level and flow through particular areas in the southern end of the project. And the Fish and Wildlife Service is speaking up and saying, hey, but protect muley grass, protect this 10 centimeter little free space that they need for the habitat and nesting to go successfully. And the Army Corps of Engineers wisely wrote a letter to us that said, can you two please get together? and tell us, what do we want to do? What do we really want to do? And we, we spent some time on that because we, we, it was a communication issue. We felt that we were doing a pretty good job on communicating internally, but we weren't necessarily getting it across into the PDT and it translating to how we wanted to look at the project features over time. So we really, we really spent some time thinking about how do you protect the habitat and protect the bird and yet allow for this uh, future resilient condition with sea level rise. And so this is really what we're going to be talking about a little bit here. This graphic was up a little bit earlier, um, a little bit earlier for us. I'll turn this mic a little bit for us. And I'm going to kind of borrow it in a, a little bit off table use for it. So there's a line drawn on this page at zero. This is not to be equated with ground surface elevation in the habitat of the Cape Sable Seaside Cerro Subpop D, but it should be thought of as a ground surface elevation and the fact that as sea level rise occurs over time, there will be a moment when we cross that water level crosses, not just that ground surface elevation, but that critical period that's that 10 centimeter depth. And then it starts to cause us these very long hydro periods on that. Um, using the intermediate curve, we're looking at the current conditions and then modeling again at the 2085 conditions. So we don't actually have a midpoint modeling assessment that's hitting us. We weren't thinking of that project in this way. We're doing really new modeling here, but we're not doing that. So in some point we're going to cross that. Um, we have to evaluate based on that intermediate curve at 2085. We have to have some flexibility in the project to recognize that we could be wrong and it could be running at higher or lower rates than that. And if we go up to some of those extremes, we have to start thinking about what does the project look like in those extreme situations, such as the highest curve at 2085. And coming back through time on that, what does that mean for us in terms of this, this habitat we're trying to protect? So this plot, um, again, without this Cape Civil Seaside Sparrow habitat was shown in an earlier part of the presentation today as well. So now we're looking at where sea level rise is influencing the landscape. We're looking at where the accretion rates are anticipated spatially across the landscape. It's a little more uniform than we'd actually expect on any given specific plot, right? We would looked at some of those uh, images and spoke about the sparse landscapes that are in the coastal system. So at the best, these are the highest accretion rates for each of the areas we're dealing with in kind of an optimized condition. And so even there, when we look at it, you can see the round outlines, the little red outlines are the Cape Sable Seaside Sierra subpopulations. And the one down in the bottom right that looks a bit like a starfish is subpop D. And you can see that it's setting across multiple accretion rate zones and impacts from sea level rise and impacts into projects. So it's a, it's a really critical piece to look at. The second part that stands out to me when we look at this is that the soil type is critical. To get muley grass, to get the right habitat, we'd have to have the right conditions to get there. And we don't necessarily know that that's going to happen with the project. So we have somewhat optimistic look at the total accretion rates on the page. We have a little bit of a, call it an optimistic or a questioning uh, view, looking at the type of habitats we might create over time and recognizing what that might mean for the sparrow in that area. And so we on the department side and fish and wildlife side, we had to think about National Park Service 
what we were going to do for that bird in the future. How can we do our best for that? And um, we started thinking of it in this way. I've inverted the graph for us. Right now we're looking at curves that go down to the right and that is the freeboard, the depth above the high water level that we're looking at. So you can see that we lose freeboard over time. And depending on which one of the sea level uh, rise curves we're looking at, it makes a big difference when sea level rise comes into a critical height for us, a critical elevation for us. Um, the second thing that stands out on here, so first let's identify that the green line on the top right is the intermediate sea level rise curve. There are heavy lines and there are thin lines. Associated with the green curve is a thinner line that is that curve with accretion. So with accretion, we get to the case that in the habitats that we're interested in, we could potentially have surface elevation that's very close to, you know, getting us to 2085 without going underwater substantially. Um, on the alternative, you know, most optimistic view, on the most pessimistic view, now things happen a lot faster. So our approach to this has been, in this project, something really unique. Most of our projects, if we have really different conditions and different phases, we would be thinking of the project as one project for now, and then we would put the other projects, whole planning, modeling, every other effort off to another time or another effort to look at. In this project, we're looking at both pieces of it and thinking about a phased implementation. So going to the little blue bars you know, at the top of the page, you'll see that there's a time period when we want to maintain the current subpop. Uh, habitat. And in fact, we have to. That's our mandate by law. So we're going to protect that habitat as long as we can. At some point, that habitat gets impacted by sea level rise. And our capacity to maintain that habitat is no longer in our hands. Then we have to go to a different phase. We have to think about what the connectivity and accretion could be at the other end of that. And somewhere in between the two, we have some sort of a transition state that we have to get across. Where that transition state is going to be a critical piece that requires us to be watching the data, making an adaptive type of choice along the way with the project. So I think um, this plot really, really draws it out. The data on the plot is queued together to the particular RSM element that's the triangle, which lines up right inside the northern pieces of the, the habitat population that we're looking at. Um, so what we decided to do to address this is to come up with a two phase. There's an adaptive implementation phase where initially we would look at the southern end of the C-111 canal. So that canal is in the red line going down to the coast. We tend to think of it for the water management district for flood management as the major drain, the big plug that you can pull to get water out of the system. Um, and we would like to maintain as long as we can, as much of that flexibility as we can. But over time, there's a partial backfilling that comes into play and eventually a complete backfilling of that. When we get to that stage, we need to really be making adjustments on where the water goes. So back to the, you know, the features of RSM, we can look at the whole water management system and all of the features, and we can see what the outcomes are likely to be as we adjust between different spreaders and different solutions. There is one interesting piece on here. It looks like a, a distribution line in blue on there. I think we've moved away from thinking of pipes right now, but it's, I left it in place. It was in the presentation at the time it was given to, to us, and it is a way to think about how we have to adapt our approaches, how we have to change over time when, and be flexible again with the process. So in the end, uh, I would anticipate that we'll see a lot of changes with how we do that. We are doing something really unique here and that we have this kind of staged implementation that's trying to protect the sparrow down to this end. Um, so again, just kind of sharing one of these last plots on it. We're going to maintain the current habitat, be good stewards of the adjacent lands, hold it as long as we possibly can, give the sparrow that opportunity to to move or to be moved or whatever that answer is going to be over time. And we're going to manage the areas um, in, um, in the future, the water management in the future. So I think that's uh, us for today, correct, Bonnie? Yeah. yeah, we're done. Thank you. Thanks, Eric and Bonnie. Okay, now I think we'll move to a Q&A with, with a panel discussion. So yeah. if we could have all speakers from this session up in front. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it might be a little tight. Okay. Okay, thanks to all the panelists. That was a really great uh, set of presentations. Uh, so I think we'll start with uh, Matt. Thanks for all of that time. Um, so I have just sort of two high-level planning kinds of questions, and, and maybe this is for Jennifer. 
Um, I've heard the phrase hold water for dry season carryover. Is this storage, the way we talk about storage in other parts of the system? Is that the same thing? I think in the... Yeah. You're on, you're on, that was working. So at the beginning, I think, yes, that our intent was to create some sort of long, longer term storage. Um, and it's also what was thought about in one of our yellow book components, the North Lake Belt storage was looking at lining rock mines. Um, and we've come to realize that one that's not actually engineeringly feasible um, and the, the geology of, of the Northwest region is really making it very, very difficult for us to provide that long-term storage. Um, so we're looking at different options to, if it's not going to be wholly long-term, if we can at least slow it down enough to, to move some of that water um, at a later time frame, we still consider that to be a benefit, which is why we're trying to look at some of those rock mine is more flow through and the wetland flow through to, to kind of slow it down a little bit more. Okay, so within a, within an annual cycle is what you're talking. Okay, my second question um, was, uh, Gina mentioned that water quality evaluation was to come down the road and from a different team. I haven't heard anything about uh, any needs for water quality treatment. Is there any needs for water quality treatment for this water going into the natural system? I could probably take that one. Um, so there are a couple things. Water quality is not an objective of the study, but it is evaluated as a constraint along with water supply and flood protection. So for water quality, we cannot degrade the existing water quality. And the sub team did perform an evaluation on round two. Um, moving forward, there is a need for the wastewater reuse. Obviously that would have water quality treatment component to it. Um, and then we do need to meet um, water quality criteria or at, need, at least not degrade it from existing water quality. So the team did evaluate it relative to numeric nutrient criteria in the coastal waters and the existing water quality. So if I could add just a, a little touch on that one. And I think that in water quality, and you know, we talk about it being a use as constraint. Um, we appreciate in general and make the argument for continuing to do evaluation. So sensitivity style runs on things where water quality is indeed a constraint, something we'd have to consider over time, be that uh, groundwater use recharge, um, be that the wastewater reuse program that is listed in here in this round of modeling right now. So we, we have that ongoing interest in it and we've recognized there's a really hard cost there and there's a really big lift that we're already seeing out of the projects in a few different places. So, you know, not to be a mark against the project, but I'm always looking for a little opportunity to do a little better. So those sensitivity runs that keep us looking at that are really great too. Yeah, and there will be ancillary benefits to like the water preserve areas and rehydration features, even though the objective may not be water quality improvement they will offer nutrient uptake. Okay. okay, thanks. Margaret, then Casey, Ellen, and then John. Thanks for the presentation. My question is for Jennifer. So Jennifer, on your two slides, you had um, stakeholder involvement at the center. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? What is the process for involving stakeholders and how effective it is, is it in defining alternatives? Yeah, no, our stakeholder involvement is is critical to the success of this project. So we do have about monthly PDT meetings. I'm sure Nicole can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we also have eight or nine different sub teams that can work a little bit more specifically at things. So we do have a plan formulation sub team, ecological modeling, engineering, water quality, all that sort of things. Um, and those are um, weekly or biweekly, depending on what kind of process we're in at the time and what uh, process of, of the plan formulation cycle we're in. Um, but we have utilized many different ideas and features uh, from our alternatives that have come directly from our stakeholders. And so it's kind of become like a, a, a mishmash of, of different people's ideas that get refined by other entities and, and work together to create a full alternative. It's very much a, a group effort. Also, NEPA. 
that Gina said. So as part of the National Environmental Policy Act um, stakeholder engagement, we do have uh, scoping meetings. We do have a comment box in which we'll take um, anybody's comments and then at the the eco sub team or at all of the sub team meetings, as well as the project delivery team meetings, there is um, not just the engagement by the project delivery team, but there's also an opportunity for public comment. And then we have done several workshops uh, between the alternatives, which uh, also allow for um, group interaction as part of that um, gathering of the data, reviewing the data, taking the information from the, the modeling and then turning it into the next round. Um, so we have had those types of engagements that are both agency as well as members of the public can attend. Casey. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Um, I have a couple of questions, just stop me. Okay. <laughs> um, Thanks for this presentation. It's really clear, tons of information. Really appreciate that. Um, we were just talking about the savings clause constraints. And I was curious, um, flooding seems like it might be an important one with the changes, especially in the uh, flows to the uh, um, coastal structures changing. And so I'm just curious, how is the change in flood risk um, evaluated? And, and how, does, how do those constraints factor into decision-making between the alternatives? relative to the performance metrics. <laughs> I think that's me. So, um, yes, yeah, so for flood for the savings clause, we have to honor both flood protection and water supply criteria. Um, it's actually a different phase of the project. So we're in the formulation phase right now. What we're trying to answer is what do we want to build eventually and what does it look like in 2085? Once we have a selected plan, we move into a different phase of the project, which is known as the project assurances phase. And that's where the savings clause analysis is performed. The mindset there is we will move to 2035 and Eric's slide actually kind of showed one of those check-in points at 2035. The idea is that as we build the project, we will continue to look at the savings clause and the flood risk assessment will occur at the action when we're actually turning on the features in the field, you know, and when things are built, because there's a lot of moving pieces, as you can imagine, between now and 2085. BBC is not the only project trying to address resiliency. We don't know everything that's going to happen from a flood risk you know, infrastructure perspective of what the county is going to do, what the state of Florida is going to do, what the federal government is going to do. So we put in all the information that we have that's available in our 2085 condition, but when it actually comes to the check for savings clause, we look at a 2035 condition, which is much more certain. And we make sure that when we turn on the features, when we turn on the pump, that we're not creating those adverse impacts. And so we're looking at it as, is the infrastructure capable of providing flood protection, adding a bunch of pumps to a system that isn't going to work in gravity seems it's going to be a good idea <laughs> um, and then specifically how do you set up the operating plans how do you operate those infrastructure will be uh, analyzed 2035 so and then incrementally as things continue to get built and as other project features happen the, the process continues to update those operating manuals and those those uh those features over time so Great, thanks. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. And then as you envision doing that, I'm curious, um, maybe we'll have new precipitation scenarios that might be used by then. And I'm just curious, you don't have them now, but from a thought pers experiment perspective, you know, what happens if this, if it gets five to 10% wetter, let's say, do you think it's, um, what happens to the performance metrics? How robust is this plan? Just a thought experiment to like five to 10% water. Well, I think it's interesting because I think that the performance measures, now you're talking about the metrics themselves, I think they're built that they would capture the changes in the ecological system when that, when that, if that were to occur, when that would occur. So I don't think that we have to go back to what we're sampling or measuring or how we're tracking that both in the project funding and in the recovery process of you know tracking. I think that those are, are solid and in place. Um, I think that, Related to the last answer is that there's this periodic process of looking at the combined operating plan, not officially just that one that we're doing now, but in general, the combined operations of the water management system throughout. And I think that that process gives us space to capture if we're seeing climate related changes and increases in precipitation, or maybe we're getting that 
shortages because we're having some of the evapotranspiration type of beasts that's affecting us. And it could be spatially explicit, these things that happen to us. We are along the peninsula sticking down here in Florida. So we have to think about that as well. So I, I think that's in the operational plans that that is where that would be being addressed. Yeah, and, and I'll just add from a technical perspective um, on the on the modeling side in particular, um, there's two kind of elements to the climate scenarios, right? One is extreme events, and the other is really longer uh, term changes in you know drought precipitation, you know drought periods, and things like that, right? So when we're talking about the regional modeling tool suite, these daily you know long term simulation models, when I, when we talk about the climate scenarios that you heard about from Dr. Opscara last time, and that we're trying to get that group together, those are really focused on adding things beyond the current climate variability that we have in our 52 year climate record, right? So we have a lot of droughts. We have multi-year droughts. We have really wet periods. Those are already built into our analysis. That climate scenario is focused on getting to like the really, really, really severe drought that could happen in a, in a future climate change scenario. You know, So this particular project, to answer your question about robustness, as we said, the, the reality of the system that we're dealing with is that it's not a multi-year carryover system. It's a seasonal at best you know so i think we're in very good shape for bees here in terms of that robustness um and you know as we do the savings clause assessment as we do the miami data rsm we do have some tools to do the event based um you know as you heard from carolina moran and others last time that we have some tools to do those types of assessments um and they will be applied so those longer term climate scenarios i don't really feel like we're missing them for bbc here but they would be very critical for central everglades western everglades you know larger landscape uh, marsh type communities Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to Helen next. All right, so um, Casey asked one of my questions. Um, the other question I have is, so I'm an ecological model arm, and in the fields that I work in, the results of my models are never used. <laughs> it's a report written, um, and it's it, and it all sounds lovely, and then it's put on a shelf, and it's never used. So I'm very curious because I haven't actually ever seen it with my own eyes. How you go from the alternatives and all of the scientific information that you've presented here through all of the stakeholder groups, um, and you know, and and scientists and so forth. To, and I know this is a long-winded question and probably a long-winded answer, and I don't expect a long-winded answer, but two recommendations and um, that get put forward um, and how um, fundamental disagreements or disputes um, over that are handled. I don't know who <laughs> can answer that. I'm going to pump this to somebody else in the room, certainly at this panel real quickly, but I will say that at our team, we recognize that this area of connecting between ecology and ecological modeling and making decisions, that that process needs to come together a lot stronger. And we're in the process of putting staff on board to do that, to help us make address this exact issue. So I, I think you're seeing an issue that we, we're also seeing along the way. Uh, but again, I'll point to others on how the decision-making process is done, Gina. So I think that's me, um, <laughs> Gina Ralph, Corps of Engineers. So as I showed in my initial slide, um, habitat units are one piece of the puzzle. So the habitat units are what take all of that scientific information from the performance measures that we've developed and we roll it up. We, Jennifer um, showed us, as well as Walter, how we can look zone by zone so that we can match the ecological performance and hydrologic performance we would like to see, roll that up into, or connect it with a, a specific management measure, a specific engineering solution that um, we could then mix and match, pull it together into an alternative. All of our rounds are vetted to the multi-agency project delivery team. They're also vetted with the public. We collect input, we collect feedback. We try to do consensus-based, recognizing that you know, different agencies or different communities have different desires or ecological goals within their region. 
So we take that information that we get as part of the habitat. That's one piece. We then have to also apply those savings clause constraints where that's part of the assurances phase. We also have to come up with a design, um, a preliminary engineering design, and we have to cost it out. So for each one of those features, there is a price tag, a rough order of magnitude cost associated with that feature that then we take the costs from that estimate with the benefits that we are showing from the habitat unit calculations. And we plug that through that economic model, the um, cost effectiveness inter, uh, incremental cost analysis tool so that we can tell you that each alternative per habitat unit is going to cost X amount of dollars. In addition, we also take those tools that the Joint Ecosystem Modeling Group, we apply our constraints such as water quality. We look at the other ecological benefits that are captured as part of those habitat units. All of that weighs into the decision-making to lead to a tentatively selected plan. That tentatively selected plan is put out for, um, again, stakeholder engagement, stakeholder comments. It's all documented in a National Environmental Policy Act document. In this circumstance, it'll be an environmental impact statement. We then collect comments from the public. The public gets a 45-day uh, review period. They provide their comments. We incorporate as appropriate. Um, and at the same time, while all of this is going around, um, in the background, we are coordinating all the way up to our vertical team in Washington, D.C so that they have, um, they approve what we're moving out with in that National Environmental Policy Act documentation. So there's lots of discussions. There's lots of pieces of the puzzle in which we make our determination. Uh, we strive for consensus-based. Um, and in the Corps of Engineers, we always say, if everybody's a little bit angry with us, then we've done our job effectively. Okay, we're, we have more questions and more time, but I think we can get to a few more. Um, John, let's see. Okay, so I wanted to just come back to Matt's question um, about water quality issues and ask if there's, if the water, if there are there any water quality predicted linkages or impacts on accretion or other vegetation responses um, that you, you know, that could be incorporated into the models. Currently, there is no water quality. Sorry. The, um, the accretion measurement is strictly looking at elevation change. Um, and like N Nicole said, there, as we move forward and we start looking at reuse water, and if we start putting combining reuse water in areas also that we would think about thin layer placement, we are going to have to come up with some estimate of the downstream runoff of nutrients from that kind of system. Currently, there are there are no <laughs> estimates of such such an interaction. But I'd like to found a little bit about this science, you know, the disconnect between, not the disconnect, but the, the academic community tends to produce really important information, modeling information that goes up on the shelf. And one of the important things that we have been doing for the last 20 years is making sure that the, those type of products are um, understood in our modeling efforts and, and trying to direct the scientific effort at academic institutes to focus on applied science. There, you can't get NSF money unless you have a really good theoretical framework, right? But that we don't work on that level. We work more on an applied level. And so we help the scientific community direct their models to respond to water management activities and restoration activities. And usually it doesn't take all that much shift in the modeling activity. All, all it takes is um, running a particular scenario that 
we currently do in the Everglades and, and showing upper management that has an impact. And then recover the scientific wing can bring those scientists into, into the fold to help structure the big picture of, of uh, the, the evolution of restoration. Okay, Bill and then Jeff. So thank you, those were great presentations. So um, I think my question is for Jennifer and Walter. Um, if I understood correctly, alternate, alternative 23 involves aquifer storage, is that right? That's the sensitivity run. Oh, it was just a sensitivity run. Okay, I was gonna ask about feasibility of that, given that it looked like the ASR uh, locations would be pretty pretty southernly and whether that would be challenging long-term, but if it was just a sensitivity run, perhaps it doesn't matter. Yeah, so um, the ASR we did look at to try to um, figure out a way to improve our storage, which we knew was um, the most difficult part of, of this project in general. Um, we tried it in two different locations. One was in the Northwest area near one of the Miami-Dade well fields. Um, and then the second was in more in that coastal ASR area. And we did have some initial conversations about the feasibility of that, especially long-term, perhaps with some saltwater intrusion. Um, but we really were trying to focus more on if there were gonna be significant benefits. And, and that was what our evaluation was based on. And I'll turn it to Walter for any, anything else. No, I, I think we have seen that the ASR has a benefit in, in the modeling, right? We're seeing a carryover storage. Um, we're seeing improvements in the dry season. It also comes with a little bit of an impact in the way that we do ASR because there's an efficiency loss in the bubble. And in this part of the system, every drop of water is really critical. So the, at least in the way we apply our performance measures, when we lose a little bit of water, we get a little bit of a ding. And when we carry it over, we get a, an improvement. I think the net is still an improvement. And so ASR is a technology, I think, the, what I'll leave the panel with. I think it's viable in this part of the system. I think that it's synergistic with what we're doing. I just don't know if it'll be part of BBC or at the end of the day in the, in, in the, the big picture cost benefit analysis. And so ju just clarify for me, it's still viable even if you're that far south dealing with sea level rise? Uh, that's our take right now, yes, that we, we think it is. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I'll echo everybody else. Great presentations, learned a lot. Uh, my question is for Fred and Carlos. What does uh, scaling up thin layer placement to the project level look like? It seems like there would be big challenges in actually being able to do it on a large scale and also getting it added to BBC or as a part of the project. Um, thank you. Thank you for your question. So we think that Emma, the uh, Thinly replacement component is the physical model of the actual uh, doing something like this within the BBC uh, footprint. Um, we believe that Emma, the thin layer replacement project, by doing it, we will we will use whatever we learn from that small scale project and apply that into a much larger scale. As of is it possible? I think what we learned by the, all the different workshops that we, where we participated, all the engineers who were part of these workshops, they were very um, good at explaining to us the, how difficult it is, but also the, that it, it was possible. So you are asking if it is possible? Yes, it is possible. Within the, all, all, the, all the difficulties that, that something like that, uh, Carry us, carries out. But yes, I do believe that it is possible. I've seen it in many other different parts of the United States using this technique and working very well over the long term scale, 10 years, 15 years. And I think if it's working in those environments, I think it might work also here in South Florida. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Carlos. And thanks to the panel. Uh, we're going to juggle the agenda a little bit. We're going to go to lunch now, okay? And we're gonna return promptly at one o'clock where we're going to go into session two on adaptive management. And we'll go to, okay, we'll come back at 110.
<laughs> All right, well, we'll come back at 110. Then we'll go to our adaptive management session. And then we'll swing back after completion of that session. And we'll hear from uh, Laura and Stephanie on vulnerability assessment. Okay, so what you have to keep in your mind right now is be back here by 110 after you enjoy a good lunch. <laughs> Uh, each of the panelists introduce themselves. Maybe starting with you, Ava. Is that good? All right, sound check, excellent. Good afternoon, committee members um, and members of the team. Thank you for having me. My name is Ava Fellas. I work for the Army Corps of Engineers, the Jacksonville District. And I am the chief of the ecosystem branch in the programs and project management division. Uh, what all that jargon means is that I am the person responsible for executing the program on behalf of Colonel Booth and the Jacksonville district. So I'm essentially their lead integrator of all things Everglades. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Larry Williams. I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I, I work in Vero Beach, and I supervise the ecological services program uh, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here in Florida, and that includes most of our uh, Endangered Species Act consultations and our Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act responsibilities. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. My name is Leslie Wall. And I work for the South Florida Water Management District um, here in West Palm Beach at our headquarters. And I am the section administrator of our group that's called the Ecosystem Restoration Planning and Project Management section. It's very, a lot of words in that. But um, what I do is lead a group of project managers that are responsible for the planning and implementation of our CERT projects. And we work alongside with our counterparts at the Army Corps of Engineers on a daily basis to implement CERP. Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Gelber. I'm the director of the Office of Everglades Restoration Initiatives for the Department of the Interior. It's great spending the day with most of you yesterday out in Big Cypress. Got to know some of you and look forward to other opportunities to uh, speak with others. Um, I work for the, with the Department of Interior again, I report directly to the Assistant Secretary of Fish and Wildlife and Parks in Washington, D.C. And the Office of Everglades Restoration Initiatives is the administrative branch to the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force. Um, and so seven federal, now state, now currently as a result of the most recent WERDA, um, six state and two tribal to convene to chart the course of Everglades restoration. One of my other responsibilities in the office is to work with folks like great folks like Larry and others in the room here to try to coordinate our uh, government to government, um, you know, messaging and how we're working across landscapes and multitude of threatened and endangered species and how we can work towards, uh, you know, achieving our shared mission in, in um, healing, healing the land like we heard yesterday, right? Important, right? So uh, anyhow, I appreciate the opportunity and, um, having this conversation with you all and the other panel members. Thank you. Angie and Debbie, we're working on getting your video up and running, but uh, you could audibly introduce yourselves, with, starting with Angie. Sir, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angie Dunn. I'm the chief of the planning and policy division for Jacksonville District. Uh, I oversee all of our planning and environmental compliance efforts for all mission areas. Uh, within the state of Florida, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Uh, so that does include the ever-important Everglades restoration mission, as well as our flood risk management uh, and navigation mission. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Good afternoon. I'm Debbie Sharno. I am with the Office of Water Project Review at headquarters at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Our office reviews projects from all over the nation on uh, both ecosystem restoration, as well as our other business lines like navigation, coastal storm risk management, and et cetera. So I have seen ecosystem restoration projects from across the nation. 
though I did get started in ecosystem restoration down in the uh, Everglades. So thank you all. And now it's a camera, it works now. <laughs> Angie, does your camera work? Oh, there you are. Terrific, yay. Okay, we'll turn it over to the committee for questions. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> So the question I'm going to ask is um, basically the first of the questions that was on the list that we sent you a, ahead of time with a little uh, introduction for some context and, and one addition I want to make to it. So the committee is very interested in hearing about how more learning more about how you're going to close the loop on adaptive management, how you're going to actually make changes, uh, alterations in SERP based on new information and unexpected events. We've seen We've seen the four boxes of the original adaptive management plan in action at the planning stage and with assessment. And now it seems like you've reached the management science integration box where you're act that involves how you go about developing options for making alterations in response to new knowledge and, and unexpected events. Um, in looking at all the um, documentation about the process that's come out, that's mostly come from Recover, um, it looks like, to, at least to me, that the design coordination team has a lot of, is a really key decision-making uh, body for, um, for this process for making changes. So the, the addition is I'd like to, to hear more about like who's on that team and how much authority do they actually have? And then that's specifically, and then more generally, um, is the process sort of up and ready to go and all you need is an issue that requires an options report to go to the design coordination team or do you are there still some challenges and and constraints that you see that um, you need to deal with before you're able to really put that plan into action in, in closing the loop anybody <laughs> jump in Okay, I'm gonna, I, I, I hate having my back to Angie and Debbie, so I'm gonna try to be sideways here. Okay, good, great. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna give the program manager's perspective of this, but I think it's really important to hear Debbie and Angie's perspective because they bring something super important and different uh, in their roles. The way I look at this is this is an area of growth for the program. We have spent many years preparing for the peak of implementation. And that's what I'm experiencing as a program manager. As your lead program manager, I'm experiencing the peak of implementation of the projects. And to give you some context of that, from construction, when I say peak of implementation, that's what I mean, you know, in the core, that's what we're looking at dollars spent in construction. Actively, we have 13 construction contracts, about a billion dollars worth of construction actively right now that we're managing. And in FY24, uh, we are scheduled to award $3 billion worth of work just on the core side. So that's what I mean when I say we are at the peak of implementation. And when we are very, very focused on making sure that we have that ready to go and all of our field teams are ready and our planning and engineering and everyone is ready to go to do that, um, the next area of growth is the adaptive management piece. The, and I look at that in parallel with readiness for operational planning meaning when we build something, we have operational testing and we need to have an operational strategy related to that that's fully integrated with science, with Dr. Ralph's team. I'm looking at Gina right there. And so she and I are very closely um, synced. And then what kinds of questions will I have as a program manager that I need to tell Gina now that I will have in 2025, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30, so that the team is ready so I see this as an area of growth and an area that's quite frankly, really hard. Um, at the moment, we're not all the way smooth sailing to implement adaptive management yet because we're 
very busy building stuff. And so that's the first piece. There's a lot more to say. Um, and I don't want you to think that we're not thinking about it, but I'm just telling you that that's an area where I am looking, where's the program going in five years? That's where it's going. Like that's the next big growth area once we make it through this peak of construction implementation, which is 22 to 2030, super high construction, but we need to be ready for that as each facility comes online. So it's very incremental. And then what uncertainty has been realized that we need to manage with science, then comes that. So that's how I think of it. Angie, do you wanna Thank go? You. Or Debbie, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I was, if you don't mind, Angie, I was just gonna do a broad overview. So, um, for the core, the way we do adaptive management is it is part of the project when the project is, is authorized. And there is a method that is laid out for how monitoring will be done. And if things do, if the project does not perform as is expected, what will, what actions can be done in response? Um, so it happens post construction and it happens after some monitoring has occurred in our traditional ecosystem restoration projects. I think the interesting part with this project is that it is so big and there is so much monitoring that um, there usually we don't change the adaptive management plan as we go along. But I think that that is where your um, other teams come in where maybe we thought we needed a specific performance measure and now we're figuring out it's a different performance measure or a different way to monitor. And so I think you're not only doing adaptive management of the project, but you're also doing adaptive management of the adaptive management and monitoring plan. And that's where it gets a lot more complicated. So I'll, I'll build on what Debbie said, because so, she didn't completely steal my thunder. Uh, my thought is this, uh, our challenge is, is learning. So we first started looking at adaptive management um, after WERDA 2000. And so we started putting together what we thought were good adaptive management plans. But as we've constructed projects, um, we're seeing that those adaptive management plans didn't consider all the potential effects or all the potential pathways uh, that might uh, stop a project from performing as originally intended. So now, and this gets into challenges, which may be jumping ahead a little bit, but now we have to figure out what authority do we have within the limits of the CORE's project uh, in partnership with South Florida, but within the limits of the federal project, what flexibility and authority do we have to make changes without having to go um, back to Congress for additional authority? And so what I'll say is we are learning, and as we look at new studies such as Western Everglades and DB Sear, we're thinking about adaptive management and what that means in a more proactive approach so that we can develop adaptive management plans that are more holistic and might provide us more flexibility in the future for responding uh, based on what we see with monitoring. Anything else from the panel? Sure. Leslie? Yeah. Um, and just from our perspective of, um, you know, I think definitely agree with, with the core on their perspective and the adaptive management, especially for um, operations and after construction, but I think there's also, you know, opportunities now in the, the phase that we're in with this, a lot of design and construction going on is, um, you know, what can we look at prior to constructing? And I think that's been a big question, um, especially recently with SEP and other projects that are in design. Um, so that has been a challenge, uh, trying to say, okay, well, is there a place for adaptive management and design? Um, 
so we're it's we're currently working through that right and it's it's been a challenge and then working within the flexibility we've heard that a lot right i remember that from the last meetings the meaning of a month or two ago right flexibility is a a big term um it's finding that flexibility in the process that's currently there i think there is some um there's some authorities where you can make some changes to the project without going back to congress but there's a limit to that as well so um that's i think is our current challenge for me anyway um, my perspective is how do we apply it to design before we even put something into the ground i'll add a little bit uh from the perspective of the fish and wildlife service um my, my experience has been that the Everglades partners have a lot of uh, a lot of willingness, a lot of enthusiasm for doing adaptive management and trying new things. Um, but I I have seen where we run into impediments, and most often the ones that I've seen have been where we complete some kind of an analysis. And so for my agency, uh, Endangered Species Act analysis, you know, an ESA consultation on a project or on a water control plan, or similarly, the, you know, the, the Corps uh, completes NEPA analysis on something. And when we do those analysis, the, um, a lot of times those are really big undertakings that they result in big documents and they get kind of locked in. And if we want to deviate from those things, that becomes hard, you know, and sometimes when we're doing those analysis or proposing the project, proposing the, you know, the new control plan, we can ride some latitude in there, but you can only ride them so with so much latitude because if they become vague, you can't really analyze it under NEPA or the ESA. And, and I've seen some court cases where agencies were found uh, deficient because they weren't explicit enough about what was being proposed and therefore what the analysis uh, translated into. So um, to me, that's one of the challenges that we have to balance is, you know, trying to write the flexibility into these documents, but at the same time, not be so vague that, that we kind of open up a vulnerability or, or, you know, people don't understand what you intend to do even, you know, that could be an outcome. <laughs> but um, I, I feel like, uh, again, that's that's kind of a, a legal limitation, and I've seen it with NEPA, and I've seen it with our ESA consultations. But again, my experience is the team is very willing to do their best to write that that you know to do the balancing act there. But um, but we know that there's we can only go so far because uh, we get uh, you know we we just open up some vulnerabilities. Yeah, so in addition, I'm taking that pause as a, as a break. Uh, lots has been said here. You know, my brain just starts cranking over about this, this topic. It's pretty broad, almost as broad as the presentations this morning and data and information, right? And how to take all that information and adaptively manage it along the way and, and get consensus in where that moves through. Um, I, I think that there's a, a willingness, but some of the things that I see or run into is that, that authorization Right. And that process, that legal framework that has been built up around this process that is is the pathway now. And, and I think that's maybe why you all are here to help us find that pathway to more quickly move when we see those opportunities. You know, I see small little crumbs here and there that have some benefits of projects that are ready to go, but we just can't do it. Right. Because there's not appropriations. There's not a, you know, it's a job cost accounting line item that's the money's there right and it's years out right and so how are we able to move to strike out and do these other small or other no, nothing small in the Everglades I mean, the other relatively speaking right how do we go in and take care of those items along the way that bring the benefits um when the taxpayers you know this is their funds right and it's got to be reported back appropriately and that you you know and putting on my hat the other day in our buggy you know um in you don't want just anybody coming in and redirecting that adaptive management to meet that their one need, right? Um, and um, so I think there's there's a willingness. It's just there are a legal framework when you put NEPA and and other a uh, whole bunch of the, everything into the into the pot, and then try to pull it out. It becomes challenging from I guess on a on a spur of the moment item that may kind of change, not like a 
more programmatic, longer term, adaptively managing. I think, um, you know, from from what I see inside uh, the, the agency interior is it's you know adaptively budget adaptive ma budget management, right? And, and are you having to move money from one to another to compensate to move where you're seeing the science going from year to year, right? Um, and not and having some of those constraints to to try to forecast where we want it to go, or at least at least tracking that science and being ready for that specific component of of that project. You know, I I believe that there's a lot more happening uh, on the fisheries side, right? That the fisheries would tell us a lot more about what we're doing. Um, and and again, um, it's just we're not able to kind of move in that direction right now. Anyway, just some thoughts off the top of my head. Thanks. So if I just follow up for a second. So my interpretation is that it's not as simple as it looks in the plan, that it, <laughs> it's not going to be an options report and the design coordination team says, go for it. There's a lot more people that are going to be involved in making decisions. Yeah. And it's going to be a more complicated process than that. OK. So I want to be really responsive to the who's on the team question, if I may. The scientists are the ones at the forefront of telling us, and I mean specifically Dr. Ralph's team on the core side, um, at which she works for Angie, right? So it's Angie's team. They're, they are the ones that are telling us this uncertainty has been realized. And so I've learned to be very disciplined to make sure that when we're talking about adaptive management, that the scientist team is the one that's saying this specific uncertainty has been realized, or I see it coming and I need your help in addressing it. So it starts with them in my, in my world. And then sometimes I get this from outside folks that say, I see this uncertainty it could be Adam, it could be Larry, it could be Leslie, it could be anybody that's in this room and as I'm looking around the room. Um, from my perspective, who's on my team on this issue, I go to Gina and I go, is this uncertainty realizing on the ground or do we see it coming or have we built something? It could be in any of the phases. And then we bring in the other members of the team that need to help flesh that out. And that usually means engineering, H&H, &H, water resources folks. And then we layer the other members of engineering that have to make a plan. In the planning side, who's in the team, it could be, do we have NEPA coverage for this action? Um, did we already write it in our adaptive management plan? We have to check that, right? So the, the planning team has to help us with that. That's people on the team. And then we have to go, so there's, there's the scientists as first. We look at the water resources side. We may layer that with engineering. Maybe that's a little too early. We check whether we have, did we already plan for this uncertainty? Hopefully, yes. If the answer is no, then the team gets a whole lot bigger. The answer is yes, then we go check, do we have NEPA? And then it comes to someone like me that says, did we plan for this to have money? And if we, if we did, wow, we got lucky. If we didn't, I do budgeting two years ahead. So right now I'm in 25 budgeting. So that's the reality of my time scale to be able to implement something that Gina brings to the table with her team that says, this. Un that's why the conversations always have to be forward looking. That's why I said what I said about anticipating questions because the reality of me being able to bring money to the team to execute that change has to be something I thought about two years ago. And I put it in a plan and I got it covered and I found a way to fight for it. And the Congress then gave the authorization or the appropriation, assuming the adaptive management plan already had it in there in the first place. So that's all the members of the team, not all at the same time, but those, that's the reality of making a change to a project that's already been authorized and adapt and, and being able to adapt it. I hope that helps. 
I'm going to jump in and just make sure we're all talking the same language because um, I heard Leslie say they'd like to move adaptive management more into the design phase. I heard you say if it's in the plan, then great, but if not, the team gets bigger. So, so I think we'd like to think about it as new information that may suddenly say, well, if you don't do this, you've got a problem, or if you do do this, that's your answer. Is the core, is there a process within the core that allows that outside the formal adaptive management plan that's written in the PIR? How do you think about that outside of that plan? Because it does seem like there's lots of new information coming. And if it doesn't hit at exactly the right time, then it's lost. And you don't want to wait 10 years to then say, well, let's construct it to show that what we thought was going to happen did actually. That is the challenge. Very, very clearly, that is the challenge. And, and Leslie, when she said during design, it made me smile because we've been dealing with that. And so the team said, I really, and I'm looking at Fred, who's, who's back there, you know, who's like, hey, I'd, I'd like to do this thing. And we're over there checking all of our tables and our plans and saying, we may or may not have coverage, or I may or may not have uh, the funding for that this year, or we have to wait for certain things. It, it's a challenge. It is not easy to change the adaptive management plan. Um, it, it is challenging. I'll let, I'll ask Debbie and Angie to add to that, but from a program manager's perspective, it is very challenging. Yeah, so right, this is good. Sorry. Go ahead, Debbie. No, go it's ahead. A, it's a very good question about, you know, what is adaptive management? So for the core, adaptive management only happens post-construction. So if you are trying to make a change in design, that it we can make some changes in design, but they have to be within the bounds of what has been authorized. And if it's not within the bounds of what's authorized, then that starts another process often kind of called a post-authorization change report. And then we'd have to incorporate that new information into the post-authorization change report. Um, it also can mean a change, as Ava said, in the adaptive management plan itself, which might mean that they would have to bring that plan back up to headquarters for reapproval. So there are ways that we can do it. It's just during design, but it's not called adaptive management at the core, it's called design refinements or a post authorization change report or something along those lines. Debbie got it exactly right, thank you. Hey, Mark, then Matt, then Al. Thanks. Um, so, First off, I'm a new committee member, so you're answering questions for somebody who's still drinking from the fire hose. Um, so we've talked about planning, adaptive management and planning and in design. And my question now is adaptive management and operations. And so, I mean, we know that the rain doesn't fall exactly when we expect it to fall and sometimes it falls harder or it doesn't fall at all. Um, and so where's your scope for adaptive management at the operations level when you close things, when you open things that? Sure, so I'll let Ava say where it is, but I think in general, the system operating manual provides a wide variety of um, cases and that we follow that system operating manual. If we find that something doesn't work in the system operating manual, and we need to make an additional change, that would be a change to the operations manual. But uh, I think that system operating manual gives you a pretty good variety of things that you can do. And our um, water resources engineers are pretty good at utilizing that wide range of uh, possibilities as is the South Florida Water Management District. And I'll add on too with that system operating manual, we try to write them such that they provide us some flexibility to react to different uh, climatic opportunities. Um, 
And so within that flexibility, we write our NEPA analysis to also account for, you know, a range of potential environmental effects dependent upon if we're operating strictly by the system operating manual or if we are using some of that flexibility. But if we're finding uh, during operations of the project that it's truly not performing the way we expected, that's when we come back and we bring the scientists that uh, Ava brought up, we bring them together, we bring Fish and Wildlife and the Water Management District in to say, what do we need to change? And then we look at updating that system operating manual um, and getting that approved with updated NEPA documents. So I wanna just, because she said she's new, so I wanna try my best to de-jargonize. I may not succeed, I'm gonna try. So CERT is a modification to the Central and Southern Florida system, which is the original federal project. That system has operational manuals associated with them that we break up into seven volumes. And there's a map on the back of the integrated delivery schedule with these orange lines and orange regions and numbers. That's what they're talking about. So there's seven of those. So think of them as piece geographic areas that we think about together and develop operational strategies for those. And then we make sure that they fit together into the larger system. So the manual, the system operations manual says, this is my big picture understanding of this region. For example, volume three is Lake Okeechobee and the Northern Estuaries and the EAA. So this is what we know about that area. And then as you go further in, there is a specific chapter on the operational strategy, the instructions to the operators for Lake Okeechobee, for every lock around Lake Okeechobee, for the locks that go to the estuaries, all of that is written in there. So that's what the SOM or the volumes are. When we, so we do those even when we don't have a SERP feature. They're, they're called something a little different, water control manuals, the system operations manuals is the construct of SERP, but it's the same region. Okay, so we have those because we have a system from the 1940s that has that. As we modify the system, when we add storage or we move a structure or we move a levy or whatever it is that we do, there has to be a specific action. We go through the process of how do we incorporate that feature into the system? And so we try different alternatives, always though with what is the purpose of the system which are given to us by the Congress. And then how did this new feature change what we can do within those project purposes to maybe do better for the environment or do better for water supply or do better for whichever one of the, the, the project purposes that we're thinking about or hopefully all five, there's five. Okay, so that's the really big picture part of it. What happens then when we add a feature or change a feature and we modify our operational strategy, we then say, here's our new operational strategy. Here are the uncertainties of things that may happen. It may be that I'm worried that I may not have enough fresh water for the Caloosahatchee until the C43 reservoir is built in the dry season, or I have a goal of getting fresh water across Tamiami Trail, which is a different volume, volume four, and I know I need to get there, and I have a water budget that is currently limited because I haven't built the EAA reservoir yet. I haven't reconnected Lake Okeechobee to the Central Everglades yet, but I know I'm getting there, but right now I just have the bridges, which are amazing, and I'm, I'm getting a lot more water across the trail. Okay, so, so whenever we're thinking about those big picture ideas, we identify certain uncertainties there. And so we actively work on those depending on the, there's a timing element to that, to answer your question. Now I'm finally getting to the answer. So how do we do it? How do we do adaptive management and operations? It is, it is informed by the timing of your decision. So 
if I am right now in September and I'm thinking my uncertainty is the lake is actually in a beautiful spot if I don't get a storm, right? So my uncertainty is, do I have to start shifting for the next season for water, not me personally, for water conservation, because we have to think about that water lasting through the coming dry season. And we come up with ideas for the commander to consider. So, cause the lake is, is, could be well within the ecological envelope that's good for its ecology and that we're doing well and we can give good water to the Clusahatchee and meet water supply needs, right? That could be where we're at. Or we could get an E in late September. And then we have other concerns about the lake. And so the time of year matters to the way we adaptively manage what's happening. Um, and what, so there's this forecasting that happens at that any time of year, but there are some key moments. So the peak of the wet season is a key moment. The beginning of the dry season is a key moment. The end of the dry season is a key moment. So the time of the year and the season matters. What your objective is matters. You have to set that operational objective for the coming season. And then we go to Gina and the team and say, I'm worried about algae on the lake. Can you please go talk to the, can you please go talk to the scientists and tell us what they think and give us recommendations about how we may adaptively manage the lake within the confines of what Angie said, within the confines of the NEPA process that we've already done. That's a lot of words, but hopefully that helped. Great, Eva. Thanks very much. Kind of, kind of just add something there for Marla's perspective, and I'll be very quick. Yeah. And then we'll move on to the next. Yeah. It, it, so it's my so the system operate these, these operational plans take somewhere in the order of three years, right? To develop those, just putting that into perspective and that ability to move with changes in the system, it does take quite a can take even longer than that. It probably could take even a shorter period of time, depending on the complexity of the matter. But you know, um, for uh, for SEP. Uh, water control plan is so we're looking at 2026. So there's some things that may need to be done sooner than that. Thanks, Adam. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so I had a question uh, as a follow-up to something that, that Debbie uh, mentioned, and it was, the phrase was AM of the AM and monitoring plan. And so sort of two parts to that question, AM in that context is adaptively managing, which may or may not be the same thing as adaptive management. And I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Um, are there examples, and so the, the other part of my question is, are there examples from other parts of the Corps' national restoration portfolio of doing AM on the AM and monitoring plan? I'm not thinking of one right now, but um, that doesn't mean that they're not out there. Usually what happens is that we figure out something we thought was a goal a performance measure is not quite what we thought. So the first time we really came across, do we need to change an adaptive management plan was when, um, with, was when we started doing the design for SEP. And we started to think about um, were some of the performance measures that we had during the planning of SEP actually what we want, or there's some other things that we need to change. Um, and I think there's still some consideration as to what we'll do with that. I, I kind of lost track of that when I moved from SAD up to headquarters. Um, but, uh, you know, that is this, you know, we hope that when we put together an adaptive management plan, that we understand the system well enough to come up with good performance measures a good monitoring system and other things. But some things crop up. So for example, invasive species may crop up at a project that we didn't expect them to, or a new invasive species might come in. And they might have had a specific response for a specific invasive species, but maybe they don't have a response in the adaptive management plan for this new invasive species. And so we may have to revise a plan to deal with that new invasive species or to deal with a performance measure that perhaps isn't exactly what we thought it was going to be or we didn't quite understand it the right way. Um, what it says in our guidance is that if we make a change to the adaptive management plan, 
it's supposed to go back up to headquarters because that plan is authorized as part of the project authorization. So um, that's how we usually deal with them. Um, most of our projects are just plodding along, doing fine, but you know, the Everglades is complicated, so. And I'll just add on to what Debbie said real quick too, because one of the pieces of adaptively managing the adaptive management, it is utilizing the data that the recover team, both from uh, the core as well as the larger interagency recover team, where they're helping us look program wide through SERP and, and Everglades restoration, and then sharing those lessons learned and helping us incorporate them in the individual projects. And so I think a big benefit to the core learning to adaptively manage better and put together more robust adaptive management plans is utilizing the scientists on the recover team to help us understand the larger system focus because you've got the project planners and the project biologists that are very focused on their piece of Everglades restoration and not always incorporating the larger program piece. And so I wanna put that plug in for the recover team because they are looking program wide and incorporating the data and the lessons learned and sharing it with each of the project delivery teams as part of the recover review, but also as part of their integration into those project teams. I was going to add that I just thinking about AM on AM, I, I, I might have an example of that that's on the horizon. Uh, this was just something that came to mind. So one of the endangered species in the Everglades is the Everglades snail kite. And uh, a lot of the agencies uh, help monitor snail kite populations. And for the past few years, there's been a declining number of snail kites uh, south of Lake Okeechobee. In some ways, it looks like their range is kind of expanding northward, but they're uh, sort of disappearing in the south part of the Everglades. And I, I think this year there was uh, maybe no nest recorded from 3A south, which would be a, you know kind of a, a, a milestone, a you know disturbing figure. But um, so you know monitoring the status of a listed species as we proceed with restoration you know that's a version of adaptive management but uh what we're starting to think now with the snail kites is it looks like the problem might be that the apple snails aren't there so you know there might be a, a change coming up in the future where we start to monitor the parameters around apple snails and I, i'm just saying that you know that might be in the future but that's you know, that could be a way that we're learning about how the system works, but our, our original adaptive management wasn't calibrated the way it needed to be. So there might be a recalibration coming up in the future. So I just wanted to share that because that came to mind. Maybe it's, it's an example of this. Okay, Al. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, very, um, pragmatic descriptions you have of adaptive management. I have an observation and a question. The observation is um, appreciating the fact that the core has a very strict procedure associated with adaptive management and looking at it from somebody who is a non-core individual. You know, we think of adaptive management, at least as a scientist, as being a, a more temporally Trying to be diplomatic here, um, which is not my strength. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Eva. Um, it, it's something that's just more dynamic. And having a two or three year timeline for it, you're making sure that you go through the chain of command to get all the approvals to do this, to me, seems inane. Right? Um, and you know, sometimes you need to be more responsive. So I realize that within your Within, within the procedurals that you deal with, there's constraints that you can't change. I get that, we all get that. The question is, why do we continue maintaining that system? Why don't we try and change that system so that we can adapt on timeframes by which ecology works? So that's the observation and you know, sort of trying to be provocative. Matt, I, you know, following Matt, it's easy to be more provocative because Matt leads that way. Um, the question is to get back to Jeff, 
And, you know, my confusion here is you go, the court goes through this process, the district goes through this process, the other agencies go through their processes. Who has authority, right? That was one of Jeff's initial, initial questions. And how does that decision making be done to decide, yes, we're going to change the plan to start doing something different? Thank you. And I really do appreciate, you know, believe me, I appreciate what you're going through, being a former district employee. Yeah, uh, don't worry. I uh, I didn't start at the core. I had a shorter time frame at the core than most people. So um, I understand that that uh, confusion as to uh, why our processes are what they are. But I can tell you that um, we often have more flexibility than we give ourselves. For example, um, there are several occasions where uh, Gina Ralph sent me a, a document on, and water resources that we needed to make an emergency deviation. Um, and she worked very closely with Larry's group to figure out how to um, do this emergency deviation. And I think we got some of those done in, in like 14 to 30 days. So we can move quickly when we really need to move quickly. Um, but in general, the core does move slower because we do have a lot of policies we need to follow. Uh, Congress trusts us with a lot of responsibility and we have found that our processes work to, uh, to fulfill that responsibility in a way that is documented. Can I ask a clarifying question? When you ask who has the authority to accept or adopt a change that results from a recommendation, what kind of change are you thinking about? <clears throat> that would help me answer who has the authority because it, it matters. I, I understand that, but you know, I wasn't necessarily thinking about a specific change as much as something more generic in terms of the way that the operations are done as a process associated with these, with multiple agencies, all trying to work together um, to make these kind of decisions. You know, I, I could point to, you know, short-term changes or long-term changes, things like how do you decide that you're going to change how the STAs function or, or on a short-term basis, You've got a harmful algal bloom, or wait, forget harmful. You got water levels that are too high in Lake Okeechobee, and I'm going to open up an emergency, you know, open up the hurricane gates because we're going to send water. Or where do we send the water? Got it. Do we send it more to Palusahatchee or St. Lucie or the Everglades? So there's a short term, got there's it. a long term, and there's probably really longer term, but that's not what I'm worried about, the really longer term, because that folds within the course process. Okay, I got it. The approval authority in a change of an operational strategy that's seasonal, to answer your question, is the commander. He receives recommendations from us as his team, technical team, and the us is a representative from PM, which is usually me, representative from science, which is Dr. Ralph, almost every single time, that's her job representative from operations, the people that actually open and close the locks. The primary advisor is the water manager for the particular water body, although we do have a head water manager. Then we have council, we have all members of the team every single week without fail. We prepare a recommendation to the commander. So it depends on what's happening. And he will tell us, I want to know your thoughts for this week's decision. And I want to know what should be our thoughts seasonally for the coming season and then for the next season after that. And we make a lot of adaptive management changes and that is the commander. If it changes the SOM volume, Right, if it has a significant change, which was Debbie's point, a deviation, and there's a lot of a lot of flexibility, but there usually comes a point where we don't have it and we find ourselves in need of a change. We go through a, a, an operational planning change, which could be a deviation or another planning like LOSM. 
And the decision authority for that change is General Hibner, our South Atlantic Division Commander. For the Corps, it's very clear who has that decision authority. How do the, excuse me, thank you, Ava. How do the, how do the other agencies feed into that process, like Fish and Wildlife or the district or DOI, any, any of these? So for the, for the Water Management District, who is the operator of the system, with very few exceptions, we've retained only certain structures where our lock operators actually are, are standing there. The majority, it's Leslie, right? Um, so in that case, we receive a weekly operational position statement that's available to the public. It's a written document from the South Florida Water Management District that says, these are the ecological conditions, and these are our recommendations for this time period. Sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's two weeks, and sometimes it's seasonal. Uh, so we receive very clear uh, opinions and recommendations from the sponsor for the system, and we very rarely differ, meaning differ or different from them. So that's Mr. Bartlett and Colonel Booth who make those decisions week to week, month to month, season to season within an existing operational plan. We go to, Angie goes to Larry when we have a question about whatever's happened in, under the confines of an existing biological opinion. And I'll let, let Larry and Angie talk about that. We talk to Adam when he's got concerns about, hey, I don't want you to slow down your flows across the trail for whatever reason, right? That's what happens, but that's a ongoing conversation, but the principles, Adam, Larry, Colonel Booth, Drew Bartlett, that's who's making those decisions week to week, month to month, season to season. You're welcome. Can I follow up and, and ask if it's not an operations, if it's a change to a design, who has the authority to do that? And if it's changed to construction that doesn't require NEPA, that it's and within the 20% cost, who has the authority to do that? I was going to jump in. Please jump in. Please. Just, yeah, on a general level to you know, how a process would work for a change, right? A lot of times it starts with a suggestion, right? Somebody's maybe at the staff level is making a suggestion based on science, based on what's going on on the ground. Um, and there are, we are in constant coordination with the core. Like I said, you know, we coordinate with them on a daily basis, our project teams coordinate um, regularly, our design teams coordinate regularly. So if there is a suggestion for a change, then it really just needs to work its way up through the process. What is that change? What's the significance of that change? And it works its way through management, works its way through leadership and up. And then it really just depends on what the change is and how significant that change is as to what level of authority or authorization it needs at that point. So, you know, we're we're doing it all the time, um, whether it's design, construction, or operations. And, you know, that's just kind of a general way to think about it, right? It just has to work its way up to the chain. And then depending on what level of approval it needs to be done, or if there's additional paperwork that needs to be done, like NEPA. Does that help? I, I was, you know, I was thinking about like examples of where we've had to do that, and um, you know, the um, the curtain wall at the eight and a half square mile location to me is a great example of that because you know we were we were all working to get the L twenty nine canal higher. We had some success, and then we were trying to get the S three three water control structure expanded so we could get more water through it. And as that happened, we saw the problem starting to happen with flooding there in the eight and a half square mile area. And I gotta say, the district was like lightning on that. I mean, you, they moved fast. And to, to me, that's a great example of, I think that change had to happen on the integrated delivery schedule. And a lot of other changes had to happen to make that, you know, that project got built, built quickly. And all those uh, other changes that had to be implemented with it were made pretty rapidly. Can you clarify, was, did the district take the, the lead on that or was that a jointly funded core? No, yeah, okay, so the, the district has flexibility in the core. Okay. <laughs> they're spectacular. Honestly, they're amazing in their flexibility. I'm, I'm always like doing this to what they can do. Great. Yeah, there's definitely some 
the state definitely has some other opportunities to do things. Um, I'm not going to say outside the process. It's just a different process that we can follow. Right. But we do take risk with that. Yeah. Right. We may not get cost share at the end for spending that money. It's it's a risk on our part, but we do believe that that risk is is yeah. worth it. So we'll, we can move out and construct things ahead of uh, the core in a lot of instances, but it's just a risk when we do it. But, um, but again, you know, we have that great partnership to work with the core to be able to get whatever documents that we need in place to be able to move out ahead. ahead. Um, and the core is, you know, great at working with us to do that. Um, so there's, there's its own process in us doing that. <laughs> And doing work ahead of the core, but um, but we work together to get that done for sure. Yeah, um, I'll try to give you a very specific answer, Stephanie. Let's say we're in design. That means feasibility level analysis is done on the Congress. Uh, it's a it's approved for construction, and we've gotten an appropriation. So let's pick IRL. Okay. Let's pick one of the C23, C24 complexes. Um, let's say we are uh, in design for the North Reservoir, C23, C24. We have the North, they have the South, right? Um, so if all those things are true, we have authorization, we have appropriation, we know who's doing it. You know, one is black on the IDS, one's blue on the IDS. Let's say the teams have to work on um, how the reservoirs connect to each other. Just a good example. And there's some kind of canal in the way or some kind of change. Those changes are every single day that Leslie and I talk about. Every single day, our teams are looking at it as they're advancing design. Her engineering design team and my engineering design team are in rooms together every day, day in and day out. And the program managers are as well trying to keep up with what the team is changing, saying, hey, are we still within our scope? Those are our decisions that if we have all those top things covered, those are decisions Leslie and I make. As long as we have a budget and we're in scope and I check in with Angie's team and the NEPA's good and we're good. Those are the kinds of decisions Leslie and I make as long as we're within our budget and it's within day-to-day -day stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I, I hate to do this. Uh, we're gonna give Jeff the last question and then we're going to have to move on. No, no, <laughs> maybe, maybe I put that in the wrong order. <laughs> no. I'm gonna get, no. <laughs> no. We're gonna give Jeff the last question. <laughs> Hey, my question is pretty straightforward um, with COP, which I know is not CERP, but I'll get back to CERP. They produce these biannual, biannual reports that go to Fish and Wildlife um, about endangered species measures. And every one of them has this long, big table about decisions made from periodic science calls. And a lot of those are, and this, I'm impressed it seems to be really effective science management integration. And a lot of, the decisions you could say are just a way of getting assessment really quickly to make a short-term decision. But some of them you could call AM because some of them are like, we've been doing A, but we learned something from now on, we're gonna do B. Uh, so my question is, do you envision like a similar sort of informal process that could produce some adaptive management at the operation stage for CERT projects? I mean, you have calls like that or you're planning to do something like that? Short version is yes. 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 Unequivocally for the core team. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I, even though that was a very brief uh, response, <laughs> this is great. We're going to move on anyways. Thanks very much to the panel. Very helpful. Okay. So Next, we're going to hear from Laura DeCunto and Stephanie Romanosh from the USGS. And uh, this is a, a presentation on vulnerability assessment analyses and how these could be used in SERP. So Laura, I think is with us in person and Stephanie's joining us virtually.
Okay, there we go. Hey, um, I'm Laura DiCunto, and I'm an ecologist at the USGS. Um, I'm also a model developer within the Joint Ecosystem Modeling Lab at USGS. I um, mean, that's led by Stephanie Romaniak. Um, I'm gonna talk to you today about um, assessing system-wide vulnerability in the Everglades, um, about this project, the Everglades Vulnerability Analysis, but that's not the only modeling tool that we use at GEM. And so I could talk about some of the other ones later as well. So I first wanted to talk about um, barriers that we have um, probably worldwide into using predictive ecological models um, to make decisions or to help us with restoration. Um, so one of the things I see is there are different spatial and temporal scales um, associated with different models. Um, and so we might have something that's on a very small scale, small temporal scale, and something that's landscape wide. And how do we um, integrate those together um, to get a decision made? There are varying levels of uncertainty associated with those, um, those models based on the structure of the model. So some models may not have any measured uncertainty associated with them, and some may have measured uncertainty, and then some may have more uncertainty than others. And so how do we sort of combine all those together to have a good understanding of how the uncertainty is going to impact our decisions? Um, typically, these models are they're created and then they're not really updated with new knowledge um, as time goes on. And so we have um, a bunch of models that get built and maybe they're used over and over, but they were built um, you know, five to 10 years ago and the system has changed tremendously since then. And so um, if we're not updating with new knowledge, we might be losing some of those responses from the ecological community um, because of the outdated model. And then um, finally, sometimes the model output is just actually inaccessible to its users that are making decisions. So um, maybe the maybe a model is on a daily time scale, and how do you look at output that's on a daily time scale at a 400 meter resolution across decades? Um, that's a really hard thing to summarize, and so. We need to focus on making model outputs that are accessible to the people and are giving information in a form that they can use for decision making. Um, so my, um, my suggestion is that I'm not suggesting that the Everglades vulnerability analysis addresses all these barriers or takes care of all these problems, but it's um, my suggestion for how we can overcome some of these barriers um, to be able to combine models together um, and get output that is um, usable for decision making. So the Everglades Vulnerability Analysis, or AVA for short, um, basically takes hydrology and salinity information from the, the hydro models that we heard a lot about earlier this morning. Um, and currently we're looking at four indicators of ecosystem health. So how these indicators of ecosystem health um, respond to changes in salinity and hydrology. So those four indicators are um, the vegetation type, um, presence of alligator nests, sawgrass peat accretion rates, and wading bird colony sizes. And so this is a, um, the way that we implement this is through a series of connected modular Bayesian networks. And because the outcomes are in, a, um, in terms of probability, we also have a common um, format for uncertainty within the model. So um, everything outcomes in probability. And so we output uncertainty um, in the same format for each module that we're predicting. And then using that uncertainty and um, a user defined um, statement of where, of where we want to go on the landscape. So what is our target or what is our um, desired outcome for these modules? Um, for these indicators, we um, can generate a vulnerability surface. And that surface is basically telling us how far away we are from the desired outcome that the user defines. So I'm gonna go through, um, obviously this is um, a lot of stuff. And so we can produce lots of different outputs from the AVA model. Um, so we can 
use um, the predicted outcome. So we can produce maps of predicted outcomes. And this is an example of the vegetation module. And so it's showing the most likely vegetation type on the landscape based on the hydro scenario that we have fed it. Um, and so the next um, output that we can create is a, a measure of uncertainty on the landscape. And so this is showing um, the amount of certainty we have with that most likely outcome um, from the model. And so the darker blues are gonna indicate more certain areas and the lighter blues indicate less certain areas. And so we can look at where on the landscape we might need more information, or maybe there's so much variability in that area of the landscape that it's really hard to predict that outcome. And then finally, we have our predicted vulnerability surface. So this is gonna show us um, where on the landscape we're straying furthest from um, our desired outcome that we input as the user. And then here you see darker reds is higher vulnerability and lighter reds is lower vulnerability. So um, when we are um, in the next couple of months, we are, have been asked to run um, the AVA vegetation module through the BBC -er, um, baseline and alternatives to look at how vegetation type may be changing um, from these alternatives. And so um, what you can see here is actually results from a sensitivity analysis we did um, just to make sure that the model is sensitive to these changes. And what you can see here is that as we make the landscape wetter, we're actually seeing more freshwater long hydro period vegetation types appearing in that box there. Um, and so we're confident that with these sensitivity analyses, we're getting that model sensitivity to see um, predicted outcomes um, based on these hydrologic scenarios. Some other things that we're thinking about using AVA for um, is looking at sea level rise um, or sea level change in, um, in these project scenarios. So this is currently just showing a baseline scenario. So like current conditions of, of, um, of hydrology and then a 2050 high sea level rise scenario. Um, and this is showing the probability of um, mangrove vegetation type on the landscape. And so the darker blues indicate a higher probability of mangrove. Um, and I know this is a little bit hard to see the differences. So I um, took the the bait, I subtracted the sea level rise scenario from the, the baseline or current conditions. As you can see here, we have reduced mangrove probabilities in the browns, and then increased mangrove probability is in the blue. And what we can see here is that we are seeing some evidence of some mangrove migration, which is what you heard about earlier today. Um, and so this model is capturing that um, with looking at sea level rise scenarios. Um, we can also look at sea level rise scenarios in terms of vulnerability. So um, here we have the same scenario as a baseline and a high sea level rise scenario. And we're looking at the vulnerability of wading birds on this landscape. And so from here, you can see that um, with the sea level rise scenario, we're getting darker reds, so more vulnerable um, in that sea level rise scenario using the AVA model. So one of the things that we've been doing um, is we're trying to figure out how um, the decision makers and recover um, can best use our models. Um, so I know that one of the committee members earlier talked about like, oh, I make models and they just get left on the shelf, never to be used again. And we've experienced some of that a little bit too. And so one of the things we're really interested in is what do decision makers, what do um, what does recover need um, in order to feel like the models are giving them useful information? So we teamed up with a social scientist at the University of Florida and we're surveying recover um, to ask them some tough questions about what they really need from models in order to um, better understand the system-wide perspectives. So we asked them some questions like, if you could have any information from ecological models that you wanted without constraints, what would you like to know? Um, we've also asked, are there certain aspects of modeling tools that prevent you from fully considering the impacts of sea level rise on Everglades restoration? And we also asked, how do you think SERP restoration targets should be adjusted given sea level rise? 
And so the answers to these questions are going to feed into our ability to um, adjust the visualizations of our tool in order to give them the best information to, to assess um, how restoration projects, how SERP is going to impact um, the Everglades system-wide. So based on feedback that we've had um, already, um, this will likely be in some kind of time, some kind of type of um, interactive tool. Um, maybe you've heard of, of something called like ArcGIS Online, um, basically where you can go into a web platform and you can load up all these different outputs as layers. Um, you can use sliders to look at um, when things are popping up based on different um, certainty levels, um, zoom into interest areas and toggle across time. Um, and then also um, download tables and charts from that information. And so this is a more dynamic um, way um, and it's not like the static maps and tables that we've historically been providing. And hopefully this is gonna um, help decision makers and recover um, really understand all of these different intricacies with the different alternative scenarios, um, sea level rise scenarios, um, and, and through the decades of time that we're looking at. Um, so as mentioned before, um, this is an ever um, growing process. This is an ever growing model. So we're constantly updating the AVA tool. We're constantly developing um, different things with the AVA tool. And it's not a model that's just gonna sit on a shelf. Um, and so some of the things that we have planned for the next year are um, we are implementing vegetation succession dynamics into the vegetation model. And so we have gotten some additional data to be able to build in um, vegetation probabilities that rely also on the probability of the vegetation the year before. And so, we're hoping to get that done this year so that um, the vegetation switches in the model um, reflect more reality than they do currently. We're also going to be adding a small fish density and biomass module for the wet and dry seasons um, into the AVA tool. And so we are currently working um, to solidify the plans for that and work with some of the um, principal investigators that collect small fish data in the Everglades to make sure that it's reflecting um, the drivers that, that drive small fish density across the landscape. Um, so I just wanted to touch a little bit on some limitations that we have in building the AVA tool. Um, the big thing is that, you know, we need spatially explicit water depth and salinity information that reflects anticipa anticipated future conditions, which includes climate change, it includes operations, um, and it includes restoration structures. Um, so we can work with a lot of the three big hydrodynamic models in the Everglades, Eden, RSM, and Bisect, but each of them has some spatial and output limitations that really prevent us from using just one um, in the AVA tool. Um, and so one thing I just wanted to, to note is that some, some of these models don't go all the way down to the coast. Um, some of them don't have a really straightforward way of looking at climate change. Um, that's not just sea level rise, but also changes in temperatures and changes in rainfall. Um, and then there's also some models that don't have a very clear way of integrating water management operations. And so we have to really piecemeal things together from these models in order to get the ecological responses um, the predicted ecological responses that we need. And so um, we are currently in discussions with hydrologists. I have a meeting tomorrow with the developer of Bisect um, to figure out what we can do um, to get this information streamlined so that we can make our ecological models better. Um, with that, um, I would just like to say, if you need any other information about AVA, we have all of our publications on gem.gov slash modeling slash EVA. Um, I'd also like to make sure that I thank the whole project team for AVA. So it's not just me, it's a whole group of people that we work very hard um, to create this tool. And so I wanna acknowledge them. And I am happy to take questions if I have time. Yeah, I think we have time for a question or two. Uh, go ahead, Matt. 
So I'm glad to see you pushing the envelope on, on moving from, from data rich, but information poor to get to the useful and usable, both, both of those right part of the science discussion. For the BBC or analysis you mentioned that's coming up, where do those results go? Are they gonna end up in the environmental effects part of the puzzle analysis that Gina mentioned? It's gonna get written up in NEPA documentation? That might be a question for the core for Gina. Um, we are being asked by the core to run the scenarios through the AVA vegetation module, but I am not sure where, where that information is going, like which, which report or where it's going. <laughs> Yeah, so they're asking um, where, like, where the vegetation information that we're running for BBC -er is going. Like, if is it going into a report or? <laughs> it's okay. Gina Ralph, Corps of Engineers. So, the information that will be generated from the AVA tool, as well as all of the gem tools that we will use for the BBC -er and other CERT projects. They go into the environmental impacts statement. There is a section on um, environmental consequences um, of the action. And so we have an evaluation of the ecological effects of all of the alternatives. And so you'll see each one of the tools, you'll see the, a description of the tool, and then you'll see a comparison of the output among the different alternatives. Helen? Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, so when you show results of comparisons of vegetation classes, I can interpret that, I can understand it when I'm looking at it, and I can even um, vaguely understand and interpret a map of mangroves um, with different colours on it. But how do we interpret the vulnerability maps so those red maps when there is so much dark red mm -hmm. across them um what what does it mean what does what are the different colors mean and what exactly does vulnerability mean in this sense so in this context um vulnerability is measured as a distance from a state that the user defines and so we wanted to build flexibility into this tool to be able to have the ability to change what might be our ideal state. And so what it does is the user defines um, the outcomes that they prefer, and then it generates um, a couple thousand um, simulated sites to compare to based on those, um, based on those, those outcomes that the user wants. And then it uses an ordination process. So vulnerability is a distance from the state that you desire. And so a darker red is more distance from that state. So for the wading birds, is it like projected population size or what is it for? For the wading birds, it's currently just a, um, a level of foraging quality, foraging habitat quality. We would like to get to the population part, um, but we haven't been able to get there yet. Hey, Bill. Yeah, thank you for that. I want to applaud your efforts uh, reaching out to recover to try to get feedback on what's actually needed on the ground. Um, I'm curious in that effort if you had some uh, common themes that emerged in terms of when you're information gathering and if there were any surprises. Um, the most common theme that we got was that people really want more control over the visualization process. So they want sliders, they want buttons, they want to go back and forth between different layers. And so that's why we've decided to move towards this more dynamic approach, um, because I do think that that'll help people understand um, how the model is working um, and also to be able to look back, you know, okay, so what, what is this? um indicator doing what is that indicator doing and it's all in a common now a common um framework and so everything's on the same spatial scale everything's on the same annual temporal scale and so um i'm hoping that that will help with that um i haven't i can't say that there's anything that has surprised me yet but 
the social scientists are still working through that data analysis. So maybe there will be something that comes up. Phil. So thank you. I've looked at some of your papers, and but it's very helpful to have a high level overview. Um, I'm curious as to why you call this vulnerability, because to me, ecosystem vulnerability is essentially the lack of change of what's currently in the system as the drivers change underneath. So how stable in a sense is um, the current system, which is something completely different than your, what you're quantifying. Not that what you're quantifying is useful, but mm -hmm. in the context of a predicted model to achieve a certain goal, not what I would have called the vulnerability analysis. Yeah, and that's a valid criticism. Um, I think this has evolved a lot from the beginning. So it was called the vulnerability analysis at the beginning. And then it sort of, um, we realized that it was really hard to define what is vulnerable in the Everglades. Um, it's such a dynamic system. It changes all the time. There's so much variability that um, defining what is vulnerable was really hard. And so my approach was, okay, where do we want to be? And then define like whether we're there or not and how far away we are from that. And so that's the approach that I took. Thank you. Hmm. Go ahead, Casey. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation, which I really enjoyed. Um, I have two questions. The first is regarding the spatial distribution of the model and sort of a related question of how many parameters does the model have? And so is it, maybe that's enough. I'm just curious, you know, how you are, are you estimating parameters for every grid cell or yeah, tell me about, I'm just curious about how the spatial distribution works. And so it, it, the model is predicted across each grid cell. Um, and so each module has different amounts of inputs that go into it based on um, other. So I will say that Ava is not trying to develop new mechanisms or learn new knowledge about how the system works. We're taking what we know, how the system works and putting it into this common framework in order to get um, a more high level idea of what's going on. And so we know what impacts waiting bird foraging habitat. We know what impacts um, alligator nest presence. And so we build that into the network and then predict that across each grid cell. Okay, okay, got it. So it's a single model and it's distributed based on the inputs. From yes. Each of those cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, and then I was curious, how did you implement the sea level rise? So that sea level rise um, is actually, we combined, um, we looked at the bathtub inundation model and the um, core sea level rise calculator. And for each year, we looked at um, whether the, the, um, the sea level rise for that year would reach a certain cell based on its elevation and put that up as we went. Um, and so that's like something that we just did um, on our own. It's not how the alternatives are being set up in like BBC or anything like that, but um, that's how we approached it. Um, without any other information, so. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Laura. So uh, we're going to have another shift in the agenda so that we can make time for uh, our third session, have flexibility there. And so we're gonna move right to public comment. And this is where um, the uh, members of the public are given an opportunity to address the committee in, in a period of three minutes. And we have one, person who signed up today, and that's Newton Cook. You knew what these lights would do to my vertigo, you know how long a walk it was. <laughs> I'm Newton Cook. I'm the President of the United Waterfowlers, and I have a lot of hats. Uh, the National Forest for the state, I'm on the advisory commission. Uh, FWC, I'm on the deer management advisory, and several others. But what I want to talk to you today about is one I was on many years ago, and it was the Lake Okeechobee Rack for the South Florida Water Management District for about five years when the lake was destroyed by a couple of three hurricanes 
and why you do have a new dike today and why we're going into a new management plan. Now we talk today about things that might happen. Sea level rise, nothing we can do much about it. But I'm telling you right now, decisions have been made or are being made that are destroying Lake Okeechobee and the water coming out of Lake Okeechobee is going to be the dirtiest water you've ever seen in the history since SERP or anybody else. When the Losom was put together, the core, God bless them, and I know them all, friends of mine, the selection that they made, it said right there, not best for the lake ecology. The other selections didn't say anything about being bad for the lake ecology, but we selected the one that's the going to keep the lake too high, too long, too often, and we're down to less than 2,000 acres of SAV on a 450,000 acre lake. Guess what cleans the water going into Lake Okeechobee? Yes, that water is going to be dirtier when it comes out. Guess where it's going to go? Today, people are pushing buttons and pulling levers, maintaining the lake too high. Today, we're destroying the heart of the Everglades. Conscientiously made a decision. Why? I can tell you why. Politics. Not science. I love these meetings. I go to them when I have this group of people like this. These people are scientists. I happen to be a chemist way back, although I didn't do much of that. I didn't like standing at a bench. But I'm telling you, everything you do here today is being destroyed. As we said here, the lake is 15 and a half feet. At 15 feet, the vegetation starts dying. It's been over 15 feet for a month, two months, three months. It takes five years to recover. Cast the core, they'll tell you. They have a recover program. When was the last time the lake was under five-year recovery? Irma destroyed the lake, hasn't been fixed yet. That's six years ago. And we are sitting here allowing the heart of the Everglades to be destroyed. And all that water's got to go to the Everglades, to the Caloosahatchee, to the St. Lucie. And sooner or later, it will. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move, move into session three now. And this is session three's focus is strategies to better incorporate iTech in the SERP. And we're going to begin with a presentation from Jenna May of the US Army Corps of Engineers working with Recover. And this is the Southwest Florida Recover module. Just let me share my screen. Okay. Um, can I just get confirmation you can see my screen? Looks good. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, appreciate this opportunity. Um, and thank you committee for allowing me to come and speak about the Southwest Florida Recover module. Um, my name is Jenna May, I'm a biologist um, with Recover and um, I work with the core. And um, again, appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk to you about our, our newest Recover module. And so just an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, I wanted to give a little bit of background about the Southwest Florida module, uh, the justification for its development, and um, some of the, the things that we've been working on and plan to work on. And then because um, this is part of the indigenous uh, traditional ecological knowledge uh, session, I wanted to highlight 
um, some of the ways that we're working within the module to intentionally and authentically incorporate um, some of the tribal perspectives, values, and knowledge into our recover processes. And so um, just some background on exactly why we have recover modules in the first place. Um, our modules are uh, physiographic regions that provide us a system for organizing similar landscapes for the purposes of identifying restoration options and um, challenges. We currently have five recover modules, Lake Okeechobee, the Northern Estuaries, Greater Everglades, Southern Coastal Systems, and now the Southwest Florida module. Um, these modules, um, as I mentioned, because they allow us to organize these similar landscapes and processes, they really serve as the basis for our recover evaluation and assessments, which are used to support um, CERP and um, allow us to track it track it as we're going through the planning and implementation processes. And so some of the justification that went into uh, why we de decided to develop the Southwest Florida module now, um, I'm going to present some different reasons and they're not presented in any particular order. Um, but in general, uh, we recognize the need to systematize our um, application of knowledge to this part of the system. Um, the catalyst for a lot of the um, work that's been put towards developing this module came from um, a lot of our uh, stakeholders and partners, um, especially the tribes. They're very interested in projects occurring in uh, this part of the system, um, particularly Picayune Strand and uh, Western Everglades Restoration Project, which is currently in the planning phase. Um, and so because uh, we recognized the importance of this area, the importance of these projects um, that are online or, or in the process of coming online and, and planning, um, we really wanted to make sure that we had the recover framework set up um, in order to apply some of our recover processes um, in this area. Um, another reason why uh, we felt the module was needed um, was basically to take advantage of the opportunity to increase our extent of Everglades knowledge to um, this part of the system. Um, and so um, historically, uh, Recover has spent a lot of uh, more focus in the Ridge and Slough system, the eastern part of the system within the water conservation areas and down into the southern coastal system. Um, but uh, the Big Cypress uh, system, which is a separate um, watershed in the Big Cypress Basin, is a little different. So we couldn't just, in all cases, apply everything that we were learning from the Ridge and Slough system to this part of the system. Um, these, uh, although they're, you know, ecologically and hydrologically connected, um, the higher elevation of the western region. Um, creates a different kind of landscape. Uh, there's mosaics of cypress strands, uh, wet prairies and upland pine flatwoods. And so we warranted uh, these really key differences. And again, um, wanted to make sure that uh, we were understanding what was happening in the system as we're seeing um, some of these other uh, CERT projects come online. Um, with respect to our tribal partners um, in, within Recover, um, we really uh, understood that they saw this uh, development of the module as an opportunity to provide more focus to the region. And as I mentioned before, they're very invested in the CERT projects happening um, within this area. And so um, with, with the development of the new module, um, we've been trying to take a more intentional uh, uh, step at trying to involve, uh, get the tribal's, uh, tribe's perspectives um, folded into um, our valuation and assessment processes. And um, this is important because um, just from conversations that I've had and, and I've been a part of, um, I understand, you know, they really want to be uh, part of this restoration process. And so because Recover is the science arm of SERP, we're, um, providing the information that's informing a lot of the decision making um, by getting the tribe's uh, perspectives folded into um, our processes. Um, we can help to you know, 
build that trust and build that support um, for our CERT projects. And so what's included in the Southwest Florida module, this is just a map of, of what the boundaries are. Um, this was primarily informed by uh, two criteria. First uh, being that we wanted to make sure the areas that we were considering, um, there was some sort of CERP nexus or CERP connection. And so we've captured you know, the, the two larger CERP projects that are, cap that are happening in the area, uh, Picking Strand Restoration Project and WERP. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were considering the hydrologic connectivity as it relates to these projects. And so using the US Geological Survey um, hydrologic units as a guide to understand um, that connectivity and identify the, the sub watersheds. Um, we hone our, our focus into the areas that we wanted to, uh, to really look at within recover. And so what we have planned for the module. Um, so we have, uh, the module was approved by our recover leadership group back in November, 2021. And since then we have um, formed a module team, a group of um, subject matter experts and scientists to help us with pulling together a lot of the technical information that will support um, our evaluations and assessments. We figured out, you know, the spatial scope of the module. Um, we talked about and, and got on the same page, just shared understanding of what we um, uh, what SERP would look like and the restoration would look like within this, um, within this region and developed our restoration goals. Um, we have gone through the process similar to some of the other modules with their conceptual ecological models. Um, we have gone through the process of updating the Big Cypress conceptual ecological model, which is uh, what is applied to, to this module. Um, and really, in general, these conceptual ecological models, there are communication tools that capture our current understanding of the system. Um, they identify and describe uh, stressors and ecological linkages and biological attributes that SERP is designed to affect. And so they're really a foundational um, piece of how we figure out what we need to monitor and um, kind of capture our best understanding of, of, what, of how those different processes in the system um, are working. Um, and then we've also conducted a monitoring workshop that focused uh, primarily in the Southwest Florida region. And what we were really trying to understand was the different um, science and monitoring efforts happening um, in that area, understand what data would be available, um, opportunities to, to collaborate with other folks that are working in the area, meet those folks that are working in the area, and um, help to identify you know, what monitoring that this uh, uh, module would want to consider as we uh, continue to, to figure out uh, some of the foundational pieces of it. Next steps, we're going to uh, look at the uh, southwest coast, which is part of the module boundary, um, focusing on the mangrove estuary conceptual model um, that captures a lot of those um, coastal processes. So we'll be looking to update that with the most up-to-date knowledge uh, that we've collected over the last 20 years since that conceptual model was developed in the 2005 timeframe. We'll also look to develop hypothesis clusters and performance measures, which are key uh, for us to understand or, or determine what we exactly we need to be monitoring in order to best track CERT performance and inform uh, CERT planning. And then um, in terms of how uh, are we plan to continue to engage with our uh, tribal partners and, and members of, within Recover. Um, we're really, again, trying to incorporate them into that evaluation assessment process. That means um, including their principles and beliefs, uh, perspectives into those conceptual ecological models, the hypothesis clusters and performance measures. Um, Recover employs this applied science strategy where we um, sort of map, it sort of maps out how we uh, inform uh, CERT planning and implementation through the development, development of those conceptual models, performance measures, our monitoring, and then those uh, predictive evaluations. Um, so by incorporating some of the knowledge that the, the tribes, you know, want to, want to, you know, provide to us, um, when they want to provide it, how they want to provide it, um, we're hoping to, um, 
you know, better capture their interests um, and, and get them incorporated into the this restoration process. Um, and then one other uh, point I wanted to make was just as we fold them into this process more intentionally, um, being more cognizant of, of their processes and practices to make sure that's done in a respectful way, allowing them to take the lead and share with us um, whatever they, they want to share with us. Um, and so um, with that, uh, thank you for your time and um, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Jenna. Uh, we have time for a quick question. Is that any? Go ahead, Casey. Oh, sorry. Oh, Kate, Kate, Casey's a revenant. Any other question? Okay, thanks. Great presentation, Jenna. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to move to the iTech panel. Um, the stop is listed as 345, but we're going to extend that is needed. So, um, but we thought we wanted to go into this last panel, giving people a chance to, to get a little refreshment before. Uh, so we'll see you back here in five minutes. Thanks very much. So, so perhaps we can begin by having Phyllis, Armando, and Cindy introduce themselves because I don't think they've had a chance to yet. Sure. I'll start on you. Please, ladies. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Phyllis Klarman. I'm a senior scientist in the Applied Sciences Bureau with the South Florida Winter Management District. I work with Fred and um, others on his team. And I'm Gina's counterpart at the Water Management District as Recover Program Manager. So thanks for um, inviting me to be here today. Good afternoon, my name is Cindy Thomas. I'm the tribal liaison for the Jacksonville District Corps of Engineers. Well, let, let's hear to Armando and then- Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry. Good afternoon, and thank you. Good to see you all again. Armando Ramirez, I'm, I work with the South Florida Water Management District. I'm the tribal and federal affairs liaison for the district. Thanks Armando. And now Kevin, we're gonna turn it over to you for opening remarks. Well, thank you. And good afternoon again, everybody. It's really nice to see you. I recognize it's been another long, hard fought, data heavy presentation uh, driven PowerPoint meeting. Okay. So I'm hoping that even here at the end of the day, that um, you got enough mental strength and stamina to hopefully engage in what is uh, what I intend uh, to be an objective, open, and honest conversation. Now, I first want to thank uh, all of you again for taking your time yesterday uh, to tour Mikasuki lands. Um, I want to acknowledge I've got uh, members of my team here today in the audience who were part of that. And I also want to acknowledge Ms. Betty Osceola, who is in the audience today. And to remind you all the things that I'm going to offer or share with you, uh, I'm doing so in my most sincere um, manner to bring forward uh, issues of concern from the tribe. I am not a tribal member, in case you all didn't necessarily guess, but I wanted to say that, okay? And so um, I am not explicitly speaking for any individual tribal member. I am speaking from a place of the knowledge that has been imparted upon me and the direction received um, from the Business Council and from the Everglades Advisory Committee, of which Miss Betty is a member and helps to advise uh, myself and the members of the Miccosukee Environmental Protection Agency. That all being said, um, I really appreciate that Stephanie worked with me on this because initially her, um, her invitation was that I come up and, and speak to you on my own about how to incorporate IK or indigenous knowledge into CERT. And this is something that I've been thinking about for two years um, since 
the office of the White House issued a memorandum saying indigenous knowledge should be considered uh, in federal decision-making processes. Very, very simply said up front and top, top heavy, not in the, in the weeds or details. Um, I thought about this a lot when the invitation came to address you today. And I thought that it maybe wouldn't be as valuable for me to come up here and speak with you. I think what needs to happen, and, and the folks who are here at this table are a testament to it, is that in order for indigenous knowledge to be considered, it needs to be a two-way conversation between tribes and the federal agencies, state agencies, stakeholder partners, general public, who are all involved in Everglades restoration, who all have a personal stake, a professional stake, and otherwise in Everglades restoration. It's not enough for me to come up and say how things should be. I want to have a conversation about this that gives opportunity for different ideas, for, I, for, for people who are in support of this, and to hear some of the criticisms or some of the potential reasons why indigenous knowledge uh, cannot or should not be incorporated in federal decision process making. And we're speaking very specifically here with respect to SERP, which is a federal process here, right? And so I had suggested to Stephanie uh, a list of folks with whom I've worked with. Um, some that I know have direct experience working with the tribes here in Florida. Um, and I hope that I was going to be able to capture that spectrum of, well, positive and, and critical conversation, okay? So that's why um, I wanted this to be more of a panel discussion. I wanted to involve all of you, obviously, at the forefront of this, because in your roles as CISREP committee members and what you're going to be writing up in terms of your recommendations going forward for how folks here at this table are going to be expected to move forward with CERP planning uh, and implementation. I feel that you have an, an extremely important role and an extremely important opportunity to help all of us here to come to a place and be an example. Being an example here within the United States of how and where federal decision processes and, and decision making can incorporate indigenous knowledge in a way that is substantive and works. That's my sincere desire and intention, and that for which I feel that I'll be best doing my job to allow the Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida to have that voice, that seat at the table, and that degree of acknowledgement and respect that is deserved for all of these well-intentioned efforts to make improvements, to make restoration work, to to borrow again from Miss Betty's words, to allow the land to heal. And so um, I wanna start off by first saying, and then I, I, again, thank you, Stephanie, for giving me a chance just to make some opening remarks and I'm trying to be very directed here. Um, I think that it's very difficult for a lot of folks to understand or contend with what the notion of indigenous knowledge is. I can understand that, okay? Um, I've worked in and around here in South Florida within Everglades Restoration for over 20 years. I've spent time working with and within state agencies, including time at the Water Management District under uh, Fred's direction and leadership. And so having been on the other side and understanding to the degree with which um, science professionals, policy professionals and advocates, um, how they are going about their business is of course valid. 
it is based in the scientific method, right? The process by which we are seeking to obtain knowledge. And we've heard that word said a lot here, in particular this afternoon, knowledge. There are plenty of ways that we all acquire knowledge in our lives, okay? Professionally, uh, as scientists, we are acquiring knowledge by a specific method, a robust, a reproducible, a peer-reviewed, and validated method. That's why it is supposed to be leading the efforts here when we're talking about CERT, the largest effort to, uh, to perform restoration on an ecosystem like the Florida Everglades in all of its complexity, in all of its diversity, and with all of its challenges. Of course, science has to be the leading way or the leading knowledge base with which we proceed. But getting back to my point, there are different ways that we obtain knowledge, we share knowledge. All of us have had that experience as human beings. We learn things in our lives every single day. We learn by things we see, by things we feel, by things we taste. You don't need somebody, you don't need a panel of scientists and a peer reviewed paper to tell you when you put your hand on a hot stove as a child, that that's a bad thing. You learn that pretty quick. Now you've got that knowledge, your experiences, the things that cause you pain, the things that cause you elation. These are the things that we acquire in our lives and produce wisdom. Wisdom is an accumulation of knowledge from different sources. Knowledge you learn in books, knowledge you learn every day in your experiences, and knowledge that you proceed from in a scientific manner in a lot of cases for a lot of us. One of those ways of knowledge is through indigenous people's experiences where through their lives, through their uh, abilities uh, or through their livelihoods of being in a place, gathering information, making observations, trying to understand status and trends of the resources and the land around them, making predictions about how things are going to change, continuing to evolve and question as their surroundings change. These are not matters of academia. These are not matters of applied science or purpose. These are matters of life and death. And I put forward here that indigenous knowledge, learned, refined, evolved, added to, and passed down generationally is every bit as valid uh, a knowledge base and a method that is analogous, in my opinion, to the scientific method. Now, I don't wanna get too far in the weeds and debate one knowledge base versus another. We're here to talk about where we have opportunity to try and bring them together. And that's where I want to engage with the science professionals here, the folks who are in position to help uh, put forward consensus uh, positions for decision-making processes. And for all of you to hopefully ask questions that you need to ask in order that you can do your jobs and provide the best level of recommendation to help all of us chart a new course and continue to work together. So I'm gonna stop here. I would love an opportunity for anybody here at the table to make similar statements. I don't want anybody to be afraid. I'm not gonna be, nobody's getting judged or, or, or you know, nobody's gonna be harassed or, or losing a job over this. That's why I want this to be open and honest. All right, so I will turn it over. love the opportunity as it were to say this um did i interrupt you no no it's okay i can i can pause no we're I oh nice look at this <laughs> oh <laughs> you give me a lot to think about there I'll, I'll i'll throw one small example of just how new to the process we are here and then kind of explain what i'm feeling 
about this in a moment. So uh, we've been using iTech, I-T-E-K in the explanation for some time. And just now we shortened that to I-K. It happened to me, I don't know, five minutes ago. Uh, this feels very much, um, well, let me first off say, Sav Eric Samuel, the National Park Service, and I've been doing this for about 20 years, and I'm fairly well known for being able to stand in front of a crowd and talk comfortably to people, um, tell good stories about the science and the language that most people don't understand and recognize that we're passionate about what we do. And I don't get too nervous in those situations, but I do when I'm speaking with the tribes. Um, and it comes from respect. It comes from really deep respect. I feel that it is a privilege to get the opportunity to learn from and uh, feel fairly new at the table. Um, in the Park Service, we talk about being in the forever business. You know, we're looking at preserve and protect these spaces unimpaired for future generations. We're proud of our 100 year history, 100 years, you know, and looking generationally into the future. And you, and you look at what the tribal knowledge brings to the table. It's, um, it's humbling. It's a, it's a different scale than what we've been working on for a very long time. It's also gonna take real work. We do strongly hold to the scientific technical approach to our work. We uh, quants, as we like to call ourselves in some of the groups that do all the numbers along the way in the modeling. We like the fact that it's so transparent and so reproducible and there's this uh, unique pull it back to the math and find a solution, but to pull it back to uh, generations of knowledge being shared. And in some cases being shared in terms of a direction to go without necessarily giving us all the details behind that. Uh, that also takes a good bit of relationship building with us. We have to spend our time to get to know each other and learn to trust each other. Um, and we've had enough problems in that latter category for all of us. So I think that uh, this is a really, really big opportunity. And I'll throw one last item down. There's been a couple of mentions just now in the opening and earlier today about the scale of this being pretty phenomenal on the planet and being these opportunities in the United States. Um, working SERP and working Everglades National Park, we have to recall that we are also World Heritage Sites. So the, the types of things that we do here that influence the outcomes, the conditions in a World Heritage Site are establishing some standards that are recognized around the globe. So this opportunity is uh, really precedent set really phenomenally important. Um, and again, I'll say humbling to be at the table even to have the opportunity. So I thank you, I thank the tribe. Okay, I got it. So I, I'm, I think one of the people that Kevin identified as one of the scientists with concerns about indigenous knowledge. So I am not as good off the top of my head as Kevin. So I had to write it out. Mother Earth grows our planet, our plants where soil, light, and water come together. We all know that the foundational vegetation of any wetland is based on the organic sediments derived from the plants themselves and the inorganic sediments leached from the Earth's crust. But we also know that man can play a pivotal role in either creating an ecological disaster or sustaining ecological harmony. Most, but not all, of the indigenous populations of the Western Hemisphere have known for thousands of years how to sustain ecological harmony. The current economic systems of the world are only now beginning to realize that the ecosystems of the world are out of balance and nowhere is it more concerning after we consider the CO2 problem than in our aquatic systems. In the Everglades, we are faced with a terrible paradox. How does one restore the wading birds, the fish, and the foundational vegetation in a system that has been sequentially drained oxidized, flooded, and drowned over the last 150 years. America's indigenous populations know that the Western civilization must adopt sustainable practices. Landscape and wet 
and watershed ecologists have been preaching this for decades. However, sustainability does not mean sitting back and letting nature do its thing. It means working with nature. What was sustainable practices 200 years ago may not be applicable today as groundwater is diverted east to supply water to an increasing coastal population, as nutrients must be processed by STAs before entering the Everglades, and as climate change creates new ecological and biological trajectories. Western civilization needs to understand the scope and scale of indigenous influences on the land. For example, how was fire used? What was the waste disposal practices? Will a multitude of tree island types and elevations sustain the ecological foundation, foundational vegetation? Recent studies in the Amazonian reveal that the current dark earth fertile soils used by modern and indigenous agricultural sediments are largely due to the, I quote, deliberate enrichment of low fertility tropical soils through the deposit of household food waste by indigenous communities. Did such practices also evolve in the Everglades? If so, does this help to explain the diversity of relative tree island elevations in the Everglades? I thought it would be interesting to ask if the chat GPT AI app could answer some of these questions. And I found that no matter how I asked the questions, the answers were all the same. I quote, I quote an AI, I cannot provide specific ITEK about the flora and fauna of the Everglades for restoration. However, these six points are crucial. And I think that these, these are the six points that I thought Kevin would say, which he has been saying for a long time. One, TEK is a cumulative knowledge of indigenous community interactions with the environment. Check. Indigen indigenous communities have often demonstrated sustainable practices for managing ecosystems. Check. Indigenous communities possess extensive knowledge about plants and their traditional uses. Absolutely. The, the restoration of the Everglades should respect and incorporate indigenous cultural values and practices. Absolutely. Engaging indigenous communities as active partners and stakeholders in restoration projects should be based on mutual respect and trust, a key point which Kevin brought out and Eric just brought out. And indigenous knowledge can be shared through education and programs and outreach activities. Indeed, these six points are crucial, but they really do not educate the Western scientific and engineering communities to a level that might be operational. We need help. An educational masterpiece that has become required reading through the Department of Interior in Washington, DC is the book, Braiding Sweetgrass by plant biologist and citizen of the Potawatomi Nation, Robin Wall Kimmer. This book points out the many paths for collaboration and understanding. Potawatomi? Yeah. Is that in Michigan? That's how you know that. <laughs> Don't think I'm that narrow-minded. Okay. Ooh. It's late in the afternoon. Oh, my God. <laughs> Her point, well, um, there are many pearls of wisdom in this book. One I really like says, science can be a way of forming intimacy and respect with other species that is rivaled only by the observation of traditional knowledge holders. So in response to the three questions that Sershop gave us, I'll, I'll be brief. Number one, describe a specific example of an effort to engage Mikosuke in seminal traditional knowledge. The answer to that is in an attempt to prevent the spread of laurel will disease across the Everglades, killing red bay trees, there was a discussion of pesticides in the introduction of an insect predator. ITEK said, no, thank you. ITEK and genetics 
combined teaches us eventually that there will be red bays that survive and their resistance will propagate the next cohort. Second question, looking forward, what best practices uh, could strengthen the capacity to include ITEK with CERP processes? And my answer for that is, from a scientific perspective, it would be great if we all could agree on a way to measure and implement a comprehensive tree island elevation change monitoring program. Number three, because the SERP is pivoting from planning to operation, how could ITEK be useful for adaptive management? And my answer, it, it, our, my recommendation is understanding places and times when controlled burns of the Everglades can be most effective and when practices can be used to prevent tree islands from naturally subsiding, which they are. Kevin, are we good? So far. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Um, I must admit that was, not a, it's, that was not quite the route that I thought you would go, but I do appreciate those comments and um, pausing me to, to think about how to respond. Um, I would say that as we're, you know, one of the things that, that we, we do in science and, and, and certainly within all of the discussion of procedure and policy is there is a lot of box checking, right? We got to check boxes for this in order to verify and, and, and do this and, and, and move on to the next thing where we are going to verify and go on from there. And there's a lot of great discussion about adaptive management. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure that there are a lot of great solutions as of right now, um, but I want to hone in on, on this as a way of, of continuing on, on this whole box checking thing where IK, ITech, there are a lot of different definitions. Maybe that's kind of part of the problem first. Is we need to speak together in languages or the same language so that we can be actively, effectively communicating. And at the same time, there is a, a, a parallel here in that the expectation is that the indigenous knowledge has to somewhat adapt or adopt some of the Western manners of doing that. Obviously, we don't speak the Miccosukee or Seminole languages, okay? And we're all here being um, educated in, in Western-based systems. So I think where the tribe would agree is needed is that we speak to each other on a way that lends more to the tribe coming to the Western side of how to at least approach this. Okay, now let's be clear on that one. Secondly, we all know here and follow how science is performed, how um, questions are asked, hypotheses are tested. You've got your experimental design, you collect your data, you analyze that data, interpret that data, and debate that data amongst your peers, and then go to publish it in another peer-reviewed process. So this is a process by which we accredit that information now and call it knowledge, subject to you know, further knowledge that comes down the road where we may have to rethink what our current knowledge is. And so I think there's an opportunity here to give an example of where the Miccosukee tribe feels that IK could intersect and synthesize with Western-based science because we have a recent example of where we did this very um, process um, with a letter that went out to the federal agencies about the operations of the S-12A and B gates, something that the Miccosukee tribe has been advocating for different operational um, action on these gates for decades. And for which, as you're all aware from the adaptive management discussions today, there is an incredible amount of process 
that goes into making any sorts of changes when we're talking about operations and when we have endangered species and when we've got other myriad concerns, you name it, put it on in there. So what the tribe sought to do is to make a case and share why the tribe um, wants this and the knowledge by which the tribe is putting forward from history, from understanding of the area, from understanding of the, the status and the trends of the prey base, the wading birds, the other wildlife that have been responsive in a negative way to dehydrating the Western part of the greater Everglades and Big Cypress Basin, okay? And the manner that we did this is we went to the information holders, the members of the Everglades Advisory Committee who are, please forgive me, Miss Betty is not quite there yet, but generally made up of tribal elders who are keepers of knowledge. They discussed back and forth, they debated, and then they shared that knowledge by way of written statements that were internally vetted amongst all of us. That information was then taken and it was compiled and exerted, exerted properly for proper context. And on the science side, tribal scientists also consider this information to ensure that there was going to be a degree of agreement about what the, the ecological knowledge that was being shared from the Everglades Advisory Committee was not, for example, directly um, contradictory to what our current understanding of the system is based on the science. Okay. That information then was taken back to those knowledge holders and said, for peer review. So this is the second level of peer review and say, is this capturing what you want to say? Because we've put some extra comments in here from us as your technical staff, we're here to serve you. How does this all look? And that peer review process comes to its conclusion. Then it gets passed on for tribal leadership. The tribal leadership considers this and signs off on it. And at that point, that knowledge is now ready to be shared and has gone through a rigorous process by which the knowledge holders have their opportunity to put forward the information that has been gathered, that has been obtained, that has been passed on. That information is vetted amongst a technical team as well. It is then re-peer reviewed by the knowledge holders and then further peer reviewed by the tribal leadership, all of which are checking the boxes that the, uh, the subsequent direction from the Office of Science and Technology uh, Planning, as well as the Council on Environmental Quality and the DOI, Department of Interior, have since published after that initial White House memo in order to try and provide some guardrails by which indigenous knowledge could be considered. And in a way that it is provided um, with a level of verification, consensus and peer review, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I say all of this with the very important notion that indigenous knowledge should not be subjugated to Western knowledge, okay? Should not be dominated by that Western knowledge. But there's always the, there's always the um, barrier that this kind of knowledge can be considered not science or junk science or the ramblings of people who don't know what they're talking about. Miccosukee tribe is seeking to use its information or bring forward the information from the tribe not to be in, uh, um, in direct, um, uh, not, not, not to be going against the grain, not to be contradicting, not to be saying, you know, 
The sky is blue. No, it's not. It's, it's yellow. The tribe is seeking to bring forward this information in order to help guide and fill in some of the information gaps and to enhance the body of knowledge that has been acquired here over the last couple of decades by folks here at this table and by all of the work that's seemingly going to be coming down the road over the next many decades. So let's be clear, this is not to be um, against anything. The tribe is a partner in Everglades restoration and the tribe wants its knowledge to be utilized for the greater good. I'm gonna hold off there. I wanna obviously give chances for people to speak. I'd just like to take a, a pause and, and uh, see if our committee has any questions for, uh, for the panelists at this time. Thanks, Jim. I actually just wanna take a deep breath and digest the comments that have been made here already. Um, this is already, I think, an extremely productive conversation and, um, and very informative for the committee. And I wanna thank you for that. I wanna thank every one of you for being up there and for being willing to share um, with a good heart and with a good mind, the work that you've been doing what you have encountered that is uh, challenging and productive uh, in this effort to include IK. Thank you so much, Kevin, for liberating us from the label of iTech. I don't know who came up with that, but <laughs> I used to be a Fed and they didn't ask me when I came up with that label. Um, uh, so I don't wanna stop the conversation unless it stops on its own. Um, and if it stops on its own, then let's go back to these, these questions. And, and I also wanna say that um, while everybody looked at me on the committee, um, we have a subgroup on this topic. It was people who stepped forward and said, I'm interested in this, I want to work on it. And that subgroup, makes up approximately a third of the full committee. So that gives you some idea of how, um, how important it is to the committee in, in this 10th biennial review. So with that, I carry on. First of all, so, no, I, I would just, I hate to say this, but Jennifer and I have to leave it for. So I just want to um, just provide a, a really quick response to some of the questions that the panel had asked with regard to indigenous knowledge and how we're applying that through the recover process. Um, and here I'm speaking as the recover program manager and Phyllis, please feel free to, to add. Um, but if we can look back to the graphic that Jenna had put up with regard to SERP's applied science strategy, the very first box is societal values. What is important to society? And when you look at the makeup, the composition of Recover, it's 10 federal and state agencies and two tribes. So we are in the process, or we have always been in the process of consensus building and listening to all voices as we develop our performance measures. With the Western Everglades module uh, that Jenna spoke about, we are now in the process of developing performance measures, refining conceptual ecological models, and looking to thoughtfully engage the tribes to bring to the table the indigenous knowledge that they are prepared to share through whatever process each tribe has uh, you know, in their own um, tribal councils to bring that information to the table and share as appropriate with the group. Um, and to give an example of what we did when I first joined the Corps of Engineers back in 2009 with the Everglades Restoration Transition Plan, we were with Cindy um, talking to the Seminole Tribe of Oklahoma and the Seminole Tribe of Oklahoma had some native plants that were very uh, 
specific to their cultural practices, very important to that tribe. We didn't ask the names of the plants. We simply asked, where did they live? How can we figure out a surrogate to protect the environment in which they live by not altering the hydrology so that it affected that environment? And one way I see moving forward, acknowledging it's going to be challenging. There's going to be a lot of conversations that have to be had, a lot of Western science meeting up with the traditional knowledge to pull together something that makes sense in order to, again, protect something that's of importance to the tribe and to society as a whole. And so just wanted to share that briefly before we rudely leave at four o'clock. Um, so thank you. And Cindy, thank you for the letting me go first. No worries. Um, what time is it now? By what? Quarter of it. Okay. So I wanted to say this, um, and this goes back to, to what you were saying about recover and what you were saying earlier, Kevin, but I wanted to address this um, with Gina. Um, so whenever I first got here, I didn't really understand what recover was. That was three years ago. Well, the second time I got here. Um, and so Gina explained it this way. She said, it's pretty much all the agencies take their agency hats off and they put on their scientist hats and they are scientists. And that's, they're not necessarily representing an agency. Well, now with the IK um, for the, for the representative, representatives that are you know from the tribes they're now going to have to wear two hats because they're going to have to be a scientist and they're also going to have to represent the tribe so one thing this you know we need to figure out is how do we know or it needs to be announced somehow on when kevin you are or anybody representing whatever tribe is representing the tribe or are you being the scientist during the recover meetings? I think that's one thing I'm seeing as a, as a something we need to work out. Um, another thing, first of all, regarding the definitions, Kevin, you and I have already started that conversation a little bit and absolutely we need to come up with definitions and that's gonna be the hardest, I think, normally it's the hardest part of the entire conversation because everybody's got their own ideas I guess um we do need to work towards that now for the small print um so last week I went to Missouri and met with we have a tr tribal community of practice um it's put on by the headquarters uh tribal liaison and all the tribal liaisons within the nation come and meet there and for a week, and um, we discuss topics that are at hand. And in this specific one, um, I'm like, where's when are we going to get the implementing um, guidance from headquarters on how to incorporate IK into everything you say? Normally, whenever we get a policy or a memo or something like that, we get that from headquarters. It comes down. Normally, it takes about a year. And so I've been telling both tribes, we don't have it yet, guys. We don't have it yet, guys. Well, found out yes or last week that we're not going to get it. Um, so um, they are going to have some type of language in the up and coming tribal consultation policy that's being updated by the Assistant Secretary of the Army's Office of Civil Works. Um, probably sometime in November. They want to have it the final done. Right now, if it's, it's in draft form, we haven't seen it, but the tribes have. So um, the final is supposed to come out before the White House's tribal summit that occurs in November. That's what their goal is. So supposedly there's going to be some type of language in there regarding IK. And they're also going to have what they're calling best practices, which is sort of like what they're thinking of is going to be our guidance. So we're looking forward to getting that. In the meantime, um, I don't know, six months ago, at least with a Seminole tribe, I started, um, we started having discussions about having 
groups um, or meetings to start the discussions about indigenous knowledge. I wanted to know from the tribe's perspective and both tribes actually, when have y'all, if y'all have ever provided IK to the Corps of Engineers and it was not either A, utilized or B, you did not receive a response on why it wasn't utilized. Um, I think that's important because that's going to let us know, hey, where have we fallen short and been, you know, falling short on things? Because sometimes you can't learn until you fail, right? Um, I want to set up those working groups. I would like it for, first of all, to come together as for SERP specific, but you got to understand we've got regulatory, we've got MILCON, we've, we've got other divisions within the core that we've got to think about too, but for SERP specific to have our non-federal cost share partner and those staff, as well as the tribes and recover and all those other people that, you know, have worked with the tribes um, to sit down and have a workshop, multiple workshops and start working through the bare bones, the, the skeleton, if you will, of how this is gonna look and then start diving into the details. And it's gonna take time. Um, but during those conversations, we can talk about where we have fallen short because I don't doubt we have, have well, I'm sorry. I don't doubt that we have not. Another thing that has crossed my mind is a problem that I see and I brought this up during the tribal community of practice meeting is the core. So, okay. The core has a cost, uh, cost engineering center of expertise in Walla Walla. Um, they're the ones that come up with the numbers um, for project cost. And we've got to get them involved. We got to figure out how do we calculate project benefits, not only in the number signs, right? but also in habitat units or whatever the scientists do, you guys know more about this than I do. Um, we got to figure out how to do that. Um, so we've got to bring those groups in to have those conversations. There's a lot that has to be done. It's not going to be easy, but we can get there together, right? Um, yet another issue I see, or not issue, opportunity I see is, um, IK is also cultural resources, the archeology. span um, I do know, I did find out today that, um, so I'm gonna have to read my notes here this morning, uh, which it might've come out two days ago. I haven't checked my email in forever. Um, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's Office of Tribal and Indigenous Peoples um, is currently working on a definition of IK for them. So the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation, if you guys don't know, they are an advisory council to all federal agencies. All federal agencies give them a little pot of money um, and they advise us on how to comply with the National Historic Preservation Act and implementing regulations section 106, um, CFR 800, 36, 800. Um, so anyway, and they're also working to develop means to explain the role of IK in all four steps of the National Historic Preservation Act Section 106 process. So most CERT projects, not most, a lot of CERT projects, now that we have the smart planning, the three by three by three process, um, fall, we're not able to complete section 106 within that three year time frame and with that low budget. So we have to go and what they call a pro or develop a programmatic agreement. Um, saying that, hey, once we get into the planning and design phase, that's when we're gonna complete that. You know, we're not gonna have 106 completed by the time NEPA is done, we're gonna complete it during the planning and design phase. Um, so, this definition and, and, and this how IK is going to roll up into 106 is going to help us is going to come out before hopefully we get into deep into the section 106 compliance part we're already in it on sub I get that um the central Everglades planning project um 
but at least we'll be there uh, should work be authorized um, and, and appropriated. So the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation is also developing policy statement to further inform how IK um, should be integrated into the 106 process. Uh, okay. It's also gonna build on the White House's guidance that was provided in November, 2022. Um, oh, one other thing. So, Lots of these projects, especially when in some instances, sometimes SEP or SERP projects have to also have a regulatory permit. Um, we also have to figure out how IK is gonna be utilized um, as part of the regulatory process, as part of the permitting process. So there's a lot we've got to work on. It isn't just civil works. It just isn't constructing the project or planning the project. It is everything. I think the, aside from all of the process components involved in federal processes, you know, all of that, I think the, at the heart of it, the tribe's desire to have IK synthesized with Western science in a more comprehensive level of parity and, and respectful manner is to help ensure that uh, that vision of a holistic restoration that can provide for a resilient and robust ecosystem replete with all of the components of that ecosystem, the wildlife, the plant communities, all of the, and all of that are cultural resources, all of that, that factors into the ability for tribes to continue their culture and their tradition. If we can incorporate that in a way that satisfies the tribes, guess what? We're going to achieve CERP success for all of us, 16 million plus who live in South Florida and beyond, and who come here for the opportunity to experience these resources here in Florida. These needs are not exclusive, they're the same. And to provide a degree of information that can help set those targets, can help assess how we're doing in terms of all of the dirt turning and canals and levees being degraded and 15 new pump stations for BB Sear and et cetera, et cetera. How are we really doing? Well, there's a lot of knowledge that can help us make those determinations in a scientific way. That's what the objective is, not to protect, right? to protect core processes with all due respect to section 106, okay? It's much, much bigger than that. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, it's, I just didn't want everybody to think that it's just science, right? Safe travels, guys. Um, one thing that we have recently done, um, went down a lot of rabbit holes to get there. And I have been pushing hard, very hard, um, even at the ASA's level, to try to get some kind of um, way, easy way, that we can go to Kevin, go to the Miccosukee tribe, go to the Seminole tribe and be like, hey guys, we want to uh, contract you to do monitoring prior to adaptive management. Um, right now there is a, right now there is an authority that if we had, if all this was occurring on core property, we could do it in a heartbeat, but it's mostly on, on state lands, right? Um, it's not on property that we manage or we own. So what we did find out is we did finally 
find a contracting mechanism that we can use. We are working with um, Dr. Craig Vanderheiden with the um, Miccosukee tribe to get that in place um, for, I do believe, invasive species monitoring for SUP. Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from Craig. Um, hopefully that is going to be finalized or finished or that contract's gonna be let to you guys by the end of this um, calendar year, um, all fingers crossed. And the way we're gonna do it um, is we are going to hopefully have that um, ability to keep adding to that and extending that contract because who better knows the land than the people that's lived on it for ever, right? Um, to do the monitoring, to know where to monitor, what is normal, what isn't normal, and in those areas. So we're getting there. Um, we're just having to find, think outside the box in a lot of ways to find out how we can work with the system we currently have and beg and plead to change, you know, to make adjustments, you know, in the future, but, but how do we get it now? So I'll throw one small thought in there along the way on this. So we've started having some meetings talking about brass tacks of how, you know, how do we really interact with the tribes? And uh, we started some smaller meetings to initially just say, are we, we're here together? Are we really working together? Is this, this is this a thing that we're going to be doing and doing better and start that. Um, and then my phone rings and I get phone calls and it's the technical stuff that he was, he was talking about. So you'll have the, the, a lot of structure going on inside the tribe with the review processes that we were talking about. There was a lot of structure inside the core um, at our ends. And sometimes I feel that we might not be working with the kind of the, the broad bench that some of our partners have, but um, my phone rings and I'll have people call and ask the question, do you have, you know, survey grade GPS equipment? Um, who should I be talking to in your fire management so we can coordinate on fire management efforts? Uh, or I'll make that phone call that says, hey, we've got visitors coming into town on an event and we'd like to spend some time, you know, together. So maybe we're going to coordinate on airboats or something of that nature and try to get a fueled event going that works. So some of these, these smaller efforts, I think, are really probably right now a core of how we're developing that relationship and getting familiarity with the names and the faces and the skills that each brings to the table. And so I think that um, on a small way, that's, that's the base. That's where you're, you know, that's the first nail that you're putting in to try to bring these things together. That's, that's my take on it. And I'm, again, I was reminded to be responsive to what we were trying to get at here. So hopefully that helps. <laughs> Phyllis and Armando, you know, I don't <laughs> yes, get to no, leave I'm, you out. You might, you might want to be left out, but no, I don't want to leave you not out. Not at all. If you anything, you will <laughs> have probably learn from me, and I, I know the tribe has too. Is you know, I'm very attentive, very patient. I I listen a lot because if I have learned something from the tribe me members is to listen. Um, uh, a lot has been said, and obviously, you more than verse on. The processes you've been talking all day about it and how intricate and difficult it is so this is not going to be a small feat it's a it's a uh it's challenging because it's culturally very different uh, you know ik is not in competition with science if be anything ik is the challenge is for us to find that linkages between the two and you know enhance each other um, but no it, it's been interesting to hear what everything that has been said um my experience with the tri has been for many years now uh both tries and i can tell you that from both tribes there's some differences and that's even more challenging mm -hmm. uh, agree i i certainly never would pretend to speak about ik unless i think kevin alluded to it at the beginning you know you learn it from tribal members uh, and that's the part that we at the district at the state level 
we have different approaches to it as well. The federal government is bound by the trust responsibility and government to government. The state does not. The state tries to build a relationship with the tribe and coordinates with the tribe. Uh, but one thing that has got to be clear too is that at the end of the day, when the projects are completed, the district is the one that manages them, operates them, and maintains them. Uh, so the district has to be an intricate part of this discussion all along. It cannot be at the end of the day. Uh, but I, I like Fred, had prepared. Also, I write my speech, not a speech. I, I, the difference between the two of us when we shared them was he wrote more, more of a speech and I just keep my notes. Uh, um, and interested enough, we were very close on the notes. But uh, no, there's uh, several examples and, and if we can jump on the questions, that's good. Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here, uh, to hear the message from the tribe through Kevin. And uh, again, I'll thank you. And I would like the note, the questions or the answers that you had. Um, I would like if I could get those from you or maybe you can be in the working group sure. because I mean, it's gonna take everybody to get it right and we're still gonna get it wrong and we're gonna have to go back to it. I mean, that's just the way it is because we are, you know. Yeah, I, I just think that a lot of it has to be a significant level of respect. It's a delicate matter just even for, even for Betty, it's a delicate and very close to their heart because it's something that it's not shareable through tradition. And again, we're accustomed to all this paper uh, and the tribe is more, you know, the storytelling basically. When I started this job, I, I found myself in this difficult time to kind of follow up and understand because when I would listen to their chairman or the vice chair or an elder, there was, they will start with a story and it was lengthy. And if you weren't concentrated and listening to it, you knew that at the end, they will come back to what you were looking for. That's one thing that needs to be patience. And uh, it's a different way of understanding or looking at things. Where I come from, it's very much like that, so. Kevin, so um, Gina had to leave, but my reason for being on this panel is, um, again, I'm a program manager for Recover at the South Florida Water Management District. Um, and my involvement up here today is not because of my breadth of experience in this topic. And so when I looked across the panel and saw all the folks I was talking with first, just want to acknowledge the level of expertise here. But then I was also wondering, looking at the panel discussion, potential strategies to incorporate IK into SERP, I'm thinking like, how far can we get into that conversation with a panel of mostly white, non-Indigenous people? And so um, I just wanted to, to recognize that it, at my in my role in Recover, I've been talking with Gina a lot, and then Gina and I have also been talking with Cindy and Armando about um, the, the learning curve that we have in, in figuring out how to engage with the tribes better, because in, in my mind, we need to hear from them um, ways that Recover can do better. We have uh, both tribes uh, representatives um, on our Recover leadership group, which again is recovers made up of 10 federal state agencies and the two tribes. Um, and up until like in 2018, I think, um, th there was a period of time where the Recover leadership group didn't even meet for over a year. And so Gina and I tried to get us back on track with having regular meetings. And, and then we started to engage with Kevin and previously Jean Duncan. Um, on wanting to bring them back into the fold in a, in a meaningful way. And uh, me 
my professional experience is in um, urbanized estuaries in the northern end of the system. So I'm already learning so much about the Everglades itself, but then to this other facet of it, I'm learning so much and I was able to finally get for the first time onto into water conservation area 3A with a field trip that Craig at Vander Heiden, um had led and um, just I'm I'm humbled by the the type of um, work that we have ahead of us and just wanted to say that uh, within Recover, we're trying to keep that invitation open for those engagements to happen. Um, and I could speak a little bit more to the specific details of that. You heard some from Jenna May just a little bit earlier on how um, some of the technical team members from the, the tribal uh, scientists have helped support updates to the Big Cypress conceptual ecological model. We've talked about performance measure development. How do we develop performance measures that are meaningful to the tribes while recognizing that there's a lot of sensitive information that rightfully they don't want to share. Um, so just acknowledging the fact that I, I feel like a new kid on the block with everyone up here, but just um, that, you know, and I've expressed to Kevin that I, I, I want to ensure that Recover's engagement is not for just checking off that box, but what can we do to, to have this be as meaningful an interaction as possible. So I just look forward to further opportunities and I'll stop there. I see, I see, um, thinking back, I'm thinking about some of the challenges um, again. So um, some tribes, you know, is, is a one-stop shop, you know, or a one-man shop, if you will, sorry. Um, they have very limited staff. Um, and they've got every federal agency, some state agencies, sometimes multiple state agencies, um, reaching out to them and they're in triage mode. So I'm thinking for SERP, adaptive management plans, especially. So, you know, you've got to get these metrics. Um, you know, what are we going to, what, what are going to be the key species out of, I don't know what the heap of people talk about, you know, what's, who's, what's going to be, what are you going to measure, you know, to be, uh, what species are you going to me measure to see if something is, is working pro appropriately. Um, and we need it by such and such time. Uh, but the tribes are having to not only the tribal staff, the tribal representatives are having to go to the tribal council for that information. And the tribal council has to meet and discuss it, right? Um, and there could be reasons why they can't get back in, in a certain amount of time. So sometimes time constraints can, can gum up the works a bit. Um, or just the tribe isn't comfortable with sharing even. Yeah. No, very good point, Cindy, because another thing that we tend to forget too is the tribe has a bureaucracy as well. And sometimes it's uh, just as complicated as we may have in, on our side, but they do have a bureaucracy and they have balances, check and balances that they need to, to go through. So expectations sometimes are like, you know, um, and usually it happens with us that in regulatory, you got 30 days to answer. Well, guess what? <laughs> the tribe doesn't, the, the tribe may not follow that. So that's a challenge as well, because as long as we, do, we, we have to incorporate all that into our equation as well. Panel, committee, excuse me. Uh, any any specific questions that you all might have? There we go. There you go. There you go. Hi. Um, thank you. So this question is directed to the tribal liaisons. Um, there is a project that is at. Your battery died. There we go. There you go. The battery's dying. Yeah. There you go. I can project. <laughs> you can project that for sure. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear. I hope with both tribes on this project and have been. Um, 
right when I got here, like right when COVID happened. Um, so, and I think November 2020 was whenever the first White House memo came out. Is that correct? Uh -huh. Yes. So um, I'm like, wow, you know, this is great. Um, and that was just saying that, hey, we're going to get together and we're going to come up with something. So that was when the um, Seminole, for instance, um, wanted, uh, they have a native area and Warp is on the western side of Warp. And they have a native area that is part of Kissimmee Billy Slough that they want um, rehydrated. But there was concern within the tribe about um, the quality of water and the amount of water. Of course, there's mistrust for logical reasons um, with you know non-native um, folks. So I saw the memo and I saw the EJ directive and I'm like, why can't we use IK and let the tribes operate gated culverts and they can open, they can dictate, if you will, when those culverts are opened or closed um, to let water in based on their indigenous knowledge of how the habitat is responding to that water. Because yes, we might, you know, they, there is, and I'm not a water scientist, but there, I know that there's a lot of other things that the tribe monitors outside of just the things that we monitor. Um, in the way of water quality. So that is one way we incorporated um, IK before it was even a legitimate thing, if you will. Um, another way is, of course, whenever we were talking about backfilling the L28, L28I uh, within the triangle area, um, which is on Mexico Reservation. Um, I believe Dr. Vander Heiden um, suggested in, that instead of filling it all in, um, we, you know, plug it, put, no, or not plugs, we put Lip pools. Pools. We leave pools for, for, you know, the alligators and what have you. Um, that also saves us in the way of not having to truck in as much soil, uh, which lowers the cost of the project, which is, you know, good for taxpayers. Um, but also it's incorporating you know, what they want is their land. And they know that, you know, the alligators needed those areas, if you will. And also the plugs going in, the height of those plugs within the canals. Um, I think at first it was like two feet and I'm probably gonna get something wrong um, here. And they're like, well, it really needs to be three feet. Um, so, you know, we make them three feet. Whenever we are going to restore, or I wouldn't say restore, um, rehabilitate, I don't know what word to use, um, McCormick Landing, which is a tree island that was utilized by the Miccosukee tribe, tribal members, um, or a specific clan, if I'm not mistaken, Otter Clan, I don't know. Um, it was impacted in the 60s. I think 1963 is whenever L28 was put in and it went right through the middle of the island. Um, that was before NEPA, 1969 was NEPA, National Historic Preservation Act, 1969. So there was no consultation required by law then. Uh, so we, during the planning, engineering and design phase of, of we, absolutely intend to get with the tribe and saying, hey, what vegetative communities can we put here? Should we put here? Um, we're gonna utilize that in like the proxy plants, right? So let's say they have an indigenous or they have a medicinal plant that grows in the same type of environment as um, a red maple. So they're gonna say plant red maple here and it needs to be at this elevation, what have you, what have you. And then they can come in later and, and you know, plant other plants that are culturally significant to them. Um, gosh, am I missing anything? Um, uh, the location of the, the tribe um, has wanted additional culverts along Loop and Tamiami Trail to move more water south. 
um, that's being incorporated into the project. Um, yeah, I, I, so if, more specific, I mean, on the question of WERP, we, I, and I don't know if we, the panel, or I know the panel does, but I don't know if the committee realizes that. So WERP, the, the genesis of WERP was the two tribes. Uh, the Seminole tribe went to the task force and the Miccosukee tribe went to the Everglades coalition through Congress. Um, ever since then, uh, a pseudo IK has been, you know, because it tribes interest, it's really restoring, for instance, what uh, Cindy was describing in a native area. Um, one thing that you did mention that as part of everything, it was the high stages on the that southwest corner of 3A. And at the same time, how dry the northwest corner is. So, and the Mikosuke tribe has always been uh, an advocate that, and the, the letter that was mentioned that by Kevin about 12A and 12B is specific about that high stages on the southwest corner of 3A. Therefore, the implementation of this structure that you may see on the plan, that they will be bi-directional to try to move water from that area to the preserve and also the same way. As a result of that, the culverts on Tamiami Trail and Loop Road as well. So, um, and, and, and the key of those culverts that Cindy was describing in the nat native area is really that proxy that Gina was talking about. We, need, we must find a proxy to be able to find out and protect their knowledge in a way, but at the same time, being able to come up with attributes to be able to performance measures to be able to incorporate into the plan. So, I don't know if we, we answered your question. I think we went, yeah. Stephanie, could I take you up on your earlier offer to bring other folks into the conversation. Ms. Betty would like to make a quick statement if, if you can, the committee will grant her the opportunity, please. Committee, <laughs> She he lamic dish to me, Yemen to I, a guy here that our channel sent Yoli Joshua, Mati Michigan, Himitin, to what the start took to the Umumachkin about. Thank you for, um, it's good to see y'all here today, and thank you for opening up this conversation for, um, for the tribe's perspective. And I think if y'all would have listened to the tribes many years ago, we wouldn't be in this situation to begin with on having an ill Everglades, we would have a healthy Everglades. But I thank you for taking that opportunity to start realizing that you need to have more tribal input. That's what I said. And while I was sitting in the back of the room and appreciative of this panel and appreciative of um, you have giving your time to the tribes and extending that time yesterday to spend that time with us by airboat and listening to us and having these one-on-one -on -one conversations, I thank you for that opportunity. And I hope 10 more years from now that we see a change. And, you know, when the Tamiami Trail was being constructed, they needed Seminole Mikasugi guides to guide them through the Everglades to show them where the roads need to be routed because their original route wasn't the best route. And unfortunately, you know, we assisted with that and hindsight is 2020, maybe we shouldn't have helped them out <laughs> and the road never got built. So, you know, this indigenous knowledge has been used here and there many years ago by different agencies. And, you know, and um, to borrow some words is that unfortunately, unless what we have been seeing as tribal people, unless we have a PhD or MS behind our names, our voices aren't heard. Because apparently, unless you have a master's or a doctor's degree, nobody listens to you. 
you know, and as indigenous people, and I might have self have seen an elder save a life from a person being bit by a pygmy rattlesnake and nobody has to go to the hospital because they had that knowledge. They didn't have the DR behind their name, but they saved the life. So knowledge as Kevin eloquently put it, is gained in different ways and it's quantified in different ways. And in my culture, the piece of paper you get from a university doesn't mean too much for us because in everyday life, it's how we survive in that environment before we had the cities. We didn't need all that. We knew how to live in that environment and adapt to that environment and respect that environment, to live in harmony with that environment, to understand that you have to let the water go where it needs to go. Because we know the interior waters of the Everglades help cool the oceans but because we keep storing water and wasting water and not let it, letting that water go to the oceans, not just in the Everglades, but all across this continent of the United States, we're helping exacerbating the water temperatures because we're not letting that water get from the interior lands to our oceans to help cool it. That's part of indigenous knowledge. We didn't have to have a paper degree to know that. We, that's through observation. And so I would hope 10 years from now, in addition to the PhDs and the master's degrees, you have tribal elders on your panels as well. Because we, our university is our life experiences and we're always going to school with the environment. But science is important because as our tribal scientists acknowledge and we're appreciative of them for the sciences, is taking what we know, the stories we share, the experiences that we know and understand about the environment in which we live is they're using their science backgrounds to prove it in a science form so the scientific community can understand it because that's all you understand is those numbers, the graphs, the piece of paper. So they're taking, they're proving what we're saying to be true as how we always understood it. And I appreciate that of our staff is putting matching what we say to the science to show that you know the Everglades was abundant in wildlife. It was abundant and healthy in its plant communities. And what in the little changes that we saw was hurting those communities and doing doing that science and research to say, okay, this is what the elders are saying, this is what it used to be, this is what it is now. Let's find out why and let's put it in that data to show why so we can pr start presenting it. Because for many years, what the tribes were saying was taken as anecdotal, not as science. Our knowledge is a form of science because before you had the universities and the papers, you had an understanding of the natural world. And science evolved out of the natural world and progressed, but science kind of Forgot that a little bit in that quest to have explanations. So that's the two cents I wanted to put in is that just because we don't have degrees doesn't mean our knowledge is useless. Because obviously we knew how to live in harmony with the environment. And there's a lot to know about that. And one thing I wanted to point out that wasn't mentioned here is that indigenous communities, the tribes, not after a project has already been designed and planned and appropriated for, we need to be brought in at the beginning, not at a section 106. We need to be at, at the very beginning of that process. And Armando and Cindy have known our concerns that, you know, don't consult us five years down the road while the ball has been rolling that long. We need to be in the beginning because there is one project that is in the works that has some significant cultural resources right in the very center. And we still haven't got an answer of how we're gonna address that. And they're already constructing it because that process of involving the tribes was brought in later 
after the construction and the appropriation of this project has started. It's a state project. The Corps has kind of with, withheld from that. And the tribes have been more happier with the core process, the federal process, because they have those mandates to consult with the tribes and to implement the, um, that process with the tribes on their consultation. They're very much more re respectful to tribes. The state does not have that process. And it would be great if the state did, because the state doesn't have to respect tribes. We hope that they would, but there's no mandate that they must respect the tribes. So therefore we have some burial mounds inside of an EAA reservoir. That is a controversy. And unfortunately, the state man reduced the footprint and the agency is stuck with building a reservoir that really isn't going to help the Everglades, even though they say it will. So here we are. If it would have been a bigger footprint, which they originally wanted to build, they would be, have been able to protect those resources much better and not inundate them. But they still have to contain the same amount of water volume in a smaller footprint and go up. So how is that going to clean water when you're storing water vertically in more massive amounts versus if you could have a shallow reservoir over a larger footprint? That's what it's not understood by a lot of the public. And someone alluded to politics and decisions. That's where politics got into a decision that handicapped an agency and directed an agency to build this reservoir vertically, which it would have been much better if it would have went the other way and more shallow and worked as a filter marsh instead of a cesspool that they're building. So those things that unfortunately, the health of the Everglades ecosystem, I always say, quit managing the system for people, manage it for the ecosystem of the plant communities, the animals, and then you will benefit the people of, of the ecosystem much better. So that's what I wanted to put out there. And I appreciate the work that Kevin and all the other partners of our tribe and departments put into it and it's very hard because I will never know how he understands his life. Just like he will never know how and understand my life because we live two different lives. So thinking of that, you know, I would never go to China and tell them how to build something. Because I'm not Chinese, I didn't grow up in China, I don't understand that ecosystem, but they do. So that's what we're asking is that when you come into our ecosystem of the Seminoles and Miccosukee, that try to understand and strive how we understand that ecosystem. Because none of you live there. I do. And your decisions impact me and my tribe every day. So we, that's why we are asking that we be a part of that process from the beginning. And any tribe would ask that because you're coming in and impacting their lives. And to be respectful of that. And it was alluded to earlier because I'm thinking of you brought, Cindy, you brought a, something that an, it was an Army Corps project. And someone else, I think it was in the National Park Service during that meeting made a comment because one of the projects was gonna impact the Miccosukee tribe with more dry days of water. I think it was the mod waters. It was you're your doing the planning and how to move that water. And the modeling was showing the Miccosukee tribe was gonna get more dry days on its reservation because it was robbing Peter to pay Paul with water, robbing water from the tribe to, put, to pay Paul the national park. So we were asking, you know, how can you budget that differently? Quantify the impact to the tribes and the resources. And the comment was made, well, we have, we have to think about the farming community, agricultural community, the urban areas, and we know how to put a dollar sign on farmland. 
revenue lost, you know, household income loss, home values. We can put a dollar sign. But for the Everglades itself, they didn't know how to, you know, weigh the options. Okay, we have, you know, how many millions of dollars here, but we, we can't figure out how the dollar, how much, what's the value of a tree island? What's the value of the loss of snail kites, apple snails? They didn't know how to put a dollar value. So this dollar value of agriculture and household income real estate loss outweighed the value of the Everglades itself. They couldn't understand that actually this, the Everglades had more value than the agriculture and the house and all that, because that can't exist without this. So that's something that we were tasking them. And I don't think they figured it out yet because I haven't heard answers how you put a value over here, because how that system is designed your cost analysis, I guess. And then part of that modeling y'all do is, is they look at that, but they don't know how to value the Everglades lost, the wildlife lost, the plant communities lost. They don't know how to quantify that with a dollar sign. So um, I didn't hear that mentioned here though. So that's, that's how we think that they have to have that balance and the resources and the understanding. So what I think you would go much further if you really take that initiative to incorporate that indigenous knowledge, you'd save a lot of money. You'd save a lot of money that could be used somewhere else with your projects if you would just listen more to the tribes and the people of the land. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Betty. I don't think there's anything more to add on this session personally, unless there's any burning questions from the committee. I think ending on Ms. Betty's thoughts and uh, things I hope that you will all go away and think about and take part of this conversation with you as well from us up here. Um, again, all of us, all of us in this room want to do good. We wanna do good things. So let's do it. Thank you. We were just looking into yet another change in our agenda, but this is a good way to end. So I agree with Kenneth, Kevin. Um, thanks very much to the panel and uh, to Miss Betty and uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Eric.